could go ahead and get started. I see John DeVore, you are recording this meeting, yes? Yes, I am. Great. Um, and I will um, turn on my camera for just a minute. Oh, look at this terrible white background I have. Um, and we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Uh, so welcome everyone. This is uh, the annual uh, ecosystem subcommittee meeting of the SSC to talk about uh, topics related to the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment and um, Ecosystem Status Report. I am Kristen Marshall. I'm the chair of the subcommittee um, and I'll be leading us through the meeting today. Um, and so I want to uh, start by just welcoming you all. Um, our, we have most of our ecosystem subcommittee meter, subcommittee members here um, and a number of others as well. We had invited specifically the Salmon technical team and the Salmon advisory subpanel and the ecosystem work group and the ecosystem advisory subpanel. Um, and so, um, welcome to everyone that was able to that's able to join us today. Um, we have a um, a great agenda on tap um, with a the morning. Going to we are going to be devoting to salmon topics, uh, and the afternoon is going to be devoted to uh, the climate change appendix, the new climate change appendix uh, that was in the ecosystem status report for the first time last year. Um, and this meeting is a little bit different than um, the last couple of years that we've had um, with the ecosystem subcommittee in that um, rather than doing a very focused technical review of an individual indicator or um, research project. We've got two sort of big picture topics where we are um, first going to be thinking about the salmon indicator portfolio as a whole, um, and then uh, and then again uh, sort of the climate change appendix as a whole in the afternoon. Um, and so these these topics were decided back in March. For those of you that. Um, uh, Thanks, Will. So for those of you that that don't track this meeting regularly, uh, the uh, the topics were, were proposed by the CCIEA team and then um, adopted by the SSC. Uh, and so I think we also have a unique opportunity with both of these topics in that they are um, relevant to the new FEP initiative that was also just uh, adopted uh, last weekend. So. I'm um, thinking about that as well as sort of providing um, the the input requested by the CCIEA team as they develop uh, both of these sections. Um, so I think I have, um, I wanna just do a quick uh, go through the agenda a little bit more specifically and um, so everybody knows what to expect. Uh, and then I've got just overview of how I propose we run the meeting today and um, what we need to do about the report. Um, and so uh, if we can just walk through the agenda, as I mentioned, salmon indicators are up first. Um, so we'll have an overview of linking ecosystem indicators to salmon life cycles that Chris Harvey will be taking the lead on. Um, we'll take a break around 945 uh, or whenever he finishes that first um, chunk of uh, presentation. Uh, and then we'll talk about stoplight tables around 10. That will be presented by uh, Brian Burke, Nate Manto, and Corey Green. Um, uh, Will is going to lead the discussion for that item in the next one. Uh, and so we'll do stoplight tables and then ecosystem indicator based outlooks and then sort of a synthesis at the end. Um, and uh, for that second section, as you see there, we'll have Brian Burke, Corey Green, and Chris Harvey presenting. Um, and then we have Oli first. Well, I guess we have Galen repertoring first, then uh, Oli, and then Cameron. Um, so we'll take a break for lunch, wrap up our salmon work uh, at by 1145, and then this afternoon we'll uh, switch to the climate change appendix. Um, uh, Andy Leasing is going to be taking us through that section. And so we'll have um, an overview and discussion of physical indices um, that 
John Field will be repertoring. We'll take a break somewhere in there, and then uh, we'll move to the biological and ecological indices after that. Um, Melissa Haltech will be repertoring that section with uh, Desiree Tomasi presenting, and then um, we'll do the human and social indices last. Um, and we have a change in repertoire there. Dan Holland is going to take over repertoireing for uh, Matt Reimer, uh, and Karma Norman will be presenting. Um, and so um, what I propose for just overall with these, what we try to do is um, let each of the speakers um, get through their presentations and only um, uh, interrupt them for uh, clarifying questions um, if needed. And then we'll have a discussion, you know, after each um, section of presentations with the SSE uh, and um, as we've invited other advisory bodies to be here, um, incorporate their their input as well as we can along the way. Um, and then, of course, we have this public comment section at the end for anything that we don't uh, get to before the um, you know be be before the end of the day. Um, I would ask if you're comfortable and your bandwidth allows that you uh, try to turn on your camera when you're speaking. Um, and um, if you can, just for the CCIA members and those of us that haven't all met each other before, uh, please, maybe the first time that you speak up, just uh, introduce yourself and let everyone know what, um, you know, what group you're associated with. Um, so that's sort of my suggestion for general meeting guidelines. Uh, there's the raise hand features that we're all well aware of under, I think, reactions. You can find raise hands, raise your hand, and um, I'll moderate the hands. Um, okay, so that is the agenda and the plan for the day, sort of general meeting, um, how I'd like it to go. And then, and we talked about rapporteurs, so that good, that's that should be good to go. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on is um, last year I was not particularly efficient with getting our report out after the meeting, and I'd like to make a change on that this year. So um, I'm going to ask that, uh, and, and given all the other various subcommittee activities others have going on um, over the next couple of months, uh, I'm going to ask the rapporteurs to send their sections to me by uh, a week from today, by next Friday. Um, and I will then compile all of those the following week and um, send back to you all for comments um, and try to get the whole thing finalized by the first week of October before we forget uh, what we talked about. Um, and so then the, the subcommittee report will be finalized. Uh, well, the subcommittee draft subcommittee report will be finalized then and we'll, um, it'll go to the SSC to be uh, uh, discussed at the March meeting under the CCIEA agenda item. Um, so that is the plan, um, and I will just pause there now and ask um, John DeVore if I missed anything, any technical details that we need to go over. Uh, thanks, Kristen. I thought that was a good overview. The only thing I would add is just to ask folks to please mute themselves when they're not speaking. Yep. Thanks very much for making that request. Um, okay. So I think with that, um, just check the chat and check for hands. Um, I think we're ready to dive into uh, our agenda. Well, number or B of our agenda, strategic review of salmon indicator portfolio. Um, and so there's a presentation on our G drive um, that's available. Uh, Chris Harvey is going to share his screen and put it up. Um, and I think we can do that now. Um, and as he's uh, getting his presentation going, I will also just say as way of background, a reminder, what we're trying to do with the salmon review here is we're looking again at the whole suite of indicators and trying to provide guidance on um, the, the whole set of them uh, with an eye towards what could be kept, what could be removed, what could be moved elsewhere. Um, and uh, help the CCIEA uh, identify indicators that might be most useful to the uh, salmon technical team and the salmon advisory sub panel. Um, we had some statements back in our March reports about um, 
uh, potentially trying to identify, help identify stocks where ecosystem information would be most useful and how it could be better be used to inform management. Um, and, uh, and then I think that is, that is all that I need to make for introductory remarks there. So I will hand it over to Chris and, um, I will, uh, uh thank you for, um, taking us through this, Chris. I guess I should also just make sure that our rapper tour is ready. And now I've forgotten who is the first one. Oh, yeah, Galen. I'm ready. Galen. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks, Kristen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you great. Super. Well, hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Harvey, and I'm at the NOAA Fisheries Northwest Fisheries Science Center, and I'm one of the co-editors of the California Current IEA Team's Annual Ecosystem Status Report, or ESR. Uh, you'll hear ESR a lot, and that's just the report as a whole. Uh, I want to first start by thanking uh, the SSCES for hosting us once again and for sharing your time and your bandwidth and expertise. These meetings really are a highlight for, uh, for us, and we're grateful to you for holding them. Uh, also grateful to uh, members of the other advisory bodies, uh, council members and members of the public for joining us this, uh, this morning as well. And I also want to echo, Kristen, that we're really looking at this as a conversation starter, um, and we hope to return to it as the salmon sections of the ESR continue to improve. And as parallel efforts like the climate change appendix come into maturity and as the FEP initiative 2.1 rolls out, uh, I would hope that some of the ideas that are raised today will uh, lead to technical review topics at future September get togethers like this one. Um, just oh, now, Overall, since we chose this topic back in March, uh, a large group of subject matter experts within the CCIEA team have held a series of virtual meetings and also compiled our perspectives on the salmon related sections of the ESR. I think all those folks are present today um, and uh, might come off mute and on camera from time to time. Uh, I uh, think I speak on all of our behalf when I say that this is a work in progress. Um, I hope that was understood as, as part of our, uh, our plan for this review. Um, but I think we've also made a lot of headway, even in the virtual meetings that we've had over the course of the summer. And I hope you'll see that, that headway today. And we really do look forward to your questions, your suggestions, and your, your input. I'm going to start with a general problem statement. Um, we in the ESR community have so much information to choose from that we constantly struggle with the forest for the trees issue. And I'm sure all of you on the SSC know what I'm talking about since you have to review this report every year. And you've watched it grow in complexity and in page count. And we're due, uh, maybe even overdue, to step back and look at our indicator portfolio as a whole and make sure that we're sufficiently focused on the big picture, the forest and that we're clearly and concisely communicating information about that big picture to the council. That is, after all, what the FEP explicitly asks that we do each March. This forest for trees issue is especially challenging for salmon because their great diversity and variety and complexity and their value definitely invite us to focus on the trees. But I'm hoping today's discussion and the work that has preceded it and that will follow it help us in the CCIA team to feel more certain about when to focus our ESR efforts on the big picture and when and how it's appropriate to zoom in, uh, on, in on finer levels of detail. The reason that salmon are particularly challenging this whole forest for trees sense is, of course, that they have great inherent complexity. They spend considerable time and migrate across different habitat types. They derive further complexity from the core differences in life histories of the different species. They're widely distributed geographically in terms of both stream origin and in ocean distribution. And thus any one stock is going to encounter a wide range of environmental conditions that likely differ from the conditions encountered by other stocks, even neighboring stocks. <clears throat> Moreover, the signs and strengths of the effects of different drivers on these stocks, or at least the correlations between the drivers and the stocks tend to vary by region as shown by Gosselin et al. in the lower, uh, the lower right here and by other authors as well. And all these bits challenge our ability to make broad generalizations about conditions for salmon and which ones uh, might contribute most to good years versus poor years. 
Then there's the added complexity of different stocks and life history types arrayed across the geography of salmon producing river systems, which we have tried to non-exhaustively capture here simply for illustrative purposes. Some of these populations are relatively data rich, at least for some portions of their life history, while others have been studied less and may thus be more difficult to connect the ecosystem dynamics for decision support. And that further compounds the complexity of this issue. And also integrating solely within the context of biology or ecology runs the risk of ignoring other key ecosystem goals, dynamics, and outcomes that link to salmon. Most notably in the council context are human dimensions that are related to commercial, tribal, and recreational fisheries, which we track through traditional indicators like landings and revenue. But we know that salmon have broader connections and values to people and that goals for salmon management extend beyond just meeting quotas and selling fish but also to participation in a sustainable, resilient, and adaptable fishing practice. And we must also acknowledge various non-fisheries human activities that are relevant to salmon. For example, how freshwater is managed, especially uh, as we start to look at problems like climate change and drought and, uh, and uh, use of water for uh, other purposes, like, of course, like agriculture. Um, so that's a lot. Uh, that's, uh, that's definitely a lot of trees. Uh, and while it's tempting to try to capture all of that complexity in the ESR, we do need to move away from potentially overwhelming our audiences and the sheer volume of what's possible to report and instead provide clear and more integrated guidance. One conceptual framework for that integration is the salmon life cycle. Uh, and consciously linking and integrating the relative effects of different drivers and condition across the uh, history of a particular cohort is a step up from what we arguably have done in the past, which is to offer up many indicators that can directly or indirectly link to salmon and leave it to the council to decide what to make of all of them. Again, do we, we want to give the forest and not the trees. I also hope that we can keep in mind another integrating framework uh, as we uh, move ahead here, which is the integrated ecosystem assessment loop, uh, which I offer here in a pretty simplified form. The IEA loop begins uh, with scoping uh, of goals and problems, moves into assessing the ecosystem with indicators. I hope you can see my cursor. And then into assist, assessing risks, threats, and uncertainty down here in green. It then moves to evaluating strategies and trade-offs in orange, and then finally to taking action and monitoring how effective the action is at meeting the goals or addressing the problems. The ecosystem status report uh, has typically, uh, though not entirely, stopped at the blue at assessing ecosystem using good indicators. Uh, but it's not really until we get to uh, assessing risk down here in green that we start to uh, be able to address the so what questions that inevitably arise from some suites of indicators. And going forward, we hope that we can provide more management support in the green risk assessment step, both broadly with salmon relevant sections of the ESR and then per perhaps at greater levels of detail as we start to dig into FEP initiative 2.1. So then uh, with that all in mind, just an outline for today's review as Kristen uh, already went over in the agenda, we'll start with uh, part one, uh, 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 review of the salmon related indicators that are in the ESR and some of the progress we're making uh, for the report to come. Uh, after the break, we'll uh, talk about stoplight tables and you'll hear about some of the practices and advances in stoplight tables as well as the challenges uh, in the stoplight tables uh, from Brian Burke, Nate Mantua and Corey Green. And then part three, we'll talk a little bit. This is a slight uh, modification uh, of the agenda, which uh, focuses on uh, projections. We're also going to, and outlooks, we're also going to talk a little bit about non-stationarity of, uh, of drivers and how uh, the connection points between uh, stoplight tables and uh, outlooks and projections that have to consider non-stationarity. Uh, Brian Burke and Corey Green will lead that discussion, and then we'll uh, close with some next steps, and I'll, I'll talk about those. Okay, so to uh, review the salmon related indicators that are in the ESR, for the next several slides, I'm gonna walk you through what we expect the salmon related sections of the ESR to look like uh, in March 2023's report. Uh, 
And I'll try to focus on some of the key changes uh, that I hope uh, will, will represent some progress based on feedback we've received from you. And we certainly welcome uh, further feedback on uh, additional improvements we can make. After all that forest and trees introduction that I gave you, these slides uh, might come across as a lot of trees. But uh, later sections of the presentation on stoplights and um, the uh, outlook models will provide means to integrate the individual indicators. So hopefully this will come across as a progression um, throughout the presentation toward integration. And of course, it'll be on us in the ESR team to pull that off in the report. So let's begin with uh, some indicators that are most explicitly connected to salmon, and then we'll move into some ecosystem indicators that are more relevant to, are, are relevant to salmon, but also to other uh, FMPs and species. Let's start with uh, indicators of salmon abundance that appear uh, in our report. In the main body of the report, we've been featuring um, the uh, long running time series of catch per unit effort of juvenile salmon from surveys that uh, take place each spring off Washington and Oregon. Uh, this is a really important time series. Uh, is basically the only estimate of early marine abundance of Chinook and coho juveniles in the California current. We have been featuring it three times in the main body though, so uh, both as time series and also as cells in both the uh, Northern California current stoplight table and also in the Northern California current cluster analysis of uh, pelagic species assemblages. Uh, and uh, having it as a time series plus in both of these might uh, be a little redundant um, and potentially confusing if it comes across that those CPU E time series are uh, assumed to be uh, pertinent for, say, Central Valley juveniles as well. Uh, so we probably have some thinking to do about uh, maybe moving uh, some of this, like, say, the time series into the supplement. Uh, if people agree that there's some redundancy there um, um, and keeping the main pic body focused on the big picture figures uh, of the, the um, stoplight diagram and the cluster diagram. Uh, so that's one thought, uh, but a bigger change that we've made uh, that we started in this past, the 2022 ESR, and that we, um, is that we used to feature time series of natural area escapement for many Chinook ESUs and some Coho ESUs. And last year we discontinued that due to many concerns that have been identified by the SSC, plus the fact that the council is receiving uh, much more up-to-date information on escapements and run sizes from the SAMA technical team in March uh, and then uh, following. And re so removing these time series from our report um, streamlines the report by several pages and it uh, kind of relieves us of a lot of the concerns that the SSC has uh, raised and that we've agreed with over the years uh, about uh, timeliness of data and an interpretation of, of, uh, of trends and status. Um, so we, we will continue to discuss the natural area escapement of Central Valley Fall Chinook salmon uh, in the stoplight table um, uh, that appears in the main body. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later in the stoplight section. And then just the last uh, element of salmon abundance indicators that I want to highlight is that in the supplement, uh, we hope to continue to show the modeled outlooks of um, one to two year outlooks of returns for several Chinook salmon ESUs to Bonneville Dam. Uh, and uh, those are based on uh, model, co in part on mo model coefficients that derive from the ecosystem indicators. Uh, Brian Burke has been doing a lot of work on this over the, uh, the years and you've seen um, this work before and he's gonna talk about that later in today's presentation. Uh, with SSC endorsement, we would hope to uh, can not just continue this, uh, but expand it potentially to look at um, uh, outlooks for some other stocks in the future. Uh, although we might uh, imagine that eventually under activities related to FEP initiative 2.1, these kinds of outlooks that are stock specific might start to be de-emphasized in the ESR and uh, migrate over to more FMP level um, reporting. Um, so again, uh, we're uh, leaving the door open for streamlining our, our report. So that's salmon abundance. Um, 
Next up uh, are some freshwater habitat indicators, which connect more closely to salmon than to any of the other species groups that are in the ESR and uh, most of the other species groups that really fall under uh, council purview. The main body of the report will continue to feature time series of snow water equivalent and summary quad plots of maximum and minimum stream flows. And we're planning to add uh, August maximum stream temperature to those quad plots in the main body, which would be new. Uh, the data that are featured in those quad plots uh, in the main body will continue to be available as time series in the supplement. And we may add uh, air temperature for some months or seasons as well if it provides additional value regarding something like snow melt rates. Now, a key change that we're proposing uh, in future reports uh, is that in all of these cases, the hydrological indicators and in both the main body and the supplement uh, will be expressed at the ecoregion level, um, which is five to six large subregions of the west that drain into the California current rather than what we've been doing uh, if for the last several years, which is to break the uh, hydrological indicators down further by uh, the finer scale of 16 Chinook salmon ESUs. We would continue to make those ESU scale uh, hydrological indicators available on the CCIEA uh, website in the indicator data portal that uh, our colleague Greg Williams manages. Um, and we can even provide hyperlinks to them in the report if desired. But what we're proposing here is that the ESU level data is maybe exhaustive detail for the broad scale and intent of the ESR. And removing those uh, ESU level hydrological time series would streamline the report by several pages, remove a few dozen time series that we frankly have never received much question or input about. Uh, and so demand for them seems relatively low within the context of the ESR. That said, stoplight tables for the Chinook salmon stocks of California that are in both the main body of the report and in the supplement uh, do include fairly, um, you know, fine scale hydrological indicators down to space and season, uh, and we'll keep those integrated in those uh, tables. So that's our plan for stream uh, and hydrology indicators. Um, Kristen, I'm going to just pause right now for a process check uh, and see if the approach that I'm taking with walking through what's in the report right now is okay or if I'm zoomed in too close and people are starting to, to glaze over. I have a few more slides like this, uh, but I could certainly generalize if, uh, if the SSC members feel like the review of the ESR prior to today gave them enough to comment on. Um, I think it's really helpful personally to for you to walk us through what changes you're proposing um, and and highlighting these areas that you're you're thinking of, of streamlining in particular. So I, I will ask if anyone else has a different opinion on that. Yep. OK, John Field, everyone's agreeing that this is helpful. So keep, okay. keep going, Chris. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And sorry to kind of um, cold call you there. Um, we're going to uh, now broaden out a lot to uh, conditions that relate both to salmon and also to other ecosystem components. Um, so uh, we're, we're getting a little bit more derived at this point um, in, in general. Uh, and, and these are, these are in indicators that I think we have fewer proposed changes for, at least right now, but are certainly welcome to feedback. Um, and just, I, I should have been doing this all along, but um, a reminder that we are trying to link these two salmon life cycles, um, and I've tried to highlight the stages uh, that um, that we would link them to uh, up here above, uh, both by, you know, highlighting the salmon life cycle as well as mentioning some of the stages. So you can see that with the um, abundance and stream indicators as well. So with ocean growing conditions, um, the... Uh, Conditions experienced by uh, early marine salmon stages, ocean subadults, and migrating adults include basin scale and regional climate and oceanographic indices, as well as indicators of zooplankton, regional plankton, uh, pelagic assemblages as a proxy for forage, uh, and other indicators of feeding conditions that are in the uh, Northern California current stoplight table uh, that 
uh, things like ichthyoplankton and uh, temperatures at different depths and uh, timing of, of transitions that we don't actually, um, you know, have time series for in the report, but could. Um, that's all in the main body. Um, in the supplement, we also include some additional time series and maps that describe these indicators in greater detail. Uh, and in both the main uh, body and the, the supplement, uh, we uh, also include uh, a fair amount of supportive text uh, to describe both of, uh, or, you know, these kinds of indicators as well as uh, recent issues like thiamine deficiency. This, um, the supplement also features the Klamath and Sacramento uh, Fall Chinook stoplight tables, uh, which include uh, some uh, ocean indicators for specific life history stages in the ocean. Uh, and finally, we also include in the supplement uh, the Ecosystem State Index, the uh, analysis that's done by Mary Hunsaker. Uh, you've reviewed that before, uh, and it rolls most of the ecological uh, time series uh, in the oceans as well as the physical covariates together uh, via dynamic uh, factor analysis to give an overall uh, index of, uh, of ocean state and, uh, and variability from year to year, um, say, during and following perturbations. We're not really proposing any changes uh, to the ocean growing conditions here today, although again, we welcome input. And we certainly acknowledge that there are additions that uh, are needed. Uh, we just haven't had a chance to really vet those uh, yet uh, via our virtual meetings. Uh, one example that uh, leaps to mind for me immediately is that we don't exactly give uh, attention to early growing conditions off of California to the same degree that we can uh, Washington and Oregon through the, um, the Northern California current stoplight table. Uh, and there are some options in the literature that we should explore. Uh, for uh, for that uh, conditions off California. We're also aware that we need to reinvestigate some assumptions about the stationarity of correlations between salmon and some of these drivers, and we will talk a, a little bit more about that later in the presentation. Uh, and there is a, a lot of work, I think, already uh, being uh, trained directly at that that will help address that issue uh, in years to come. Further, we're hoping to eventually be able to incorporate more information on prey fields uh, from more coast-wide surveys rather than just the regional surveys that we have uh, long presented. One of them is the coast-wide uh, coastal pelagic species survey uh, conducted by the Southwest Fishery Science Center. Another are the uh, krill uh, estimates that can be derived from the biennial hake survey conducted by the Northwest Center. And those data may support better regional comparisons and absolute estimates of forage abundance. Uh, and uh, both would seem like, uh, once they're ready uh, for your consideration, would seem like good topics for SSCES review uh, in a future September. Uh, you know, just taking those, um, taking those uh, um, data sets and uh, breaking them into indicators is gonna, um, it's gonna, it's a great opportunity, but it's gonna certainly require some thought. Uh, the next uh, set of indicators I wanted to talk about uh, relate to predators, uh, potentially predators of smolts, uh, early marine individuals, ocean subadults, uh, and migrating adults, uh, uh, with I think uh, probably the bulk of our um, con consensus uh, assuming that the early marine uh, predation is really the key one. Uh, that said, reproductive success and diets of predators uh, are, uh, you know, a pretty common feature in our report, but we have mainly looked at them and regarded them as indicators of overall forage quality and availability, um, not predation impacts on salmon. We're not really uh, in a position to propose any major changes here. Right now, uh, the main body will continue to feature the reproductive success metrics of California sea lions at San Miguel Island and seabirds on Southeast Farallon Island as proxies for forage quality. And the supplement will add seabird reproductive success from uh, uh, Yaquina Head um, uh, as well. The Central Valley Fall Chinook stoplight table in the main body uh, has a connection drawn between the Farallon Island common myrrh diets and predation mortality on early marine juvenile Chinook salmon uh, from the Central Valley. And Nate Mantua is gonna discuss that uh, during the stoplight section. Uh, but currently this is the closest we come in the report to an actual indicator of predation mortality on salmon anywhere in the system. Uh, in the supplement, we have been including 
data on common MERD diets from two additional seabird colonies uh, uh, in addition to Southeast Farallon Island. Uh, in large part, we have focused on common MERD diets because of the role that common MERS are hypothesized to play on salmon survival, as Nate will discuss later and has been published previously by Brian Wells and colleagues. We could uh, definitely expand our seabird diet coverage uh, at these colonies uh, to include more seabirds and more prey types. Doing so would require that we uh, abandon these uh, traditional formats of indicator plots that we do uh, kind of market as or brand as part of the California Current IEA, away from these you know, slopes and trends um, and more towards stacked bar plots of diet uh, proportions. Um, so that's a difference in the way we present things, but it's not like that's uncommon in our report that, um, that plots deviate from this format. Uh, and that seems like potentially a worthwhile trend because uh, th there's uh, potentially some valuable information in there, as well as uh, additional uh, bird species on top of common MERS that are definitely feeding on salmon uh, from time to time. This still leaves us lacking actual indicators of predation mortality. Uh, and on the whole, uh, time series abundances of uh, uh, time series of abundances and diets of birds and marine mammals tend to be pretty spotty and pretty gappy in the California Current. And sometimes we're finding that the data uh, for uh, abundances and diets uh, have some pr proprietary constraints on them. So uh, it seems to me anyway, uh, and to uh, uh, the rest of us who've been putting the background materials for this presentation together, that the best estimates of predation mortality on salmon right now might be coming from fairly coarse ecosystem models that are really not set up to capture interannual variability. Uh, but if we're missing any um, uh, time series uh, or, um, or ways of approaching this, uh, we should certainly discuss those and think about them for the future, especially for stages where it's thought that um, predation mortality is uh, relatively important compared to other sources of, uh, of survival and mortality. Uh, next up are human dimensions indicators, which feature some direct links to salmon, uh, such as commercial landings and recreational landings at the coastwide scale, and also how salmon revenue is concentrated across IOPAC port groups. Um, but the majority of these human dimensions indicators are broader and linked to multiple FMPs, uh, not just to salmon. Uh, the uh, uh, indicators that, again, are, are in the in the main body that are primarily at that larger scale uh, of looking across all FMPs uh, are supported uh, in the supplement uh, by uh, state level or port level indicators of variables like landings, revenue, and diversification uh, of uh, revenue. I think this section overall uh, represents an opportunity for growth in the future. And I wouldn't say that right now we have some specific ideas. Um, uh, well, we do have some some ideas, but we don't have any specific uh, indicator time series, let's say queued up uh, to, to put in right away, but are uh, certainly interested in, in feedback on this. Uh, we, I, I think we can uh, look to opportunities for growth, such as adding new indicators that relate to fishing practices and benefits um, that maybe extend beyond um, just landings and revenue, uh, as well as linkages between fishing activity and environmental variability. Uh, so if we do have, say, anomalous ocean conditions, is that causing uh, distribution of fishing activity to shift? We could also stand to review our non-fishing human activities that relate to salmon, uh, as I mentioned before, such as freshwater uh, management and use. Uh, it's, this is just overall, it's a section uh, of uh, worthy of, of additional focus uh, if we were to uh, workshop uh, this section within the CCIA team. Um, salmon are also one of many fisheries that could be a good proving ground for metrics derived from the fishery participation networks, which we introduced a few years ago, uh, depicted down here at the bottom of the main body uh, on the lower left. Uh, and um, we've continued to examine the fishery participation networks as potential tools for examining uh, fishing community resilience to different kinds of shocks. You've reviewed uh, these previously, and you saw some exploration uh, last year of network metrics uh, in relation to groundfish data. 
uh, in last year's report. And I'm going to just uh, queue up some um, pilot uh, and fairly hot off the press uh, 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 illustration for today's discussion. And this is developed by Jamil Samhuri, sh who should uh, have his uh, uh, mute button ready to, to unmute. Jamil developed this uh, exploratory plot based on fishery participation networks from IOPAC port groups that include salmon, and it focuses on a 12-month period spanning 2020 to 2021. The x-axis here is the network metric of edge density that uh, you had encouraged us to look into more. Edge density is the density of linkages between nodes in a fishery participation network, and it serves as a proxy for the overall resilience of the network to shocks. And here it's multiplied by negative one so that the networks with the lowest resilience are out here at the right. You can think of this as increasing from left to right. Uh, as uh, an increasing sensitivity uh, or decreasing resilience um, uh, plotted. Something like a risk profile would be plotted where the most um, sensitive uh, groups on the x-axis are out at the right. The y-axis is port group level revenue from salmon. And then the size of each one of the points representing each of the IOPAC port groups is proportional to another network metric uh, describing how important the salmon node is uh, in a given port group network. Basically, the node size here is a measure of whether that uh, the salmon fishery is connected to, via participation to lots of other fisheries. Uh, the bigger uh, the, the, the point here is the more that salmon represent a hub fishery. The light gray lines represent median values for uh, the X and Y axes, respectively. Um, so it, it might be a little hard to pick out strong correlations here of how all these metrics connect together. Um, but if we just highlight uh, um, the upper right quadrant here, or the upper right section, we do nevertheless see that most of the port groups that have very important salmon nodes, large salmon nodes, representing that they are hubs that connect a whole bunch of other fisheries together, they tend to lump up here at the upper right uh, above the median values, uh, at or above the median values for both salmon revenue uh, and below median resilience, which may suggest that participation networks that are most dependent on salmon fishing as both a source of revenue and as a major network connection point are relatively less resilient to ecosystem shocks. This is definitely preliminary, um, and uh, we do plan to delve into it uh, further, uh, this and other network metrics, but, um, but th this is a direction that we would like to explore further, and we would certainly welcome your feedback on how to make fishery participation networks more uh, relevant to, say, the salmon portfolio. Maybe I'll just hold my breath for a second and see if Jamil, if you want to add any flavor to that. I thought that was great, Chris. I'm happy to answer questions if there are any now or later. Since this is somewhat fresh and wasn't in your review materials and might feel like a bit of a, a, a surprise, I don't know, Kristen, would you like to pause here for a second, or should we let folks gather their thoughts and be prepared to ask questions once we uh, move to that that point? Um, I see that Dan just raised his hand, so he might have a specific question on this. Uh, so yeah, let's, if anyone wants to ask specific questions about this this slide, I think now is a good time, but we'll hold general uh, general discussion on it till the end. So go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I, I did have a specific question about this slide. I, I'm I'm just trying to get my head around what um, so the what what it is. So the 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 node size is is the importance of salmon um, in in terms of the percentage of of the revenue for individuals, kind of the same way that the node size was done for the for the other for the networks. In my I'm getting that, and so I want to know if that's the case. And then, um, uh, but I, and then this edge density thing is the edge density for the for the overall networks from each of these ports. Um, and you're saying that that is is a um, you're using that as a as a measure of resilience. And um, so I'm trying to see. So. Dick, 
declining resilience. So it's okay. So if it's smaller as you go further out to the right, then you're saying it's lower edge density, and thus, thus uh, that being a proxy for lower resilience is is that what? Am I understanding this correctly? Chris, do you mind if I jump in and answer those questions? Mm, I think Chris is muted or somehow we can't hear him, but you should go ahead and answer those questions. Yeah, Jamil. please go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Jamil, please. Sure, yeah, um, Dan, I'll take the second question first. So yes, um, you'll recall that last year in September, the SSCES reviewed um, network analysis, fisheries participation networks. And as part of that, one of the main discussion points and something that came out in the report is wanting to have some um, clear and consistent interpre interpretability of any derived network metrics. Edge density was one of those metrics, which both theory and empirical work support the idea that the higher the edge density, the less change will happen within the network when exposed to a shock. The specific example in the paper that was reviewed as background material was a paper led by Mary Fisher looking at the impacts of harmful algal bloom related closures on the Dungeness crab fishery on the west coast. Um, and so yes, in this case what we're uh, proposing is that we can use the edge density of each port group's full fisheries participation network to reflect the resilience of all the fisheries um, to shocks. So that's just sort of an underlying um, resilience of the fisheries. Then uh, to your first question about, I believe it was about what the point size scales with. The point size in this plot scales with an, a different network metric called importance or also eigenvector centrality. And what that reflects is for the salmon node within fish, each fisheries participation network, it describes how uh, how strongly connected the salmon fishery is to other fisheries, and in particular to other strongly connected fisheries within the network. So the larger point sizes reflect um, port groups that have salmon fisheries that are strongly connected to other fisheries that are themselves strongly connected to fisheries in that port group. A good example might be um, a situation. So, so Columbia River, there's only one node in that network. It's all salmon. So that's why that has a large point size. But uh, another good example might be like in San Francisco, uh, there's, there's likely uh, strong connections between um, the salmon fishery and, and other fisheries like uh, crab, for instance. Did that cover your questions or? Any follow-ups? Um, I think so. So that node size then is different than because the, the node size in those in your network diagrams has to do with how important that fishery is as a percentage of people's revenue, right? Yes. In this case, importance is like importance with a capital I. It, it, it the other name for it is eigenvector centrality, and it's a specific network statistic. Okay. All right. This is a good note for us to think about going forward that um, that when we're showing um, outputs from these models that um, the uh, node size, it, it, we, we might do, just want to look for a consistency between our graphics uh, because node size can be interpreted differently depending on which kind of fishery participation image one's looking at. We we ought to we ought to think that through. So that's a helpful comment. Um, yeah, so it might be interesting. So, sorry, just that might be interesting to see what this would look like if you used the if you had the the node size done the way that you had it in the other one. But I'm not. Maybe that's not possible. Be, anyway, but. Sorry, go ahead and go out. Go on. Uh, just Chris, before we do uh, move on, we, there's two more hands, one from Will and one from Michael O'Farrell. So uh, if we can entertain those real quick and then uh, we'll keep keep plowing ahead. So uh, sure. Will, Satterthwaite. Yeah, so hopefully this is a quick specific question. If not, we can just move on. And also apologies if I missed it, but is the point of the sort of pink box just to highlight the general direction of these relationships, or is there some kind of interpretation or threshold analysis behind exactly where you drew those boundaries? 
It, it's just uh, highlighting the areas above the medians for the X and Y axes. Um, it, more than anything, it was just to help orient the eye. Great, thanks. Uh, to, where, uh, to where a lot of the large uh, importance uh, port groups are. Okay, Michael, throw you ahead. Thanks. Um, I think I have probably a lot to learn about this plot uh, that, I, <laughs> that I don't understand at the, at the current time, but I think this is pretty relevant to some of the things that we're dealing with in the salmon fishery, um, where we've seen a lot of uh, in large increase in participation in California areas and a real decrease in participation or effort in the way we're measuring it um, in Oregon. And some of the members of the fleet have mentioned that uh, the loss of certain um, other fisheries in California, like there has not been good albacore fishing in California um, for quite a while, and the loss of spring crab fishing um, due to whale entanglement issues. And so, um, you know, there's just there's fewer alternatives to turn to. I assume that's all sort of cooked into this, but um, um, but it's interesting. I think that uh, you know these sorts of changes that we're seeing kind of on a relatively rapid basis uh, in, in the fishery would be of use to us on the salmon technical team um, thinking about effort um, distributions along the coast. So not so much a question there, but uh, I, and I, I did gather from the questions that this does tell you something about trend and uh, participation, and um, that's something that, that I, I think and, uh, we at the STT would be interested in. Well, I, maybe I'll just, um, I don't, I'm, Jamil might have other thoughts about this. This does represent just a 12 month period, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but uh, tracking how this changes over time uh, could be really uh, informative uh, if the, if the, you know, approach is, is uh, thought to be in the interpretation of the uh, metrics are thought to be reasonable. Um, and, and, and that sounds like a pretty good uh, avenue to dig into. Yeah, thanks. That's, that is what my interest in this is actually so that's great well let's uh let's push through to the end so we leave some time for discussion um I'm going to close the, the review of the portfolio by noting that we have two great opportunities to take um, all those trees I just described and find the forest within them. Uh, the first place is in our executive summary, uh, and uh, which we updated last year to be more graphical and hopefully more engaging to our audience. Uh, the second is the final body of the, or the final page of the main body, uh, which we reserve for synthesis. Uh, both of them uh, allow for some higher level integration of how we interpret conditions for salmon from the major regions prioritized by the council. And those could be uh, those could be summed up with graphics and bullet points in the executive summary uh, and short sum up sentences uh, or paragraphs in the synthesis section. And I'm particularly pointing to the synthesis section here because uh, I think we've made this a bit of a misnomer and a bit of a catch-all uh, section uh, in some past reports, but if we more intentionally view uh, the ESR as an integrative and broad scale document, then it should motivate us uh, to include some really clear, concise statements about conditions that affect salmon cohorts in the system at the time of the report. Uh, rather than just, again, having a bunch of indicators before uh, and not coming back, circling back and wrapping them up here at the end. That rewards any reader who relies on this section to provide the bottom line. Um, and it seems especially valuable right now, given the sharp contrasts in freshwater marine conditions that have affected many of our recent cohorts. Uh, this is a section where we should be uh, clearly stating the outcomes and uncertainties as best we understand them around these natural experiments. Um, so just to summarize, um, the, the suite of indicators here provides broad coverage across the life, salmon life cycle from three major regions of PFMC concern. That's uh, the, mainly the Columbia Basin, uh, coastal uh, Northern California and Oregon, uh, and uh, the Central Valley with inevitable gaps. Um, many of the indicators here are sufficiently broad uh, as to provide um, information about other species groups as well, which is appropriate for the contextual, contextual scope of the ESR. Uh, I just would note again that we're talking here about removing or simplifying some uh, time series to streamline um, the report, both in 
response to direct questions, as well as, again, uh, thinking about the contextual scope intended for the ESR. Uh, and although we are removing some things, it's likely that uh, we'll have some new analyses uh, that will be added in the future, uh, hopefully ones that uh, have sufficiently broad scale, um, and uh, that uh, eventually some of those kinds of uh, new analyses might uh, find their way out of the ESR uh, and into uh, products that support FEP Initiative 2.1. Um, th these kinds of new uh, requests uh, inevitably arise in and emerge from uh, requests from uh, advisory bodies, and we want to be able to to uh, address those uh, requests without also continuing to make the report bigger and bigger. Uh, so we should be taking advantage of, of say, other FMP-specific indicator reporting through uh, Initiative 2.1 uh, or hyperlinks to the uh, uh, CCIA website. So I think we'll close there uh, and open the floor for questions and discussion. Chris, and I'm really happy to let you preside over this uh, if you'd like. Uh, and I want to note that the slide after this one, uh, I do have some ideas about some gaps that are queued up that might be worth discussing if we have time. But um, I think it's uh, fair to open the floor to the to the committee. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, and I want to just start by uh, thanking you for your work on this and uh, the hard work of sort of reflecting and synthesizing um, a lot of indicators across a lot of different um, areas of the ecosystem, all through the lens of what they mean for salmon. So um, I really appreciated that uh, that overview and the suggestions, um, what you're intending to do moving forward. Um, so I do want to um, open it up for questions, and I guess what I would propose, uh, how we structure this a bit, just to make sure we cover what we need to cover, um, that we first just focus on the uh, the material that Chris covered in terms of things that the CCIEA team is proposing to take out, um, and ask if anyone has any comments about those in particular. Um, or if we are in general agreement with what um, uh, what the suggestions were there. Um, and I see a hand from Will. Yeah, um, and so sort of combination comment question. Um, so I think I do support, um, well, I do, yeah, I not just think, I, I do like the general approach you've laid out and the sort of idea of the, um, ESR in particular, sort of focusing on the forest and less on the trees. Um, you did mention that some of the sort of individual trees, like the individual outlooks for some specific stocks might go into FMP specific reports. And I was just curious, and this might be more process than science, but were you envisioning, you know, sort of adding them to reports by the STT or whatever other management team, or were you sort of envisioning IEA team reports just under different sort of agenda items. But I definitely, yeah, first, just, I mean, I do like the idea of focusing the ESR more on the forest, for sure. Uh, thanks, Will. That, to me, feels like uh, the kinds of um, process that's going to get laid out under Initiative 2.1, as I understand it. Um, I, and I don't know if other people uh, have that in mind, too. I mean, I'm, I'm looking down the road a few years here and assuming that uh, that the ESR should co-evolve with the direction that the new initiative takes us in. Um, and um, to the extent it's it's possible and reasonable to avoid a redundancy of, of materials, uh, it makes sense to do that. Um, so that, that's, that's something that I think is going to involve a fair amount of of coordination and uh, and and discussion uh, and consideration of workload, uh, but um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Looking for hands. Any other thoughts on the proposed um, things that are going to be moved? Uh, Melissa, go ahead. Hi, Chris. Thanks for a really nice presentation this morning. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm supportive of the changes that you are proposing or that your team is proposing. Um, I like kind of stepping back and taking the larger scale view of things. And I'm wondering if you've thought about 
exploring or expanding the like the data reduction techniques like the DFA that you showed for the ecosystem state index to other components of this report. I'm kind of specifically thinking about the stoplight tables where some of them have a really large number of of um, indices in them. Uh, I think for me that would be helpful, but I'm wondering what your group has has been thinking. Uh, thanks, Melissa. There is a whole bunch of thunder on that coming later in the presentation today, and I'm not going to steal it from Brian and Corey. <laughs> uh, they will talk uh, quite a bit about uh, dealing with cross-correlation of, um, of indicators that are in the stoplights and uh, ways that we might go about reducing um, that um, that uh, repetition or redundancy. And um, in you know, other opportunities to to look for that, suss it out, and deal with it. I think definitely lend more to a a, a forest than trees approach. I'm I'll be curious to see how that plays out with our audience because um, it, it's hard for me to tell, like say, what council members think when they see a time series um, or two versus when they see a stoplight table or a cluster diagram or something. And uh, you know, we we need to be mindful of how not just what we're you know doing is able to coalesce and condense those indicators but also how it lands with uh with people that are viewing it uh but uh but definitely agree with with you and you'll hear more about that in the uh after the break well that's very exciting and i agree that this is a dialogue with end users to see what they find useful um just a general statement i i like the idea of higher level of kind of synthetic analysis across uh, areas where you have multiple individual time series, and I understand that this is potentially a really big undertaking for this team, uh, so I don't make that statement lightly. Nor, nor do you do, uh, well, I won't speak for Melissa, but nor would I expect that to occur between now and March, so. <laughs> um, so, so sounds like general uh, agreement with, with your proposals there, uh, Chris. Um, and I also uh, appreciate the intention to keep all of the fine scale indicators in the uh, online database. So people that are interested in diving into the details will be able to do that if they like. Um, so, okay, so we've we've got that. And that, so I'd like to move then to the, some of the additions that you've proposed, anything that was, that was particularly new in this talk. We talked a little bit about the um, participation network uh, with respect to salmon um, and so I think we kind of covered that one but if there are any other uh, proposed additions to the report that um, people flagged as we were going through let's talk about those uh, and I'm looking for hands I will start by just saying that I think that um, I flagged the the uh, prey, the growing conditions indicator. So thinking about prey, the krill and forage abundance, um, that those seem like uh, the krill one in particular would be a good one for the SSC to ES to review at a future September meeting um, when that is ready to and makes its way into the report. Um, and I see a hand from John Field. Thanks, yeah, just a very minor comment that I wasn't even sure was worth raising, but since you mentioned the prey stuff, uh, I definitely agree that looking for coastwide indicators of prey uh, is a great idea and support looking at the two surveys, CPS and Hake. Uh, the pre-recruit and rockfish survey are also now coastwide, have been for since about 2011. And we've been behind at providing the IEA team with some kind of regional and coastwide perspectives on that, but that's something we're, we're hoping to do in the hopes that will be informative for salmon, among other things. John, thank you so much for reminding me of that. I, uh, that definitely uh, did not find its way into our discussion or presentation today. So thanks so much. And, uh, and yeah, we are, we are overdue for, uh, for talking with you about it as well. Um, and, in, you know, both in terms of just getting those time series uh, represented and, and figuring out the best way to visualize them and so forth, but also just uh, checking to see how things like effort uh, disruption by COVID or funding or whatever might affect uh, our ability to make, you know, complete 
border-to-border uh, -border regional comparisons, but definitely look forward to talking to you about that. That's a great point. Thank you, Mike agrees, and uh, we'll follow up. Thanks for the humanity. Um, Chris, if you, maybe this would be a good time for you to move to your next slide and sort of open it up for a broader discussion or specific things that you, you would like to hear from us. Yeah, I mean, so I got a list here and I, I definitely uh, of potential gaps <clears throat> and, you know, a, a laundry list of gaps invites uh, brainstorming and pile on. And, uh, and, you know, I don't know if that's the best way to use the, the rest of the time before the break, but, um, uh, you know, I, this is a this is a, a very bright and very you know thoughtful group and if if you've been thinking all along through review of this material and uh, the presentation this morning that uh, why aren't they studying X uh, and you want to talk about X maybe it's represented here uh, or or maybe it's not but if there are if there are just bright flashing lights um, in either what we're presenting that we sh what we're not presenting that we should um, or things that you know about that you think um, have really good ecosystem value, whether it's ecological or socioeconomic, um, this is a great time to, to, to raise them. Um, talked about a couple of them here, but if, uh, if there are others that, that you're wondering, how come they never present anything on, on X? I see um, a hand. Uh, Michael O'Farrell, go ahead. I would just like to lend my support to the last bullet on your list here. Uh, it's a topic of pers uh, particular concern currently um, and something that, you know, we're trying to wrap our heads around with the STT. That's great. Um, I think um, uh, Cameron, has and and I chatted a little bit about this um, in um, in the last week and um, thinking about ways that we could uh, help support that to make it happen. I mean, this seems like a really fundamental connect the dots kind of uh, of of question um, that I think would be great in the report if we could uh, uh, find the support to to push analyses across the finish line. Uh, Dan, did you want to comment on that one too? Uh, no, I have a sort of a separate comment, but um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know if this is the appropriate time or not, because I'm, I'm a little bit confused, you know, because you've covered, the, you, this was mainly focused on the salmon stuff, but you've covered more broadly kind of what's, you know, changes to their overall report and flavor of the report and stuff. So this is a, a more of a comment um, on um the overall flavor of the report and made more on HD indicators. So is, is that may, perhaps better to save that for this afternoon? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry, Kristen, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I, I had one more comment just on the salmon um, topic before we, uh, before we go zoom out to um, human dimensions focused, if we could, Dan, if you don't mind just holding it for a second. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just, so I did want to ask Chris, I think, you know, something that the SSC had said in our reports in the past is, you know, there is this, this um, trend of increasing the number of indicators, increasing the, the amount of research that is, is put into this report. And, um, and while, you know, we have definitely seen here some proposals that you're making for moving things or sh shifting things out, um, I think, you know, here's a quite a big list of things that that we could be considering to add, right? Uh, and so I don't know that we've ever really given you a chance to respond to that comment where we say <laughs> over and over again, <laughs> um, you know, uh, let's let's think about streamlining. And so so I guess I would just I would just at, like to ask ask you what you think about this. And, um, you know, is it are will is it inevitable that the report keeps getting bigger or, or, um, you know, do you continue to see opportunities for streamlining moving forward? 
Yeah, um, well, I think it's not inevitable that it keeps getting bigger and that uh, we should look at Initiative 2.1 as a way, a kind of a lifeline for or uh, an, an escape hatch for the ESR because I, I my interpretation of 2.1 um, from the perspective of someone who's, you know, written these things since 2014 or whatever it is, um, is that it allows us to focus more on what was originally described in the FEP as the intent of this, which is to give a very big, broad picture uh, with the target audience being people that need, you know, some added context rather than that need all the nuts and bolts. Uh, the, the general context can be for council members or for members of the public or the press or, or, um, or you know, uh, fishery participants um, or, um, you know, and, and then, you know, connecting it to the nuts and bolts in any one of those groups or, or individuals might decide, actually, I want to know more. Um, so connecting this report um, to eventual FMP level ecosystem um, indicator summaries makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, there's no reason why this report needs to be, you know, 100 pages long if, uh, you know, 10, 15 pages of that content actually belongs in an FMP level report. Um, the work to do that will be, you know, potentially spread across the same group of people, but um, but we can make the uh, uh, hopefully we can make the the products uh, distinct from one another and uh, you know complementary to one another. Um, and then I, I think another part of your question here is, you know, this is a long list, and I'm not asking do we need to, do we need indicators for every one of them. I guess the the obvious gaps of greatest concern uh, as flagged up at the very top. Um, um, you know, gaps that are of concern that also seem fillable. Like if it feels like this report is not effective because it doesn't include growing conditions off of California or human dimensions indicators beyond just landings and revenue that relate to salmon in a way that's important to the council uh, and council participants, then it would be good to know what those absolute got to have them type indicators um, that are also fillable should be. Um, so if we are going to, I think we're always going to get comments say, saying the report would be better if you did this. And there's some obligation to honor those requests and suggestions. Um, but, um, but if we can, uh, if we can kind of check these three boxes of gaps that are of concern and that are fillable before we add another plot in there. Uh, and we know why they're of great concern relative to the salmon life cycle and connections to human dimensions uh, endpoints. I think we're doing a better job that way and a more intentional job that way than just, okay, we'll put it in the report. So it's, it's, there's some uh, kind of philosophy behind writing the reports uh, that's, I think we just want to be more intentional about. Great, thank you. Thanks for that response. Um, and I, so we are, oh, I see Oli has his hand up. Um, Dan, uh, let me just circle back to Dan because he wanted to go to her human dimensions. Do you think we can cover that in the afternoon, Chris? Can we return to that or or will there be time or not in the, sorry, not in the afternoon, but um, at the end of the salmon section before lunch or should we do it now? Um, well, we could do it. We could do it in the next steps after, because I think Corey and Brian and Nate will be pretty much on the ecology side of the um, of the ecosystem. So, um, and I you know, they've got a fair number of slides, so I want to make sure that they have a chance to get through them. If if we can if we can hold it to the end um, in the next steps uh, portion, that might be sensible. I don't. Is that okay with you, Dan? Sure, that's fine. Great. Um, and then, uh, Oli, do you you have your hand up? Go ahead. Yeah, I do. I do. This doesn't need to be quick. My only, or this doesn't need to be quick. This should be quick. Um, my uh, only comment was sort of, I actually think that second thing on the list there, the hatchery natural component is sort of a big deal for the ecosystem world, simply because hatchery and natural are called out as different in the FMP, the salmon FMP, and the hatchery and natural play a big role in some of the ecosystem connections between salmon and other stuff. So, manage, you know, NIMS recently got sued about uh, Alaska hatchery contributions to fisheries 
and Southern Resident killer whale and impacts. So it's all about the hatchery natural. So there's a whole bunch of ecosystem related things for salmon that fall into that category. Um, I don't have any specific uh, indicators to suggest to you for right now, but I do think that area is sort of seems relatively important um, in the near future for the for council consideration. So that's all. More of a comment, less of a question. Thanks, Oli. That's really helpful, and it makes me think of one other uh, which question, which should be up here at the top, um, uh, and that is um, which of the indicators uh, can we. Uh, d deliver on in a timely, uh, timely manner. Um, no, I, I, I can follow up with you about that, but um, it's just a reminder to me that um, these things also have to land um, on an on ramp uh, that they can be used. Um, and um, you know, depending on how long it takes to compile information um, and the lag time between, say, when hatchery smolts went to sea and when we're actually able to get those numbers. Uh, It'd be great to to talk more about things like that in some kind of workshop environment in the future. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks. Thanks, Oli and uh, Chris. Just noting that um, you got a plus one to that comment from Will in the chat. So, um, and I think this you know this is a great list to um, to to bring back to the STT and the SAS and um, think about you know what they think are the um, would be most helpful and appreciate uh, Michael Farrell's comments uh, on that at the start of this. So, um, and with that, we are cutting into our break. So I want to just thank Chris for this great presentation, start to the morning, um, and we will go on break for 12 minutes and come back at 10 o'clock for our next section on stop late.
Okay, I have 10.00 on my clock, so I will reconvene us after our break here. Um, before we launch into the next section, I just, two things I forgot. Um, first, I, I didn't check with Galen to make sure she didn't have any clarifying questions about her, about the reporting from that last item. So if she's back, I'll ask her that. I'm good, thanks. Okay, okay great. And then second, um, we uh, we didn't check in about recusals at the beginning of this meeting, so I also just want to uh, check about that. Um, and oh, and uh, let's see. Oh, and now there's a third thing. So let's. And so before we do recusals, third thing, uh, Will just pointed out to me that uh, our newest appointed SSC member, Tommy Moore, is with us uh, in this meeting today. And so um, I also just want to take the a minute to welcome Tommy to the group. Um, and um, we're glad to have you and looking forward to, to working with you, uh, you know, in a different capacity for, for a bit on the SSC. Uh, okay, so let's do recusals. Um, so I have one, um, let's see. I will write these down. Or actually, John DeVore, would you write these down? Will do. Thank you. Um, so I have one. I just, uh, the person that I'm married to contributed slides to both the presentations that we're seeing today. So um, that's my recusal. Um, does anyone else have any conflicts that they need to disclose? Kristen, so that I'm not sure is that's, that's uh, means for a recusal. Um, so yes, he's not, I just think he's, <laughs> he's not, not presenting, but just so we all know. Cameron. Um, for the item this afternoon, the climate change appendix, I'm a co-author on one of the papers that Karma is going to be kind of drawing from. Um, so that's a small portion of the, of the climate change appendix, but that's my quote unquote conflict. Thanks, Cameron. Dan? Uh, yeah, so I'm Karma's supervisor. So to, to the degree there's, again, I don't know that there's anything that we're gonna vote on or anything, but um, just putting that up there. Yep, thank you, Dan. Um, well. Yeah, and I don't, Think, well, maybe this is a refusal. So I'm just looking at slide 69 is drawn from a paper I'm a co-author on. Um, but otherwise, I don't see anything that would rise to the level of recusal for me. But I might be missing something. But also that, I don't know if it's a recusal that somebody is showing a figure from a picture you were, or from a paper you were co-author on. Um, but yeah. Maybe for the record. I <laughs> Thank you for the record, probably not. Um, and I think, yeah, it's good for us to just err on the side of putting it out there and then we can decide whether or not it's actually an issue. Um, okay, I, is that it? All right, so then um, welcome back from break and we'll move on to our next uh, topic. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to Will to lead the next two items on our agenda through lunch. So I will let you introduce the item and the speaker as well. Uh, great, thanks Kristen. Um, and so you know, I think the model that Kristen posed for us has been working really well of um, try to hold discussion until the end. Although if you do have a sort of very targeted specific question uh, raise your hand and we can address it as the presentation goes. Um, otherwise, we're starting out with best practices for stoplight tables. And the presenters listed are Brian Burke, Nate Mantua, and Corey Green. Um, and of the readings we got in advance, I think um, the IEA report or the ecosystem status report, in particular, section 3.3 and then Appendix J are probably the most relevant items for this agenda item in addition to the Friedman et al. 2019 paper we were provided with. Um, other than that, I think, you know, Kristen's already set the context pretty well for what kind of questions we're trying to answer. So I will hand it off to whoever is going to be showing the first slide of our presentation 
on the best practices for stoplight tables. Uh, thanks, Will. I'll be driving the presentation, but uh, yielding the floor to my colleague, colleagues here in a second. Um, so let's get this queued back up again. And um, we're going to transition into the uh, second half of our of our presentation, parts two and three, uh, and we'll focus first on stoplight tables. Um, as a reminder, early on, we mentioned the diversity of salmon stock structure, uh, and since then, we've talked a lot about uh, a lot of indicators that relate to different stages of salmon life history. But because we want to improve our focus on integration to make sense of them all, let's winnow this picture down to just the ones that are of focal interest to the council, most focal interest to the council, and further narrow it down to stocks and complexes for which we have stoplight tables either developed uh, or under development. And this certainly looks a lot more manageable than that previous slide did. Um, Corey Green, Nate Mantua, and Brian Burke are gonna talk you through the approaches that they've taken to these stoplight tables as frameworks for integration across key parts of the same life cycle. Uh, just a quick overview, um, just a reminder that stoplight tables, uh, we use them as communication and synthesis tools uh, to pool indicators into more readily digestible pictures of conditions for species or the ecosystem. Uh, second, we've made some propose, we have proposed some improvements um, to our stoplights based on your recommendations from previous reviews. Um, in other cases, we actually still are facing some challenges and I think you'll you'll see that throughout. Uh, third, the presentation on the overall portfolio tried to keep the focus at a large scale where possible, the forest. Uh, this section is going to be a, a mix of regional approaches with stock specific ones, as well as a mix of statistical and mechanistic approaches. So this section might feel a little disjointed at times, and if so, we just ask that you bear with us and keep in mind that these efforts that Corey, Nate, and Brian are going to talk about have been somewhat independent efforts over time with different objectives uh, that are starting to merge together. Uh, we're considering ways to use these tables in ways that um, su could support uh, the broad reach of the ESR and eventually the more focused scope of stock level guidance that might come out of initiative 2.1. And then just finally, as Corey, Nate, and Brian take you through the approaches, we're hoping that you might keep these general questions in the back of your mind along with others that arrive to you along the way. Uh, first, what are you most looking for from the stoplights? Uh, second, how do we balance consistency uh, uh, across the stoplight tables uh, versus the different objectives that might you know, arise for different tables? And then third, how do we balance what works in a stoplight table right now versus what might be important uh, for a stoplight in the future as conditions uh, continue to change. And with that, I'm going to hand the uh, floor over to Corey Green. Thanks, Chris. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, my name is Corey Green. I am a biologist at the Northwest Fishery Science Center in the Watershed Program. And I'm also chair of the Habitat Committee and work uh, with the IEA team to assemble some of these freshwater indicators in the report. So um, I'm gonna be talking about the newest additions to stoplight tables in the ESR, and that's these habitat indicators for stocks rebuilding plans. They were initiated uh, when we had poor conditions for Fall Run, Sacramento, and Klamath stocks. Uh, particularly in those critical brood years of 2012 to 2014. And the uh, analysis within uh, the rebuilding plan suggested multiple possible habitat impacts. And so the, at that point, the STT uh, worked, uh, requested help from the Habitat Committee to track um, some of these habitat changes. And the Habitat Committee uh, suggested that we do this via multiple um, dynamic habitat indicators. Next slide. And so the objectives were definitely a retrospective approach, really focus on those habitat conditions in those critical years and document how those impacts have changed more recently. Uh, basically come up with multiple indicators, so potentially evaluate cumulative impacts at different life stages, identify habitat actions for potential council engagement where possible, um, so that these indicators could be useful in the council process. I would also note that there's sort of an evolving uh, fifth 
newer sort of objective that um, and that's to improve status determination for stocks with assessment limitations. And that's really focused on this request um, from uh, the regional office uh, to examine habitat indicators for a Central Valley Spring Run Chinook. And I'll talk about that right at the end. Um, next slide. So uh, within the materials that you were provided, you got, um, gave you a, a background of this long list of habitat indicators that we put together. And this was carefully vetted. We looked for indicators with published support or within the re, uh, rebuilding plan of particular council interest. And so this list uh, is divided into life stages, uh, spawning, spawners, incubation and emergence, freshwater and delta residents, hatchery releases uh, uh, to recognize the fact that there are uh, basically in the in both systems hatchery of fish represent a large portion of the runs and also marine residents. As you can see, most of the indicators are really focused on these freshwater uh, time periods um, and that was intentional really to get at this the non fishing impacts question. Uh, that said, the, the list of uh, marine based habitat indicators was, was carefully vetted with a number of people. And so that list really reflects um, the input of a lot of people. And so while it's short, it's, it's definitely intent, uh, was, was well reviewed. Uh, um, just a, a couple more notes of this table. Um, first, each of these indicators speci are, are specified with particular time periods. Well, um, or uh, they're blank. If there's, it's not time period relevant, there's also a couple indicators which are annual. And um, uh, oh, the far right specifies which stocks, either the Sacramento or Klamath runs, which these indicators were relevant for. And so the indicator selection usually followed sort of the typical um, IEA approach to indicators, uh, look for strong support, um, and so all these indicators uh, are vetted with published information, and you can find that um, within the ESR. Uh, in particular, there's four indicators, which Nate will talk about, which are included in this longer list. Um, also, we wanted these to be annually variable and uh, a long retrospective record, and so that limited us to certain indicators which um, did not have a time series. We also wanted these to be updatable straightforwardly um, and in a time period which was useful um, to potentially sort of make this uh, forward looking as well. And so these the indicators then need to be sort of within the time period where they can become a leading indicator for future returns. Next slide. Uh, so just a, a really quick note on the methodology. Basically, we screened these data sets um, and looked uh, and, and sort of uh, focused on these relevant time periods for the different life stages. We used, uh, we then converted those data to standardized anomalies. And uh, an important point is we directionalized these based on the expected effect uh, on that life stage. And so uh, a couple of examples here, are, are, are contrasting examples would be flow and temperatures. The expectation is that uh, flows have a positive effect for life stages while they have, uh, while temperature has a negative effect. And, and so we needed to directionalize those. And so those with a negative effect, uh, basically multiply, uh, the standardized anomalies were multiplied by negative one to reverse their direction. Um, these uh, are then taken and color coded, so uh, and with breaks at the 33 and 67th percentiles. Uh, so they re represent sort of relative changes, uh, and they um, don't incorporate sort of um, some base period or anything like that. So it's just a year by year specific. And so uh, as in, as additional data come online, those are, are potentially sensitive to changes. Uh, in their means and variances. And um, I'll let Brian tackle that uh, issue when he speaks. Next slide. All right, so here's the summary for the uh, Klamath Fall Run. And so each of the columns represents uh, all the indicators by brood year, and then each of the rows represents each of the individual habitat indicators divided into these different life stages. And so uh, several uh, important sort of 
considerations when you look at this. The uh, green represents uh, relatively good conditions and the red represents relatively poor conditions. Uh, the gray areas represents um, time periods where we had no data for a particular indicator. And so as you, as you look across these, you can uh, notice that there's some uh, co-variation, particularly within life stages. And so that's an important consideration as we think about moving this forward and perhaps um, reducing these data sets to something more manageable for ESR. In the Klamath, where we have uh, a run reconstruction to compare these indicators with in particular years, uh, we also just looked at the sign of the indicators um, with um, expected returns for that year. Um, and that basically confirmed our expected directionality for most of the indicators. There were some exceptions, however. Um, also, I would note that the, uh, those correlations with pre-spawner recruits, which was our which was our metric from the run reconstruction, those uh, most of these correlations are generally low. I mean, basically, we have a maximum value of 0.4 when we look at the entire data sets, the correlations of the entire data sets. And as you look at the entire sort of time series and the entire suite of habitat indicators, you can notice an overall decline. There's more teal in the upper left, and more red in the lower right, suggesting that these habitat uh, indicators um, provide some reflection of, of um, poorer conditions, at least uh, for Klamath Fall Run. Next slide. We saw a slightly different pattern with the Sacramento fall run indicators. And I'd note if you look down the column, I mean, the, the different rows, there's some slightly different indicators. So, for example, we have a cross channel uh, indicator uh, for spawners and for uh, freshwater and estuary residents. Um, we also have a YOLO bypass uh, indicator reflecting uh, potential benefits of re um, residents within floodplains. Um, but by and large, we don't see that that um, that really sort of general trend of teal in the left, red in the right, and it, uh, the pattern appears more cyclical when you just uh, qualitatively look at this. However, we do see these cross correlations, particularly uh, in that freshwater and estuary stages. There's where there's red in one indicator, there's often red in another or green. So. Um, Basically, as a way to summarize these and to reflect the fact that we have these missing data sets for particular um, indicators, we just used a simple, the simplest approach, which was an average of the standardized anomalies. Um, and we did that for our freshwater conditions and for marine conditions. And so that's what's shown next. So you can see these summaries in the ESR and uh, here they repeated for the Klamath and the Sacramento. And um, these are summarized again by brood year. That's the average of the standardized scores for the, the, all the freshwater indicators uh, in black and marine indicators in the dash blue line. Just looking at these overall patterns, several results jumped out. First, there's a negative trend in freshwater in the Klamath, um, much less so for the Sacramento. There's a, uh, also, you see this uh, for the marine conditions, there seems to be a cyclical pattern really corresponding with these well-published decadal cyclicity. Freshwater conditions offset marine conditions to some degree, uh, perhaps reflecting sort of these benefits uh, of anadromous life histories. So when, when uh, freshwater conditions are positive, marine conditions tend to be negative. One interesting aspect of this was where we saw a um, sort of a deviation from this pattern. Um, that's particularly uh, obvious right at, uh, after the red line, which denotes the first uh, critical year of the rebuilding plan. Um, those are associated with a combination of both uh, poor freshwater and poor marine conditions. So uh, we've uh, still got plenty of work to do on these indicators. Next slide. And you've uh Quickly, Corey, I see Dan Holland. Do you have a quick question, Dan? I had a quick question on that slide. Um, you said there it's by brood year, but so is it the conditions, but it's it's the conditions in 2010 in the marine, or is it 
is it, um, or are these things um, skewed or, or shifted to account for for when that brood year went went it was in marine? Yeah, conditions? that's a great question, Dan. And the answer is the latter. So we're thinking about the life cycle starting with the brood year, and those habitat indicators at particular life step at particular life stages uh, coming in um, at uh, different points following that brood year. Okay, thanks. Next slide. So uh, I wanted to give you a sense of where we're going with these uh, indicators, just uh, in case you're interested in providing uh, more feedback. Um, and more review. Uh, basically, the first step is to develop these Central Valley Spring Run Chinook Salmon Indicators. That was a request by the regional office in the March meeting, and we're, we're planning to deliver those in November. And then those should be available for general review, um, perhaps in the um, ESR. Uh, also, as part of the ESR, we would like to evaluate some of these questions about indicator covariance and redundancy uh, um, as part of our annual update. Um, and uh, our long, sort of longer term uh, expectation is that we can examine some of the directionality and non stationarity of indicators relative to our productivity metrics uh, where we have them. And so uh, all these sort of uh, reflect a timeline where um, basically we'll have updates. Um, in the March ESR, and, and, um, and so if you're interested in further review, that might be a good time period or right after that to delve into some more of the details of these habitat indicators. And with that, if there's any clarifying questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, we can move on to Nate, who is going to talk about a subset of these indicators um, that have been developed for a slightly different objective. Yeah, I don't see any hands, so I think Nate, take the lead. Okay. So, uh, and so this is a bit of a rehash of a presentation that Brian Wells and I made two years ago to the SSC's ecosystem subcommittee, where we made a pitch for including a new indicator table that was specific to California's Central Valley Fall Run Chinook salmon. And it's a really composite of the natural and hatchery stocks. This was based on a publication that Whitney Friedman led where the team synthesized a number of different studies and basically formalized it into a model framed around the life cycle of these stock, of these populations that make up the stock, and use model selection to identify environmental covariates that we're best able to describe the historical variation over about a 25 year period from the early 80s to 2016, um, at least those brood years. And the most influential processes that were identified in that analysis were river temperature during the incubation period, wintertime freshwater flow, which is a time of both rearing and out migration for both uh, the hatchery and natural stocks. And then environmentally mediated predation in the early marine period. And the performance of this model was also very dependent upon specifying the spawning escapement and ocean harvest rates. If you go to the next slide, please. And of the environmental drivers, we did and continue to think about how we might classify them as good average or poor are good sort of median or poor in that the spawning escapement has a clear management goal but that management goal may not actually represent 
uh, very clear ecological goals. Uh, and that's suggested by some work that was published by Stuart Munch and others two years ago. Will Satterthwaite has looked into this. Uh, you might comment on that, Will, if there's interest in more discussion. And for the river temperature during the incubation period, that is based on a uh, egg mortality model that is, was developed by Ben Martin here a few years ago that was supported by both lab and field data. And since that time, even more lab studies have strengthened our understanding for why incubation temperature has such a strong influence on egg to fry survival rates. So we have a pretty good handle on the mechanisms there and a quantitative relationship that can inform temperature and translate it into a stage specific survival rate. And for winter flow, a, a great deal of work has looked at the impact of flow on out migration survival rates for both hatchery and wild stocks based on uh, many years of tagging data now. Uh, Stuart Munch also has some really nice work looking at the natural area um, occupancy of fry in the winter period and how that relates to both flow and temperature. So we have a lot of good solid information underlying the importance of winter flow and the fact that that winter flow is correlated with spring flow all the way out through the Delta. And it has a major impact on out migration success for the hatchery stocks that are released in river and for the natural stock. Uh, uh, it looks like it's really important for both the rearing capacity and the out migration success. And then the ocean predation index was developed from studies looking at seabird diets on the Southeast Farallon Island and also the seabird abundance, which has changed dramatically in recent decades in that colony. And that the diet studies have showed some years having a relatively high diet fraction of juvenile salmon and most years almost no observations at all of um, seeing seabirds there. But we think that this is also an indicator related to changes in the physical habitat, how the sea surface temperature field and upwelling processes expand or contract the productive food web area around this critical uh, entry point for Central Valley salmon, basically under the Golden Gate Bridge into the Gulf of the Farallons, where in some years, our evidence suggests there's a lot of early marine predation and in other years, not so much. Uh, next slide, please. But as I noted, there are some ongoing challenges in how we present this for things like incubation temperature and winter flow, we have developed some quantitative relationships between the physical index and survival rates at these different life stages. So we can specify a survival rate that goes with that. If you look at the history of these variables and how they translate into survival rates, these are not normally distributed time series. So splitting them into thirds, based on some distributions doesn't seem warranted and doesn't seem uh, ecologically meaningful. And at least the seabird marine predation index is also a very skewed variable with uh, just a, a few values that are really high predation rates and most not being that way. And then again, it just noted with the spawning escapement, there are management goals, but those management goals maybe don't translate very well into uh, productivity relationships between natural fry production and uh, natural area spawning escapement. Another complicating factor that has been alluded to already this morning is that the hatchery production system has changed pretty dramatically in California Central Valley in recent decades, uh, especially in the last decade during periods of very poor 
freshwater conditions when there's just not much cold water going down the rivers in the winter and spring. More and more of the hatchery production has been trucked to offsite release areas. In some of the extreme years, they've even put chillers in the hatcheries to keep those incubating eggs cold. So the relevance for the freshwater indicators for the hatchery stock has likely become much less in some recent years. And the um, full table is probably still uh, relevant for the natural production. And the seabird marine predation index is, is also sort of an, an <laughs> unfortunate uh, situation right now in that the provider of that data has been um, hesitant to share that with us in the last couple of years, that they have struggled to fund the field work that leads to the quantification of seabird diets. So it has not been available to us in the last two years. And we haven't resolved what to do about that. Um, and the last slide that I have, next one, is uh, another sort of emerging challenge that I think of is what to do about anchovies. That if you ask me about ocean conditions for Central Valley salmon in the last few years, the first thing that I'll tell you about is the incredible rise of the central stock of California's anchovy population and its importance in the diet of Central Valley Chinook. And the fact that it is likely having this complicated set of impacts on the productivity of those populations. That in the last few years, we've seen the emergence of thiamine deficiency in all the Central Valley Chinook salmon populations. And this began with the returns in the fall of 2019. And it has continued at least through the winter run returns this year that low thiamine in the eggs of these populations is connected with reduced egg to fry survival rates. And at least for the hatchery populations, there have been efforts to start treating almost all of the Central Valley's Chinook salmon programs. There have been treatments expanded up into the Klamath Basin as well. And at the same time, the abundance of anchovies and the prominence in salmon diets has likely, I think, promoted increased marine growth rates, size and age, and reduced predation risk for these same stocks. And we don't have enough data on hand right now to know how that plays out over the full life cycle and what it means for productivity. But I think it's very clear that it's differentially impacting the natural and hatchery stocks because the hatchery stocks are getting treated. The natural stocks are not. And this is happening at the same time that freshwater conditions have mostly been really poor so that the natural stocks are under great stress from that. And the hatchery stocks are more and more becoming insulated from those freshwater conditions, at least at the spawning, incubation, and out migration stages. So that's all I have um, to present and be happy to take any questions now or at the end of the presentation. Yeah, I think give it a second for any hands to come up on specific questions, but otherwise I think let's sort of hold more synthetic discussion when we get to the, looks like there's sort of a natural break coming up in several slides. Um, so not seeing any hands, I assume is Brian taking the next couple slides? Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Will. Um, so my name is Brian Burke. I work at the Northwest Fishery Science Center in Seattle. Um, I run a large trawling project for uh, studying juvenile salmon in the coastal environment. And I contribute to this stoplight chart, which is um, the Northern California Current uh, stuff like chart's been around for a while, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen it before, and I'm, I'm actually not going to talk in detail about um, the content of this chart. Uh, what I am going to talk about is some of the issues that come up 
and decisions that need to be uh, made when assembling a, a stoplight chart or refining it, because it's actually a lot harder than it looks. Um, and so if we're as a region, if we're gonna use these tools more and more and apply them to specific uh, stocks of salmon, uh, we need to have these discussions about what, how should we make these decisions? Um, so hopefully I'll just give you a, a quick overview. Some of these things have already come up in the, in the previous couple of um, presentations. Um, one of them, in fact, with that I don't have slides about is whether the various charts that we have need to be the same, you know, need to be assembled in a similar way or have some similarities across them. I'm not going to really talk about that, but Chris mentioned it earlier, so it's something you can think about as we as we talk about um, some of the other issues. Uh, Chris, go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. So uh, one of the things to, to be thinking about is that, you know, any particular indicator that goes into a chart ought to have some relationship with the response variable that you're interested in, the salmon survival or population dynamics. Um, and so, you know, we have to ask, well, what is the nature of that relationship? Uh, the, the Northern California current stoplight chart on the left there is very much a, um, a list of variables that are correlated with salmon survival, primarily Columbia River stocks. Um, uh, and so a correlative approach has some uh, pros and cons. Uh, there's a lot of variables out there. We collect a lot of information on the marine environment, so you have a lot of things to select from. Uh, but as you all know, correlations often break down over time. Um, on, the, on the other end of the spectrum is a mechanistic approach where you a priori select, you identify some of the processes that are at play driving marine survival. And then you kind of, then you find indicators that represent those ecosystem components or processes, um, and so these are going to be uh, probably better indicators in the long run with climate change and other shifts in the ecosystem. Uh, but they're also very data hungry, and what you often run into in trying to put together a mechanistic set of indicators is you don't have the data. Um, you know, Chris mentioned earlier in the. Uh, meeting today about um, some of the data gaps, and uh, just as Nate was describing the the um, avian predation data issue, there's a complete gap in the Northern California current for for any sort of predation metric, and so it's one of the limitations of going fully mechanistic is it's just there's we just don't have enough data. Um, okay, uh, next slide, I guess, Chris. Um, another another aspect of this that is important is identifying and minimizing the cross correlation among the variables in a in a chart. So this plot on the left is uh, I'm not going to go into any of these particular indicators. It's just an example of you, know, you you put together a bunch of indicators, and because they're all representing something in the marine con, uh, environment, there's a lot of cross correlation, and so those deep reds and deep blues are um, Correlation coefficients uh, uh, absolute value above 0.8, so that's really high. Um, there's a lot of redundancy in this data set, um, and you know it was mentioned earlier that there are some reduction techniques. I think Corey mentioned taking the average of of indicators in a stoplight chart. Uh, Melissa mentioned earlier maybe using a DFA. A lot of times we use a, a PCA. Uh, so there's different methods of condensing all of this information down to a one or two summary metrics. And the problem with cross-correlation is those summary metrics then get biased to look a lot like the things in the data set that are highly correlated. And maybe some indicator that's really important but provides really unique information gets downgraded in those um, summary metrics. So a goal in putting um, a set of indicators together is to minimize that. Uh, next slide, Chris. Um, something like this, and, and I'm not going to go into some of the methods here, although I do have a slide in the extra slides section on this variance inflation factor, so if, if there's interest, I can go over that slide. Um, but the variance inflation factor is a, what is a statistical procedure to reduce the number of indicators and at the same time minimizing the cross-correlation among them. Um, 
And so it's a great tool, but it's a statistical tool, not an ecological tool. And so there's also, there's a balance between minimizing statistical cross-correlation and still representing the ecological processes that we think are important. Um, so that's that's a tough um, situation and, and there's no there's no really refined way to, to deal with those two aspects of it. Uh, next slide, Chris. Um, so you, the, another thing that comes up is there's a lot of different users for these charts, and um, and they're the the reasons they're using it, the, the management questions they're trying to address are different, and and they have different needs. And so some of the needs are just I just need to know what is this a good year or a bad year? So provide context or a, a qualitative view of of the ocean. And so for those questions. Um, uh, now we have some issues related to how we color code um, the the stoplight charts. And so all of the examples we've been talking about use this equal binning um, method, which is just, you know, it has to be the same number of reds as there are yellows and, and greens in any given row. Um, and I'm going to provide a couple of alternatives for discussion. Um, and uh, for each of them, I, I put in a couple of pros and cons. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but the, you know they'll be here, and it's probably not an exhaustive list, anyways. Um, the pro to an equal binning uh, strategy here is it's super simple, um, and it and it works relatively well. You you can see you know broad brush picture of what's good and what's bad. Um, one of the downsides that Corey mentioned earlier is that as you add new data. Um, past years can actually change color. So if we add, as we're adding more years, and let's say, you know, the, the marine system goes really just tanks and we're adding a bunch of reds, if we need the same number of reds and greens and yellows, then past years that were yellow might turn green and past years that were red might turn yellow. Um, and so that's not ideal. Um, uh, so that's one of the cons of this equal binning. Next slide, Chris. Um, an alternative to this is uh, more of a statistical approach, where for each row, each indicator, we calculate a mean and standard deviation of the time series. And then we color code according to how many standard deviations from the mean any given year is. Um, the, a couple of advantages to this, it's also easy to assemble. Um, what, what I like personally about it is it really highlights the um, extreme values. And so most of this chart, this is the, the exact same chart as the one above it, um, just color coded differently. And most of it's yellow because it's within one standard deviation of the mean. Um, and so you're, you kind of de-emphasize the, the, the average years or where most of the data is. But what you're highlighting is once you get one standard deviation between one and two or greater than two standard deviations from the mean, you, you highlight those with a, a different color and, and um, Often those, ecologically speaking, often those are, um, you know, where we're going to see the biggest impact. And so, um, so that's a that's a, a highlight or a, a pro of, of this approach. Um, both of these approaches, unfortunately, don't really take into account the the ecology of, of the system. So even if you have gone a mechanistic approach to identify what indicators to include, once we color code them. Neither of these address any ecological relationships other than is it different than the mean. Uh, next slide, Chris. Um, and so this third one is uh, a strategy that takes advantage of known ecological relationships. And so maybe uh, we all, maybe there's a threshold relationship between an indicator and the response, and we only highlight or color code cells where the uh, value of the indicator has exceeded some threshold value. Um, the reason I put in a toy example here is because this we don't have any examples of this. This is really hard to do, very data and knowledge intensive. And um, so I, I kind of see these three things as maybe, um, uh, there's certainly three options, but there's there's pros and cons to each. And as you go down from the top to the bottom, they're, they're um, maybe a little bit more beneficial, but uh, also come with um, uh, uh, other constraints. Um, next slide, just thanks. 
Um, so one of the um, th so this aspect of when we add more data, and past years can change. Um, there's really nothing we can do about that for the uh, equal binning strategy of color coding, and for the ecological strategy, there's really no need because you have a threshold in how that process works, and it's either above or below that threshold. And that's going to continue into the future. Uh, but if we if we did choose to use um, this statistical approach where we're looking at how many standard deviations from the mean is a, a particular value, there is a way to deal with that um, uh, issue of, of past years changing color, and that is to create a base period. A lot of uh, a lot a lot of what we do in in um, ecology and and atmospheric sciences uses a base period to sort of set. Um, the mean and standard deviation of a time series uh, and fix it. And so, for example, we might say, well, let's just use the first 20 years of our time series. We'll calculate the mean and standard deviation. We'll color code those cells according to that. Um, and as we add more years, we're not going to recalculate the mean and standard deviation. We're just going to ask, well, is that new year, how many standard deviations from the base period mean is it? So that they'll get color coded according to that base period and none of the base period will ever change colors. Um, so that's just a, a way we can go beyond that if we're using this um, statistical method. Um, and I, I, for this section, I think, Chris, that's all I've got. Um, I think we're going to go back to another presenter. Great. Thank you, Brian. Um, and you, Chris, feel free to jump in if I'm misinterpreting sort of the intended flow of the slides. But is this sort of the natural breakpoint between uh, the best practices for stoplight tables and then this non stationary and projections? We're starting to get into the ecosystem indicator based outlooks. Is that correct? I think so. Yes, Will. Um, and um, we, I guess we haven't quite coordinated this, uh, you know, part of the discussion time. Um, Yet so, but but this is definitely a good time for for questions. I think on the stoplight presentations. Great, um, I will definitely look for some hands. But I also have a couple points I can make while we're waiting. A couple points, couple questions. Um, let's see, I guess starting from earliest on, um, and you know, Nate brought up that I might speak a little bit to the reference point versus you know the sort of identifying categories for the escapement in the Central Valley Fall Chinook indicator. Um, and I actually don't feel the need to say a lot about that right now, other than um, we just make people aware. So the Sacramento Fall Chinook conservation objective, which is linked to its uh, SMSY reference point, that is a topic that has been identified for salmon methodology review to be held October 12th and 13th. Um, so if people are interested in sort of literature on that, that may be relevant to evaluating its use in the indicator table, they should um, check out that Simon methodology review meeting. Um, but also, you know, as Nate made the point, um, you know, it's not necessarily the case that what meets the management goal is the same thing that would inform an indicator, especially if it's an indicator of natural production. And so that does sort of bring up, you know, one of the challenges Nate brought up was, you know, we have this sort of increasing divergence between what are the factors that are most affecting natural origin fish and hatchery origin fish are being isolated from some of those. Um, and so I don't have a real answer to how you want to um, deal with that challenge, but I think it partly comes down to a question of what's sort of the intended use of that Central Valley Fall Chinook indicator. Do you want it to be sort of a, um, sanity check or second opinion on the Sacramento River Fall Chinook forecast that's being used to inform management, in which case you probably do want to have it be reflective of both hatchery and natural abundance. Um, but if you want it to be sort of an additional source of information that's tailored to natural origin fish in particular, um, and you know, that was something that was highlighted as something that might be a valuable IEA contribution in our last section of discussion, um, then I think you really do want to focus on what are the factors that are most important to driving um, natural production. And I think when you do that, you have to realize that then you may have a conflict between 
the message that's coming from the natural fall Chinook indicator versus the one or versus the official forecast used in management. I think that's okay as long as you explain it. I see Kristen's hand is up, so I'll go to Kristen and then I have a couple other things I can bring up if nobody else raises their hand. But Kristen, let me stop talking for a bit. I want to talk about stoplight tables. So if you want to go on uh, not stoplight tables, you feel free. Um, no, my other point would be regarding stoplight tables too, so I, go for it. Okay. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I'm trying to figure out to put my hand down. There we go. Uh, thank you. Thank you all, all of you for that um, great presentation. Um, I, um, I just want to think about the stoplight tables and the construction of those, um, particularly what, what Brian was talking about. And just, um, you know, I would, I would say that, uh, you know, statistical, a statistical approach should be preferable to the sort of one third, one third, one third arbitrary ones. And I think you kind of highlighted that already, Brian, um, and totally recognized the challenge associated with, um, you know, the sort of more threshold based ones uh, and things that are you know, more mechanistic um, and the, the heavy lift that's that needs to be done um, in order to, to sort of fill those out. Um, and I guess, you know, I think you made the point uh, totally right on that we have to be careful with correlative uh, correlations breaking down over time, especially, you know, living in an age when um, you know, conditions are changing so quickly. Um, so I guess I would say, you know, one potential pushback on that would be, well, if if the correlations are revisited more frequently, then perhaps um, that sort of allows us to continue to use correlative approaches and that, that don't have as much mechanism um, as at the same time as um, there's investment in sort of better understanding that the mechanistic relationships that may be underlying some, but not all of those correlations. Um, so curious on your thoughts on that. And um, yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the overview. Uh, yeah, Kristen, that's a, a great point. Um, and in fact, as soon as we get back into the presentation of this, we're going to be talking about non-stationarity. And I think there's non-stationarity in ecological processes but certainly what we're describing in terms of how do we deal with it can help when we have a correlative table as well. And so as these correlations shift, uh, even if they're not a mechanistic relationship, if they're shifting and we have tools that can identify that shift in, in those relationships, then a correlative table is still useful. Um, so yeah, um, and so we can, we can talk more about that as, as we go into the next section. Great, thanks. Great, and thank you, Kristen. Um, you very much or almost entirely hit all the points I was going to bring up. Um, so I'll just quickly say, I think, yeah, I, I think that the sort of slide 39 really captures the trade-offs among the different approaches as well. And I think, you know, I would agree with what I think Kristen was saying that, you know, the mechanistic is certainly preferable, but it's recognized, you know, how difficult it can be in a lot of cases. Um, I also would agree that of the other two choices, I would prefer the statistical approach. Um, I wasn't entirely sure why you were saying that it wouldn't be possible to just have a fixed base period for the equal bin sizes. Um, but given that the statistical approach is preferable, I don't think that's really important to worry about. Um, so I will wait a bit for hands, but I think otherwise we can launch into the next session. Oh, one more hand. Let's see who is that. Oli. Yeah, it's me. Um, I actually don't really agree with the statistical approach necessarily because I think it's a little bit touchy about what the distribution looks like. So the thing I do like about the equal bin size is that it works fine with any distribution, right? It's where the statistical thing is functionally shoehorning things towards a normal kind of world um doesn't have to be because you can do transformations and blah 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 but um i do think like one standard deviation down may be very different from one standard deviation up right and so i don't i don't think the statistical one takes out many of the problems of the equal bin size i just think you have to be a little bit careful about how you use either of them and interpret them um so do I feel really strongly about this? No, but I do think 
um, quantiles are not necessarily worse in any fundamental way than like a mean with the standard deviation uh, kind of uh, point. So that would be my only thing. I think it's a little fussy. I think it's really, you know, it's, it's challenging. So, um, but that said, all of this is hard and it's just like, as long as you're clear and have like a good support for why you're doing thing X instead of thing Y, I think either one of them could work just fine. So I'll stop talking. All right, thanks, Oli. And yeah, I see Kristen agreeing with you in the chat. I, I would as well. Um, I mean, as you say, well, you know, perhaps we don't necessarily want to use a normal distribution for everything. Perhaps we don't want to use one standard deviation, but there, there is a level of arbitrary there, arbitrariness there as well. Um, you know, I do like the potential to highlight outliers and, you know, the sort of, um, you know, multiple shades potentially. So if you look at the color coding slide 39, it's, you know, sort of one standard deviation gets kind of light red, two standard deviations gets dark red. So you do get a little bit more information. Um, but I think, you know, your point's very valid. You need to worry about the distributional form. I also see a comment from Eric Ward talking about, do we need to consider, you know, what's the uncertainty in these different indicators? Um, I think that would probably affect our interpretation of how sharply we can draw cutoffs as well. Um, but I think, you know, all those points noted, we can move on into the non-stationarity and projections. Well, there's one more hand up. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Kristen and Will. And yeah, Corey Niles, um, member of the ecosystem work group, but also part of WFW's um, council representation. And I don't know if you're looking for comments on how folks have interpreted these things in the management process at this time or not, but just had a, a brief story about some discussions that happened in our morning meetings this past meeting, but I can I can hold off on those. Yeah, um, do you have a sense if it's quick? I think it would be good to do it now, but otherwise it might be better for sort of public comment if you'll still be around at the end of the day. Yeah, well, I don't know if ecosystem work group is participants in this or not, but um, I heard Kristen speak to advisory bodies, but I, I don't know we're on the same page, but just basically um, short story is we had like one of the, the HMS folks and we have these meetings 7 a.m. every every day of the council's meeting where we talk about what's on the agenda. and. The HMS advisors are skeptical about folks making predictions about the future and, and you know, with the concern that they will be wrong and, and restrictive when they don't need to be. But just uh, there was a lot of, you know, we, we have our other council members are very salmon focused or experienced and, you know, they, they were talking about the reds and greens and, and yellows and yeah, they may be simple, but they were really at least had the perception that they are pretty accurate, at least for the upcoming season on what to expect. So it, it, it was an, I'm not a salmon manager, so I don't see how these are used, but it, I was surprised to see that. Yeah, it was, um, they, they think that these are useful, the reds, greens, and yellows, and 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 predictive about, about what, what's going to happen in the upcoming seasons, but that's the gist of it. Great, thanks, Corey. Yeah, thanks. I'll start it off Let's here yeah, sure. with uh, basically an introduction to non-stationarity and projections. And so what I wanted to focus on first was sort of the definitions here. And so typically we, we talk about non-stationarity in, in situations in which uh, the statistical properties of a time series change over time. So like the mean and variance changing. In the context of the uh, salmon indicators that we want to talk about, there's sort of an additional concern, and that's these uh, when statistical relationships among indicators or with salmon population metrics change over time. And that's mostly the context we're going to be talking about over these next couple slides. And so uh, I think the important piece to sort of think about next is this uh, non stationarity poses challenge for not only indicator selection interpretation, but also use in population projections. And so I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the issue, and then Brian's going to follow it up with tools we can use to address the question and concerns revolving around non-stationarity. Next slide. And so there's lots of ways in which we can get uh, non-stationarity. Some of them are purely methodological, right? Um, 
data can uh, change, the observation methods might change, um, data quality might change. And then we, the, as we pointed out in previous dis, uh, discussion, correlations can fail. Um, but there's good reason to be concerned about non-stationarity in salmon stocks. Uh, and this cartoon on the left here sort of illustrates that about sort of how things have might have trended across the Pacific coast. Historically, we had multiple um, run uh, timings uh, shown by those different colors. And those are, are generally uh, completing life cycle, life stages in, that are associated in different places and times um, with, uh, within their watersheds. And that more recently, uh, there's been sort of this legacy of uh, human impacts. So um, cumulative habitat and other impacts, including changes in, um, in the extent of habitat, but also in harvest levels and, of course, um, in, uh, introduction of hatchery releases. These have tended to uh, cause life history simplification, and that uh, in turn is um, hypothesized at least to increase sensitivity of stocks to single climate events. And that might then sort of lead to these conditions of increasing non-stationarity as climate variable cha variability changes, or if particularly relationships with nonlinear um, uh, time series basically surpass a tipping point. And so we have reason to be expect that um, we should be very concerned about non-stationarity when applied to salmon stocks. Next slide. And so uh, a recent paper that I've worked on with my uh, postdoc Stu Munch, Will Satisway, Nate Mantua examined this uh, over a 170-year time period, uh, and where there's been huge changes in habitat conditions as well as many other conditions in California's Central Valley. We had increased habitat impacts, loss from uh, many hydropower dams, disconnection via dikes in floodplains and simplification. Uh, also hydrologic in alterations as we've used the water for human uses and not thought as much about their uses for a particular life stage of salmon. And uh, on top of all the habitat effects, we have hatchery releases increasing and uh, concentrated and sometimes uh, disconnected uh, from um, the river systems through uh, net pen releases and, there, and other things like that. We also have um, non-native predators on the rise affecting both hatchery and wild populations, and then a long history of harvest intensification over this 107-year time period. So that uh, combined with our understanding of changes in um, the uh, age structure of population led us to expect uh, a change in the sensitivity of these uh, of Central Valley Chinook salmon to climate effects. And so we tested that uh, via running many uh, linear regressions using specific indicators. Next. And so basically what we, our dependent variable here was commercial catch. We looked at um, that, the correlations of, of that with precipitation, which is a proxy for, um, for uh, flow levels and uh, temperature as well. And we, know, we, we found that temp both those correlations have changed over time. So historically winter, uh, that's an error, it should be annual precipitation, uh, has, um, was the strongest correlate of commercial catch. And more recently, spring air temperature was the, had the highest correlation. We also saw sort of uh, following these ideas of um, higher sensitivity resulting from reduced life history variation, that the four-year smooth average historically was the best predictor, and uh, more recently, its annual variation is the, is the best predictor. And so this gets to the point that these populations are more uh, it's susceptible to these slings and arrows in particular years, uh, as opposed to buffered uh, via their age structure um, from, these, from these impacts. So that's that's the Central Valley story. Uh, as a sort of quick check in the data sets that I had available, we turn to the Klamath data set. Next slide. 
So just for one, can I jump in just for one second, Corey? First, I wanted to check. Looks like Corey Niles' hand is still up, um, but I'm assuming that's just left over from his previous comment. He has not yep, responded apologize. to the chat. I apologize. sent him some mail. Well. Oh, great, no problem. Um, uh, second, just for Kristen's record keeping or John DeVore's, um, I failed to notice these couple slides when I talked about which slides I would be recused from. So I guess I'm recused from these last couple slides too, but uh, not a big deal. So let's move on to the climate indicator. Yeah, so we took advantage of uh, 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 the, basically this run reconstruction uh, PF, PFMC uses for the climate to basically come up with a measure of expected production um, from uh, uh, with, with spawner levels. And we use the re, uh, recruitment deviations from these to test uh, the correlations with particular uh, indicators and how those change over time. And so next slide, give, give an example of non-stationarity for several of these indicators. So, this, so basically we ran these 15 year running correlations of these recruitment deviations with the directionalized indicators and recall that uh, a positive correlation uh, between these indicators would mean that the indicators are responding as we expect them to, where, and whereas a negative correlation would be that they're um, not corresponding to our expectations. And as you can see by these, just these two examples, flow, uh, spring flow and spring temperature uh, during out migration, that we've seen quite a substantial change in the relationship between these recruitment uh, deviations and the indicators over time, whereas before they were generally non-predictive or uh, negatively associated, they have now both become strongly positively associated. And this is a pretty important life stage in the context of what we know about what's going on ecologically, with the Klamath run. These are the time period where um, out migrants are exposed to uh, the parasites or Atomyxis shasta, and um, therefore um, these indicators are, are are those which might increase sensitivity to that life stage, and 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 that um, basically that effect may has really strongly changed since the 1990s. And so you can look down the list, uh, um, basically of this. Uh, stationarity for all these indicators and we definitely saw evidence of non-stationarity for flow and temperature variables as well as some of the marine indicators as well and so as you can see just to summarize real quick um, these these uh, non-stationarity relationships are obviously problematic for indicator selection we might choose key indicators or not, might not choose indicators if salmon are monitored during an unresponsive time period, or we might drop indicators if the overall correlation with salmon metrics um, is zero, but dynamic, as is in the case for those um, flow and temperature. There's also interpretation of indicators. For example, if the direction of the correlation changes, are these indicators now indicating good or poor conditions? And finally, uh, use and projection. Basically, we need uh, smart ways to incorporate indicators in projections that are robust to these non-stationarity relationships. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brian to explain some of those approaches. Thanks, Corey. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna go through, uh, I'm not gonna get into too much detail, but just to uh, touch the surface of a couple of tools that can incorporate or accommodate this non-stationarity in, in our data. Um, so uh, th this is basically just a standard regression model where we might say look at uh, logit transformation of survival data, and that and model that as some linear function of um, so x beta one and x here might be the effect of some environmental covariates. A lot of common models for salmon survival uh, use sibling regression, and so that's the number of jacks in one year is highly correlated to the number of adults returning. The following year, and so that would be the beta two um, uh, times the number of jacks uh, plus some error. So that's just the standard regression model, and there's pretty simple adjustments that we can make to this to account for non-stationarity. Uh, next slide. Um, so one that I use is called dynamic linear model. Um, it, it's it's in the literature several times now, and um, I think fairly common. And the idea here is that those regression coefficients, beta one and beta two, rather than being a constant, 
estimated as some constant value across the entire time series, we can allow them to evolve over time. And so that could be as a function of like an autoregressive function. And so what starts high or low can evolve to be um, something different later in the time series. Um, next slide. And another option is uh, autocorrelated error model. Um, this is something that uh, Michael O'Farrell and others have used. Um, and so, so all of these are tools that exist and are, are currently being used. Um, in this model structure, the beta, beta um, values are constant over the time series, but the errors are um, um, autocorrelated through time. Um, so you can use an autocorrelation function or a moving average. Um, but either way, it allows for changes in, um, in the dynamics over time. So if we're overestimating um, returns this year, chances are we're going to do it next year because of the, the autocorrelation in, in our time series. Um, so I'm going to give just a couple of examples of the DLM, the dynamic linear model, um, and what that looks like, and then um, just talk briefly about um, using that the, these tools in a in a forecasting sense. Uh, next slide. So um, in addition to uh, ecological, well, I, I, one example that um, I guess is common, you know, a, a lot of people use these sibling regression models. And one of the reasons they're so common is because of this correlation shown here, where the jacks, the number of jacks returning in one year on the x-axis is really correlated to the number of adults returning the following year. Um, these data are from um, uh, the Columbia River Base, uh, Columbia Basin Research website, and they're for Snake River, Spring, Summer, Chinook, um, returning to the Columbia River, uh, to Bonneville Dam. And so you can see there's a strong correlation. You know, if we, if we know count the jacks one year, we, we have a good estimate of adults the next year. Uh, but there is some variability in this relationship. And uh, next slide, Chris. It turns out that there's often structure in that variability. So if, if we just color code those same data according to whether they're before or after 2006, you can see that the slope of this relationship has shifted over time. And uh, if, we're, if we don't acknowledge that, if our tools don't accommodate that, then we're gonna assume a constant slope for the entire time series. And that's the value we would be using in a forecasting model. And really, um, as you can see here, in recent times, uh, the slope of this relationship is different than the, the mean of that slope across the entire time series. So our forecasts become more um, accurate when we account for this uh, non-stationarity. Uh, next slide. So, um, sorry, these were put together recently, and I, I didn't have time to increase the font size. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through these. I'm gonna show a couple of these, and th these are just examples of what the model output looks like. Um, so, the the top uh, um, line here is the response variable. In this case, it is the logit transformed um, SAR data for Upper Columbia River Spring Chinook salmon, um, and uh, the, the green and red are just the coefficient estimates for a linear regression model. So the, the intercept and some you know, beta value for an environmental covariate. In a, in a standard regression model, there's only one estimate for those parameters. And it doesn't matter what year you're predicting or forecasting, you're gonna use that one value. That's all you have. Um, next slide. But if we apply a dynamic linear model, for example, um, that can account for non-stationarity, then the value of the coefficient evolves over time. And you can see in this example, uh, earlier in the time series, there was strong support for this negative uh, impact of this particular environmental covariate. I'm not actually sure what it is, but it doesn't matter. It's just an example. Um, but that evolved over time. And, and later in the time series, there's actually very little support for this particular covariate to be informative in our model. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, and so, you know, when when we're forecasting from a tool from these tools, um, it's better to use our most recent estimate of the relationship rather than the long term mean. Um, and so, we're gonna we're gonna get a, a, a more accurate forecast um, by using the recent value of these of these um, parameter estimates. Uh, next slide. I'm gonna show one more example. This is um, these are 
two versions of a sibling regression model where we have both the jack count uh, estimating the impact of a jack value and uh, an environmental covariate. And the reason I'm showing this example is um, just like assembling a stoplight chart, there are a lot of decisions to make and they, they uh, impact your conclusions. And so um, the, the model on the left, I allowed the environmental covariate coefficient to evolve over time. And you can see in the orange uh, line that it does. I did not allow the coefficient for the jack count to vary over time. I could have, I could have even allowed the intercept to vary over time, um, but I, cho I chose the environmental covariate. And the, on the model on the right, I fixed the environmental covariate coefficient to be a constant over time, but I allowed the jack count coefficient to vary. And so in addition to you know, improving our model fit, improving our predictions, uh, the, the model performance in terms, in terms of predictive value, um, we can also learn about the data um, by, by evaluating these different um, choices about how to, how to assemble the model. Um, we can learn it, like uh, information about some of the dynamics that are occurring in, in the data set. Um, so I'm going to move uh, a little bit from, you know, the, the, me the mechanics so, of what these, yeah. Quickly, Sorry. Brian, yeah, before you move to the next uh, point, I see Dan Holland has his hand up. Yeah, um, it may be that you want to answer this question later, but um, I'm not sure if this is the right time or not, but I'm just curious, how do you distinguish between non-stationarity versus just a, um, a uh, something that, you know, has a, a a longer amplitude kind of in in terms of its variation. So, um, you know, you don't have super long time series here. So, you know, regime shifts might look like non-stationarity or something. Um, yeah, I, that's difficult to answer, Dan. Um, but um, I've run a bunch of these models and it really it really seems to pull out um, you know what? What you don't, what these models won't do, is estimate a parameter for each year that bounces all over the place. There, there's an autocorrelation function, and so what it's really good at is is pulling out um, gradual shifts over time. And um, I, I've seen examples where you know, in these the examples I'm shown here, uh, there was a strong correlation early and less so later. Um, but I have seen the opposite. Um, and I've, I've even seen things like what Corey showed where, um, you know, there are periods where something is negatively correlated early and positive, positively correlated late. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm answering your, your question, but they're, they're flexible without being too flexible. And, um, but certainly a, a lot of evaluation and, um, you know, rather than, this is a point I don't have a slide for, but rather than just looking at model fit when you're using these tools, looking at predictive ability of the tools is really important. Um, and so I, I think that helps, uh, it helps get at the issue that you're talking about, Dan. Yeah, okay. I guess, I guess my point is that if you had something that was kind of um, seen to have a correlation early, but not late or late, but not early, you know, that, um, and so you say you want to use the more recent one, um, but if it was, in, in fact, just sort of that this correlation holds up is more important during this particular regime, um, you know, of the PDO, let's say, um, and not so much during another one, and then you say, okay, we're going to use that to predict, but then, but then that, it, you know, could switch back to the way it was. Yeah, yeah. So the only time I, I think what you bring up is the only time this wouldn't work well is if there was a really sharp regime shift from one year to the next. And we haven't uh, collected data um, that would allow this model to recognize that yet. Um, so, so maybe during a regime shift, uh, these models may not be, uh, um, may, per may perform less well, uh, but that would also be, the, be true, certainly be true for uh, any, any regression model. Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, if there's no other questions, I, I was just going to shift a little bit um, to when we, as we're using these tools in a in a forecasting sense, um, 
it's really important to think about the response for like, as you're seeing here, the relationship between any environmental covariate and the response can change. That depends on what, which environmental covariate you're using. And it also depends on the response variable you're interested in. And so um, thinking about doing a lot of a priori work is really important. And um, next, next slide, Chris. The um, the fact is, if um, a, a applying one stoplight chart to a bunch of stocks is is really not going to work very well, um, and so what this what I'm just going to make quickly make the point here that each of these stocks um, interact with the marine environment very differently. So on the left are some spatial maps of some of our um, juvenile salmon catches for Snake River Spring Chinook and on the left and Snake River Subyearling Fall Chinook on the right. As you know, they, they have very different migration timing, but they go to very different places in the ocean at different times. And their, so their experiences and their interaction with the environment is completely different. And um, so as we're not only putting these stoplight charts together, but as we're using them, uh, we need to be thinking about stock specific decisions. Um, next slide. And so I, I'm not going to um, go into how I've created this. <laughs> That's a whole nother talk. But I have created some stock specific stoplight charts um, it, it, through a very statistical approach. So I, I, this is one of the reasons I didn't include much of it here is that I'm a little dissatisfied with it because I just earlier today said we need to have we need to strive to to make decisions with a mechanism in mind. And me just playing around with some statistical approaches um, violated that that goal. So, <laughs> but um, it's an example of where we do have some stock specific stoplight charts. Um, there's a, a bunch of it's a very correlative approach, but they exist. And once we have these, then we can use them in in um, forecasting in, in in the models that it, the. DLM oh, and progressive area enough. structure models um, to make forecasts. Next slide. And so again, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, um, but some of the decisions that you have to make uh, when you're doing this is: um, Do you use a a condensed version of the stoplight chart, like the um, DFA that Melissa mentioned, or the average that Corey mentioned, or do you use individual indicators? Um, and if if we're using individual indicators and we have a whole bunch of competing models, do we select the best one? Do we show them all? Do we do some model averaging? Um, so there's a lot of uh, decisions, and some of those decisions uh, should be informed by uh, whether it's a correlative or a mechanistic model and how similar some of those top models are. Um, and, and, and the error in their forecasts. Um, so again, um, I, I know this may seem dissatisfying, but there's a lot of decisions and this is not an easy task. Um, and so it, it takes time, thought, and, um, and, a, and a lot of discussion. Um, next slide. So we, I know we threw a lot of things out at you, and so this is just my attempt at summarizing some of all these decisions we have to make. So the stoplights, uh, obviously, we want to try and get more more mechanistic, although that's often difficult. Um, we want to have less cross correlation among those indicators. Um, I, I just briefly mentioned the indicator selection method earlier, where you know we could use something like AIC that looks at model fit or um, the mean absolute error or something of, of predictive ability. Uh, if we're if we're looking at um, qualitative use of the stoplight chart, there's issues around how do we color code those um, values? Should we use a base period to set the mean and standard deviation? Once we start forecasting, um, there's model choice, dynamic linear models, autocorrelated models. Eric Ward could probably throw out like five more options that are available. And what do we do with the forecast? Should we just choose one model? Should we model average? And then where I think I think uh, most of this dis the remaining discussion will probably um, focus is how do we then use that? 
information, those forecasts. Um, I, I would strongly support that um, the stock specific stoplight charts, stock specific models and, and thinking is really warranted. Um, and then I think one of the biggest questions is, you know, what are the decisions that we're trying to inform and what, what types of information are the our manager, the people making those decisions, what types of information do they need or want? And, um, and how we assemble and how we make these decisions could be driven in part by what it is um, they're looking for. And I will stop there. Great. And so just to clarify, is there an intent to continue through the slides or is this sort of the slide to stop and discuss? Well, I could jump in there for a second. So uh, I've put together the next step slides that round out the talk. Um, I get looking at the clock. I think it makes a lot of sense to really abbreviate that and let SSCES members uh, have a chance to ask questions. Um, I can do that abbreviated, uh, you know, blast through the end right now, or I could hold off. But what's your preference? Yeah, and I think unless somebody raises their hand very soon, let's blast through the end and then circle back for questions. But if people have very specific questions on that summary decisions to make slide, otherwise I think I think that's a great slide to circle back to. But let's let's finish it off and then do the broader discussion. Okay. Um, okay. So my blast through. Um, I'll keep this very simple. Uh, I see lots of potential next steps here. Uh, I think, uh, and you can see in the slides that follow, if you care to look, uh, I would love to convene some kind of workshop in uh, 2023 with IEA members, uh, people participating on this call uh, from different advisory bodies and just flesh out what, um, what things we would like to really tackle to help support driving this further. We have lots of options. We should scope it and um, and think about what our de desired deliverables are. Uh, clearly, I am have talked about it a lot. I think that we have a great opportunity to align this with uh, FEP Initiative 2.1. I think a lot of the points that Brian ended on to my reading of 2.1 are they're in the DNA of that initiative. And, um, and I would love to see us be able to work toward a point where from the risk tables that uh, are proposed in 2.1 that were developed by Martin Dorn and Stephanie Zador, that we would be aiming toward helping to fill out this ecosystem column of one of those decision tables um, that takes information from across the spectrum of inf information sources and supports management uh, decision making uh, with that. And we wouldn't just be contributing to this one, but some of our indicators likely would fall into some of those other columns too. Then finally, there are a lot of other efforts underway um, in, uh, in relation to indicator development, uh, uh, quantifying non-stationarity and so forth. And we would, uh, of course, be as attentive as possible to those so that our efforts are complementary and not duplicative. And, well, that's really all I want to say. Um, if we want to go back here, uh, unless there's any questions about any of that, um, I turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And we don't necessarily, I mean, I, certainly we don't need to tire our discussion to this slide in particular. Um, so I think, you know, if people have points or questions they want to raise about, you know, essentially anything that we just covered in this last session, I think this would be a great time. Um, again, as I wait for hands to appear, I can babble about a few things that occurred to me. Um, Sort of earlier on, um, so I, I think it's great that people are thinking about non-stationarity. Um, I mean, Brian brought up a lot of the sort of tricky issues and how you really try to deal with it in a quantitative sense. I was wondering a little bit in terms of the non-stationarity analysis for the Klamath River Fall Chinook stock recruit relationship is, so you're looking at non-stationarity in relationships between the various indices and the residuals from the stock recruit relationship. Um, but what happens if, you know, the third of the effect of spawner number itself is changing through time as a function of things that aren't, that aren't included in your set of indicators? And, you know, for example, purely hypothetically, suppose there was suddenly a lot more spawning habitat available after a dam was removed. Um, 
how how would that factor into using the stock recruit residuals as your sort of measure of whether relationships with other factors are non-stationary? Yeah, so uh, Will, that's a really great question and something I've been puzzling over too. I mean, there's definitely been approaches to look at the stock recruit relationship dynamic as well. And so that's a conceivable way to sort of broaden out this uh, analysis where you're in, uh, incorporating that dynamic relationship between um, between stocks and recruits and um, and there you could also integrate individual indicators into those to look at the relative change of the coefficients over those time periods. Uh, that's my initial response there, but there's probably many other ways you could deal with it. Great, thanks, Corey. And see, I'm still waiting to see any other hands. So I guess on the summary of decisions to make slide, I don't have a lot or really any solutions to offer other than I would just say, I am really glad to see that people are thinking about these questions. because I think they are um, tricky, but important things to tackle. Um, Again, as we continue waiting for hands, one potential idea to think about in terms of the applications to management decisions, um, you know, and uh, Chris brought up the idea of risk tables and how you know the IEA type analysis might inform risk tables. Um, hot off the presses, I did just have a paper in press that looks at whether we might be able to apply a, an approach to salmon forecasts somewhat similar to how the council uses P star and Sigma for uh, ground fish and coastal pelagic species. Now, obviously that has not actually been adopted. It may well never be adopted, but it was interesting. One of the reviewers of that paper did suggest, well, hey, couldn't you use a risk table type approach and specifically said, hey, and you should cite this Dorn and Zador paper. Like, could that choose, could that inform the choice of a precautionary buffer that would be applied to forecasts if there was, you know, the risk table said things were bad? Um, so, you know, that might be one way that these um, sorts of results might inform management, although, you know, how that would really work from a management perspective, um, you know, that's more of a policy question than a science question, so I'm not going to try to get into it. And yeah, thankfully, someone is raising their hand. Uh, Oli's raising his hand, so we'll hear from Oli instead of me. Yeah, I was trying to give Will a break. Um, I actually sort of had a bigger picture question comment. Um, on this, there's this summary of decisions to make um, that was just a second ago. Yeah, so um, I think there's sort of a bigger division of this set of decisions is like, what are we trying to get into the ecosystem status report, right? And so what do we think about these salmon indicators in terms of how to interpret them from the council perspective, right? And so one way is like, hey, how does this year qualitatively relate to previous years? And that's functionally what the stoplight stuff is doing. It's like, it's good or it's bad relative to the past or relative to some particular benchmarks, right? Um, the forecasting model stuff is all about making that more quantitative. Um, and so it strikes me as like the stoplight stuff is like firmly in the lane of the ESR. Um, when you get into these forecasting things, it's great research. It's interesting, but it sort of needs to be lined up really carefully with what's going on in the salmon world and what the managers and whoever are doing natural forecasts for management. Um, it sort of needs to be tied really care tight, tightly to those folks. And so you don't end up with multiple things for, or multiple forecasts for the same thing and some sort of confusion amongst the council community or uh, irritation amongst different um, committee groups uh, or subcommittees. So um, I guess I would, my question here is, that's my general comment. The question is, uh, is there a plan in place or have thought been put forward uh, towards trying to figure out how to sort of move from the summary sort of stoplight stuff, qualitative, you know, gestalt for what's going on to linking with these other groups and sort of working it into the council forecast? Because I see the forecasting stuff is very much in the wide world of research and not quite 
in the council world yet, and, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Oli, do you mind me just checking to make sure I understand who you're directing your question at? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, check in. Uh, my, my question is sort of a little bit to uh, the presenters and to you and a little bit to the SSC is like, you know, it's partly the SSC to other SSC folks. Should we be dipping into this quantitative forecasting thing in the context of the ecosystem status um, or not? And is there a different opinion amongst the IEA crew uh, for that, for an answer to that question? So I'm just sort of, it's a little bit vague. I apologies for not having a specific target to my question, but um, that's sort of, it's a big question on my mind. And I thought maybe there might be some general opinions about it. Brian, go ahead. Um, dive in there. Um, Kristen had her hand up too. I don't know if that was about this question. No, it's about something else. Go ahead. I'll put mine down and put it back up in a minute. Okay. Um, I, Oli, I, I'm not the, the one to answer that question, but it did make me think of one thing, which is um, uh, the, there's multiple reasons to run a forecasting model or to model the data. Um, and so one of them would be to forecast next year. Um, but as I showed here, another one is to estimate the non-stationarity. And one thing I've been thinking about for a decade is, um, you know, a lot of times when you condense a stoplight chart into some summary metric, uh, you're you're making assumptions about which uh, about the um, importance, uh, the relative importance of, of the indicators in that chart, um, and the relative and if there's non-stationarity the relative importance or in, in information in each of those things can also shift over time and so maybe there's a role for these models not for forecasting next year but for estimating the shifting relative importance of the, the indicators in a, in a chart if, uh, i don't know does that make sense yeah that seems totally reasonable And Ole, I'll take a quick crack at your question too. Um, so the way I look at the the way the kind of the moving the pieces around the board, uh, if we were to continue to present stoplight tables in our ecosystem status report to the council, um, I would certainly want to make sure that uh, those that we didn't come across as you know either presenting something that they didn't really feel some assurance from groups like the SSC had some quantitative, uh, you know, underpinning to it, uh, or that we might come across as saying, hey, the sky's falling because there's a bunch of red on this. Uh, and lo and behold, if you actually ran it through some kind of quantitative procedure, you'd find that that red didn't matter as much as some of the yellow did. Um, so I, I see them as all being connected together. But in the long run, these models, if they are, if we are going to take up um, initiative 2.1 in a way that ultimately does support, um, say, uh, quota setting or decision making, however you want to phrase that, um, I would imagine at some point we're going to have to, or we're going to want to uh, do a lot of coordination among advisory bodies as well as hear from the uh, folks in the Alaska Center and the North Pacific Council of how they've taken this process operationalized it and uh, where they've run up against, you know, success as well as, uh, you know, trouble. Um, that's probably very simplified view of the playing field, but that's kind of how I see it. But the, the, the opinions of the SSC obviously matter an awful lot here um, as, as the kind of gatekeepers of, uh, of the, the methodology that underpins all this. Yeah, great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I see several hands. First, Brian, is your hand up for something new, or is that a response that's already been made? Yep, great, thanks. So let's go Kristen and then Dan. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, voice support for Brian's last comment, and that was what I had originally raised my hand to um, talk about was just the potential for these uh, dynamic, like the dynamic linear models to inform sort of the need to revisit the correlations in those stoplight charts. And so I, I'm just trying to think through whether, and it sounds like there is a way that this could sort of be semi-automated so that the um, 
you know, stoplight charts, you could, could be re revisited and what's present or not present in those stoplight charts could be revisited based on um, results from some of these uh, dynamic linear models. Um, whether that could be done on sort of a larger scale or not, I'm not sure, but it seems, um, yeah, that seems like a, a useful um, way to think about them. Um, and then I guess just to this larger conversation that Oli started, um, which I think is really good, um, and bringing it back to some of the management decisions, uh, sub bullets there, um, Brian recommended stock specific um, looks at some of these uh, stoplight charts. And um, I think that I would just suggest that, and I think Chris has already sort of alluded to this, um, working closely with the end users of those stoplight charts to develop them, I think is gonna make those products um, as useful as possible. So, you know, whether it's the, whether it's the colors, or quantitative measures and how exactly um, the colors map onto uh, the the meaning of the indicators. Um, it's gonna it, it's going to be important that 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 is very clear and that those are sort of tailored to the the uh, advisory bodies that might be using them in the context of this um, sort of. Uh, I'm thinking about the uh, fishery, the FEP initiative in particular, and and the development of that. That was a little bit rambling. Sorry. No, that was great. Thanks, Kristen. I see Dan Holland also has his hand up. Yeah, um, yeah. I just wanted to make the point um, again that I think um, in terms of these uh, forecasting models, you know, sort of weighting the more recent relationship or the more recent data or something is. Um, I mean, it does sort of make sense if you're making kind of short term forecasts that the relationship that holds, net, you know, more recently is probably going to continue to hold. But for sort of longer term, I think there's a risk there of overfitting the data and interpreting something that might be, you know, a structural change um, or regime shift, uh, structural break or something like that. And that could reverse itself or change again um, in some other weird way. Um, I think th there's a risk there of, of just sort of overfitting by um, by you know looking more at the at the recent relationship and and I mean we all know that these these environmental relationships um, that seem strong come and go but um, that doesn't necessarily mean that using the most recent relationship is gonna is is the best way to go. Dan, if I, I could just um, come in on that, I, it's a really good point. I think it, it really highlights why in the, the first step of even putting the chart together, um, we really want to focus as much as we can towards um, mechanistic indicators, uh, because those are the ones that in the long term uh, are going to be the most stable. Thanks, Brian. And thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so we're coming pretty close to our allotted time. I want to make sure, you know, that if anybody else has anything they need to ask or comment on, they do that. I also wanted to check in with Cameron on whether he has what he needs for his statement. And for that matter, I should have checked with Oli if he had what he needed for his part. Um, but then one other thing I'm wondering if we need to comment on any further before we wrap this item up is going back a couple of slides. There was Chris posing the idea of this virtual workshop in 2023. I don't know if that's something we as the subcommittee meeting need to comment on now. Um, but I, don't know, I guess I will, well, I will wrap up this item and hand it back to Kristen and let Kristen decide what we want to do in terms of discussing the idea of a workshop. Um, yeah, so maybe Chris, you could just tell us like what your intent was there, because I think we didn't give you a lot of time to um, do that. Uh, no, that's that's quite all right. Uh, thanks, Kristen. So I think really what my intent here is, uh, you know, it's, it's not too complicated. Um, uh, I'm just hoping that uh, 
if people feel like there's sufficient momentum and uh, for this, uh, both for just the purposes of the ESR as well as maybe uh, starting to get um, some focus on 2.1 if there's going to be a salmon pilot um, case in that, um, that, um, you know, in the interest of continuing, if this today's meeting was the start of a conversation that I think a multi-day workshop uh, would be a valuable way to keep it going. Um, I've listed some some potential topics here that could be covered in plenary and breakout. It's it's too many, of course, but if the basically if the SSC has recommendations about or the STT or SAS has uh, recommendations about which ones feel like we're going to get the most mileage out of topics A, B, and C, or maybe just A, <laughs> um, I, that would be terrific feedback uh, before we do put all the effort into a workshop in a bandwidth limited era and uh, and then come up with something that people actually thought wouldn't have been as useful as something else. So I suppose that's really it that um, the examples I have here need, is not exhaustive and it, it needn't even be uh, the ones that ultimately might end up being chosen, but, um, but it feels like it's a, a good uh, opportunity. That's really it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so I guess I would suggest then that, um, you know, in our subcommittee report, at least, it sounds like um, this would be a, a, this could be a workshop that was, well, it might be led by somebody, not the SSC, but that SSC members could participate in um, potentially. So I don't think we, I think we could probably characterize that as such. And um, I don't personally have any um, uh, feedback on these particular topics right now. Um, so that, and we might just outline that these are sort of the topics that are potentially on the table. Um, and that suggests that the CCIA team work with the, um, the relevant advisory bodies on sort of further scoping the workshop and that we, um, as SSC members could participate if, if the council would like us to, does that seem reasonable? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, I think we had a great uh, first half today on the on the salmon uh, indicators, and um, I'm gonna we're gonna take our lunch break now, and then we will pick up at one o'clock with the climate change appendix. Um, and yeah, everybody have a good break and thank you so much to the presenters, uh, this morning, uh, for the, for the great presentations and everyone that participated in the discussion, our repertoires and, uh, Will for helping me lead. Thanks. It is, great. Thank you. It is recording. Um, okay, welcome back everyone. It is uh, my pleasure to now be moving us to uh, the second half of our meeting today on the uh, climate change appendix to the ecosystem status report. Um, and I sort of set this up at the beginning, but um, I'll just restate now that uh, the climate change appendix was new to the ESR last year. It was um, added at the um, request of the ecosystem advisory sub panel, I believe. Uh, and so uh, it's it's a new part of the report. Uh, again, sort of like the last topic, this is really the start of probably a multi-part discussion on the development of this part of the ecosystem status report. Um, and so there is, there will be, you know, an SSC, um, yes, sort of more traditional focus on um, the on um, some technical review of, of what's in the um what's in the existing appendix uh from last year uh and also we'll be just doing some discussion about um terminology and potential tools um that can be brought to bear on this climate change question um and what's sort of try to help the ccia team um take some next steps with uh providing some guidance um, for what is most likely to be useful uh, for next steps for engaging with other advisory bodies. And so um, with that, I will hand it over to our uh, speakers for this section. And so 
uh, Andrew Lysing from the Southwest Fishery Science Center is going to lead us through the first section. Um, and then we also have uh, sections that are going to be presented by Desiree Tomasi, also from the Southwest Fishery Science Center, and um, Carmen Norman from the Northwest Fishery Science Center. And so I think we're ready. I'll just check that we have our first uh, repertoire. John Field is going to is going to be taking notes on this first section. John, are you ready to go? Yep, I'm here. Ready to go. Great. Okay. I'll hand it over to you, Andrew. All right. Great. Hi, everybody. Hi, John. Nice to hear your voice. I'd like to write more of this. Then share my screen. All right, just checking. Can somebody verbally confirm that uh, they're seeing a slide? We're yep. seeing it. Looks good. Okay, fantastic. Okay, um, so uh, I threw this graph on here just to have a nice opener, uh, just to point out. Yes, we know uh, climate change is happening, and it's mostly due to uh, increased warming, and that's confirmed by a multitude of models and reanalyses and data and observations and. The IPCC and pretty much everyone. Um, so just threw that out there. Uh, I want to start by just though really thanking um, this fairly large team, a fairly large subset of the people that work on the on the California Current IEA that uh, we've been meeting for gosh almost two months now, uh, every other week, to try to put together our ideas on what a ESR climate change appendix might look like. Um, so this is going to be a pretty broad brush overview. Um, and as uh, Kristen said, what we're really looking for is some guidance at this point, because there's, it seems like there's so many ways we could go with this. And before we uh, jump down any particular uh, rabbit hole and spend our time there, we'd love to get some more uh, feedback. Uh, and I'll be doing a bunch of speaking, but we're going to have um, Desiree and Karma uh, chime in at various points where they're really the experts on, on those sections. So. Let me just get right into it. Um, so just to give you an, uh, an outline, it's a little bit different, I think, possibly from what the agenda said, but it's it's pretty close. I'll be giving some introductory statements, uh, and then Desiree will take over to give some um, really much more detail about what's happening. Um, then I will it'll go back to me. I'll be talking about some of the physical and um, biological indices. Uh, then I'll have a section where I'm talking about some of the larger scale indices, and uh, Karma will chime in on the human uh, social indices. And then we'll have a uh, discussion. And I know there's a scheduled break, so possibly if things work out right, we we may or may not finish all of this before the break, or it's possible we could get through most of four uh, before that break and then come back after the the brief break to to hit on the summary and have some discussion. Um, so just to kick this off, I guess the question is: Oh, yes, sure. before you keep going, um, let me just check in since uh, to make sure that I I understand your last slide. Can you go back for one second? Oh, sure. This slide, okay. Yeah, yeah I just want to make sure we have a change in repertoire too that ha that happens between the physical oh, nice. the between number two and number three. So okay. as long as I, we make sure to take a pause, so we can. Um, make sure that we have our note takers in line right there. That would be great. Well, oh, okay, oh, great. And hopefully it should be pretty obvious when we go between the sections. I think I have all the sections always labeled with the one, two, three, or four, five. So perfect. Hopefully be consistent. Okay. And we'll good? do the same thing that we did this morning. And so we'll let you um, go through these sort of chunks and we'll pause um, okay. you know between uh, between two and three for questions and uh, and a little bit of discussion and then um, continue on after that. And so right. and it, uh, yeah. if anyone has questions along the way, uh, just like if they're very specific clarifying questions, put your hand up and I'll call on you, um, but save discussion uh, for the, the sort of more discussion focused time later. Yes, and I, and I can't, I, someone has to yell out if there's a question because I can't see anything other than the the actual slides. <laughs> the way I'm doing yep, it, so. I will moderate that for you. Great, thank you, awesome. Okay, so let's move on. So. Uh, so how do we get to this point of even creating this thing? Um, I think a big part of it was this response to this, to what happened in uh, 2021 here, this agenda item. Um, so you don't need to read this whole paragraph here, but it's more, I think what we're on is this sort of first part where it, we're talking about it could prove helpful to evaluate what indicators in the current report um, are there and are they sufficient or do we have other ones that we could bring to bear to look at climate change? Uh, and then I think, that's where we're at now and possibly later on um, over the next year or so we'll we'll delve into the second part, which is 
um, looking at uh, indices that might be more managerial uh, indicators. Um, but for now, we're on this for sort of first part. Uh, and sort of prepare for where we are now, we um, did create an initial climate change appendix. It was fairly short and it had some of the same material you'll see today. So hopefully this will give you a chance to ask some questions about what we presented there. Uh, and then we'll have support uh, concrete examples to show you as well. Um, but I would just refer back to that original um, appendix that we created. It's, it's, it's pretty short and quick. Um, so just, just again, overview of what we're hoping to get out today. We're going to describe some of the basic aspects of what climate predictions and projections are, and hopefully you'll come kind of, if you're not up to speed on that, learn some examples of what those two different things are. Uh, and then we want to introduce sort of our idea that we've come up with on how we could have an actual climate change appendix and what that might look like. But again, we're very open to discussion as to how that would that would evolve. Uh, and then, of course, we'd like to start the dialogue and make this an iterative uh, process on what we can create what's realistic for us to produce what the council might be looking for. Um, so next thing after this will be an introduction. This will be Desiree talking about um, forecasts and what are the terms prediction versus projection, looking at skill assessment and looking at uncertainty. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go right to Desiree. So Desiree, feel free to take over and I will, uh, I will advance the slides when you give me the next signal. Thank you, Handy. Can everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right, great. So we decided to start off with this figure just to highlight forecast case. So because some of the discussion that we have in terms of what could go into the appendix was uh, uh, are we interested in uh, short-term forecast, seasonal forecast, or maybe just the, the climate change projections? And then keeping in mind that uh, these different types of forecasts would have to be updated uh, with differing regularities. And, uh, and also, um, this picture tries to relay our different products that might be uh, useful to different types of decisions. So if we're interested in uh, how our conditions going to change so that we can better prepare for them, well, then we are interested in climate change product projections and uh, we are thinking about more strategic decisions. However, at the same time, forecast that the weather to seasonal to multi-annual scale might be uh, relevant to the development of tools that might be used in uh, tactical management to better prepare us for the upcoming change. And so today, I just want to make sure that we uh, have a common sort of understanding of the terminology and the difference between predictions and projections, and also of how the skill and uh, of uh, these different types of forecast can be assessed. Next slide. And before I even jump into the definition of projections versus predictions, I wanted to provide an overview of uh, what a nine cast and what a reanalysis is. So now we're not even thinking about uh, forecast, but we're thinking about the historical period. So a hind cast is a historical ocean simulation that is forced by boundary conditions that are informed by observations. So if we take a regional oceanographic uh, ocean models like the UCSC one that I'm highlighting here on, on the right, it does not have an atmospheric component. It's just an ocean model. And so what one can do is to take uh, conditions in terms of uh, wind or our temperature from observations or from an atmospheric reanalysis and then force that ocean model with that uh, to create a, a hindcast, which is a reconstruction of historical conditions. And uh, uh, the fidelity to the actual observed ocean conditions should be uh, relatively good because it is forced by um, observations at the boundary. And then we have a reanalysis, which is like a hindcast, but it also simulates ocean observations. And this further improves the fidelity of the model to, to nature. And uh, UCSC uh, provides both hindcast and, uh, and reanalysis, and there is a link to their website there. And in terms 
abuses, this, uh, this information is really key to that developing forecasting and, and projection, forecasting capabilities and projections, because if we are going to project a model forward, the first step would be you know, uh, evaluating that model. Can it actually reproduce the historical, historical conditions? And uh, this uh, historical data is also key to develop ecological models, and it might useful might be useful as an index in and of itself to track uh, how things change uh, over time, as we will see later. Next slide. And so now we talk about the difference between prediction versus projection. So actually in the climate science side of thing, we would think of prediction as synonymous with, for with forecasts, and that's quite different than a projection. So if we think about a global climate model, those models are sort of the same models that are used to produce global climate prediction as well as global climate projection. And you see that in the middle. The big difference is that when you do a climate prediction, you're actually using what, what are called a, a global climate prediction system. And uh, in addition to the global model, you have a data simulation system that integrates observation from satellites, Argo, weather station, uh, because it's really important to initialize the model to what uh, the observed uh, 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 climate conditions are. And that is because knowing what uh, the climate state is today, it ac actually provides you with most of the information to figure out what or assess what the average temperature might be next month. It's really important to know if there is an El Nino happening now, if you want to forecast what the temperature will be a few months from now. And that is the same for sort of weather forecast scales as well. And so we call these initial value problems because you're really constraining the evolution of your forecast model uh, by the observation that you initialize your model with. Whereas climate projections are, uh, in climate projection, you're really interested in assessing what the effect of the of the forcing, so the external forcing, and so these are, for instance, green, greenhouse gases, and so you're not really interested in what the initial conditions are, but the effect of those external forcing on how the climate will evolve. And by climate, we usually the World Meteorological Organization defines climate at a, as a period as a thirty year period. So you can also think that. Uh, it's the average statistics of climate over a, a long period of time, generally 30 years or so. And so when uh, uh, climate uh, well, centers like GFDL, for instance, produce the project projections, what they do is run a very long industrial control run for you know, thousands of years with the same external forcing just being repeated over time. And then from that, they produce an historical run, which is forced by observed external forcing like greenhouse gas concentrations. And then finally, you do a projection. And in that projection, you use uh, uh, scenarios for future forcing. And so those are the different RCP scenarios, for instance. And because it is so dependent in what the external forcing are, we call that a boundary value problem. And uh, because of this key difference, when you're looking at an historical run from uh, you know, a global climate model projection, you cannot expect uh, that the 92, 93 El Nino is going to uh, happen in 92, 93, because you're not starting off from some observed initial condition. And uh, however, you, you do want to expect that the statistics of El Nino across that historical period are going to be close to those uh, uh, in observations. And then in the middle, you have decadal prediction. And the skill of a decadal prediction really depends on the two things. It's important to initialize your model, but at that time scale, the external forcing is also going to be important to consider. So next slide. And because of the difference between predictions and projections, then you can ass you need to assess uh, the skill and uh, you know define confidence in your forecast in different ways. So for climate prediction, you can actually these are dynamical models, so you can actually recreate uh, forecast over the historical period. So these are called retrospective forecasts. So you can go back to 1982 
initialize your model at the January 1st of 1982, and then you let the model run freely. That is the any observations after that to produce your forecast. And then you compare that forecast to actual observations. And so you can test how well past condition could have been predicted. And so you can actually have a quantitative scale assessment and we'll see an example of that later. With climate projections instead, you are you want your model to, uh, you know, one, represent key processes that go govern climate sensitivity. And so you do evaluation on the model, being able to well, represent those processes, but also represent the historical climate, mean state and variability over a generally long period of time. And, uh, uh, we know, climate projection, as we will see, are inherently uncertain. And so you're also looking at that cone of uncertainty to assess how confident you are in the direction of change that is due to the climate force signal, to the force climate signal. Next slide. So here I'm gonna just provide an example of skill assessment for a seasonal forecast. And this would be very similar for a multi-annual forecast. Uh, and this uh, is a, based on a retrospective forecast and analysis that Mike Jacobs put together. And so it took prediction from uh, uh, a global climate prediction system and then downscaled them using the UCSC ROMs. And so it was able to uh, generate a retrospective forecast going from 1982 to 2010. Next slide. Um, and so here, uh, Danny was able to, well, he took this box, which is highlighted here, the California current large marine ecosystem, and uh, he tried to assess the scale of seasonal surface temperature. Sorry about my cat. <laughs> and uh, so the first plot shows observations in uh, black and then the forecast mean in green with the forecast spread, and the spread is due to using three ensemble members, which were initialized with slightly different initial conditions. And if you look just at the at the top plot, you actually uh, see that the forecast does quite well. So this is a forecast that in, is initialized in January of every year, uh, all the way to December. And so the lead time of this uh, forecast, you know, changes as you follow the line. But you look at this and you think, oh, it's doing pretty well. But really, uh, a lot of this skill comes from the mother being able to predict that summer are warm and winters are cold. So uh, it can definitely predict the mean seasonal cycle. But uh, one is generally interested in the anomalies around that seasonal cycle. So one step in assessing, you know, climate forecast skill, the first one is to uh, take away that mean seasonal cycle and just look at the anomalies. And those are uh, represented below. And you see again, the observations in black and the forecast mean in dark green. And so you can see that now that, um, you know, there is some uh, possibly here forecast error between, you know, difference between the observations and the forecast. And you can quantitatively assess uh, how good the forecast is. Next slide. And one of the measures that we're gonna, uh, I'm just gonna show you today is the anomaly correlation coefficients, which is simply the correlation coefficient between the observations and, and the forecast over, in this case, that 92 to 2010 time period. And you can do that for different lead time. And in this case, it's for a January initialization. You could do that for different uh, initialization months. And you also do that for different variables. And the dotted line here is uh, the line that represents sort of, um, a correlation that is, that is significantly different than zero with 95% confidence. And so here in yellow, we have SST. And so we can see that the correlation is significant and we have some prediction skill until about, uh, thanks Andy, until about four months. And contrast that with some of the variable below, which uh, even in a short lead time show, you know, very, uh, a very low anomaly correlation coefficients, which is not significant. 
And, and so we would have higher confidence in terms of predictability for the variables above and the variables below. Uh, next slide. So now we go to climate projections. And so here I'm representing work that was part of the Future Seas effort. And these are two papers that have been published, once, one by Mer Pazubuil and one by Jerome Victor. And so here, even before uh, you know, looking at doing projections, Mer compared how um, the model went run historically. So the top uh, for the, the figure on the left, the top, uh, the top plots in labeled control, control. Those are the handcast of of the rounds that she compared to observation right below it, and then she also showed the difference between the control and the observations for different variables. And so uh, you can see that in terms of the climatological distribution of SSD and uh, nitrate, oxygen, and chlorophyll, uh, they're relatively, you know close to observations. However, there are some biases. And so it's important to, you know, do this first step to, you know, convince yourself that the model is reasonable and that you can project it forward, but also to be able to interpret uh, what you get out of the projections as well. And so you can look at uh, the climatology spatially. You can also look, which is not shown here, at the distribution, uh, climatological distribution of your temperatures. And you can also look at the time series over time. And that's something that Jerome showed in his paper for chlorophyll and for temperature. And so one thing that I'd like to stress here is that, for instance, for chlorophyll, we have a much shorter time series to evaluate the model with. So uh, that's something that one might want to keep in mind. And it's also the availability of um, the Heinka. So this one ends in 2010. Those are other things that one needs to keep in mind and that you know uh, should be provided when one presents projections uh, to, to evaluate the models. Next slide. And then one can do a similar historical evaluation, but uh, with the biological models that are being fed by this uh, physical or biogeochemical output to generate uh, projections, in this case, of, uh, of sardine. And so uh, Jerome, again, in the same paper, used this uh, individual base model to project sardine biomass into the future. And so, again, he compared it to the observations. And, uh, and so again, you can see maybe also some of the limitations of the model here. You see that the, the two y-axis are quite different. So there is a bit of a difference in term between the observation, which is actually an estimate from the stock assessment and the biomass from the model. So the LVM is a completely mechanistic model and it also has movement, which is mechanistic. And, uh, and so you can also get distribution of eggs, juveniles and adults, and you can compare that to, for instance, uh, a distribution that you would get from Kalkofi examples, and Jerome does that in his paper. Then uh, we have another way that we projected sardine. In this case, uh, we looked at landings. And so uh, James Smith developed a completely statistical model of sardine landings, which was informed by another statistical model, which is a species distribution model for sardine developed by Barb Mewling. And But again, the first step that it did was you know, comparing um, the historical performance of the model versus observations. And then finally, we also have a kind of a hybrid mechanistic statistical approach uh, with the model that Stefan Königstein developed, which is uh, an age structure model for sardine, but uh, it actually breaks down sort of early life history processes and, and drivers of uh, survival for um, larvae and juveniles, which depend on temperature, food, and also advection, and also considers uh, egg production as being dependent on, on the food that is available to the adults. But again, it did the same thing. Uh, as you can see in the plot on the left, it compared the output from, uh, I guess, an ensemble of biological models that is, are slightly different in terms of, of parameters to uh, the assessment, stock assessment estimate. All right, next. 
So um, climate projections are inherently uncertain. Uncertain, and so that's another thing to keep in mind that when you're doing projection, you uh, need to try to consider these different types of uncertainty. And so this is a plot that shows those uncertainty from the IPCC AR6 uh, Working Group One report. And so mm, the two plots are for two different time periods in the projection for. Uh, 2041 to 2060 and 2081 to 2100 for different regions, so the globe, um, South America, or East Asia. And uh, uh, I just want to show the different types of uncertainty. So if you look at the lines at the top of the different colors, uh, there, those represent uncertainty in the future radiative forcing. So are you using 1.9 in terms of the SSPs or are you using 8.5? And the second layer represents uncertainty in climate response. So even with the same external forcing, you can get uh, you know different answer in terms of future uh, temperature or precipitation, depending on the global climate model that you're using. And then finally, there is also natural and internal climate variability. And so you use many ensemble members, and that's another layer of uncertainty. Uh, next, please. Uh, and so, again, this is something that Mayor looked at in her paper for the California current. And you can see on the left uh, trends in future sea surface temperature for different uh, uh, RCP scenarios. And so, you can see here that we say that scenario uncertainty dominates because if you look at this RCP 8.5 results and that spread is sort of significantly, it is quite different than the yellow one from RCP 2.6. So there is higher warming there under RCP 8.5. However, if you're looking at different variables, if you go all the way to the right and look at primary production, you can see that there is not uh, a large difference in between the, the scenarios. And actually the RCP 8.5 includes uh, sort of the uncertainty of RCP 2.6. So the model uncertainty uh, within RCP 8.5 is so large that it actually encompasses the scenario uncertainty. And so if you're looking at primary production or maybe as the primary production as a driver to your biological model, it would be good to consider uh, multiple climate models. Uh, and projections from multiple climate models so that you're able to uh, encompass that uncertainty. Uh, next slide, please. And, uh, and so here, if you think about that sardine three ways example that I showed you, we use those three models and uh, we force them with output from three different global climate models for the highest RCP point six scenarios. And uh, uh, so here we present different indicators. We have at the top the center of gravity, then we have total landings, and then we have landings, relative landings in California versus the Pacific Northwest. And what I want to stress here that uh, in terms of uh, the center of gravity, you see that there is consistency between the three different uh, both the physical model, but also the biological model, in, in the sense that both all show that there is a shift in the habitat for the northern sardine subpopulation. Uh, however, contrast that to uh, the trends in landings, and so uh, that are quite different between the different uh, uh, biological models. So we have low confidence in future sardine landing trends. There are inconsistent trends uh, across approaches. And uh, these are really uh, driven by uh, an incomplete understanding of what drives sardine dynamics and, and also fisher behavior. However, again, there is sort of consistency between, if you look at the bottom two panel about uh, how the contribution of California to total landings is going to change versus the Pacific Northwest with a decline in California and an increase uh, in the Pacific Northwest landings. Next. 
And so there I sort of introduced the term confidence, because I guess uh, um, it might be useful to discuss not only uh, what forecast case and what variables might be useful to include in the appendix, but also how we're going to um, assess confidence in those uh, in those forecasts. And so this is something that the IPCC uh, does. It, it bases the um, confidence on the type, the amount, the quality, and the consistent of evidence, and then the agreement between different lines of ed evidence and assigns uh, a confidence uh, based on that. And then for those that show high confidence, then one can, uh, and there is some quantitative information available in terms of many projections, then one can also look at a likelihood. Next slide. And so the CCIA group sort of taught um, about how one could uh, perhaps assign confidence to different uh, different types of confidence. <laughs> and that confidence is going to change based on the variable that you're forecasting, but also uh, based on the on the forecast time scale. And, uh, and so I, I might not go in the description of the different types, but the difference are um, in terms of factors that define the confidence. We talked about, you know, the ability of observations, is it well sampled or not, to actually uh, do a model evaluation, uh, while we understand the dynamics of, of that index. Can the model reproduce historical patterns? And then for forecast, uh, is the retrospective forecast skill high uh, or not? All right, I think that's it for the overview of terms part. Thank you. So I guess we uh, open it up for uh, questions there on that section. Thanks, Desiree. That was great. Do we have questions, Kristen, or others? Yes, let's do that. So um, I will look for hands, but uh, as I'm waiting, I'll say, yeah, thanks for that great overview, uh, Andrew and Desiree. Um, I think. You just covered a lot of ground uh, and uh, that was really helpful. I appreciate the um, clear way that you laid out um, the sort of prediction, projection, um, uh, definitions and as well as the model evaluation and how you're thinking about uncertainty. Um, I, so, as I'm waiting for other people to think of questions to ask, I will just say that I, I, um, or I guess I will ask a question. Can, can, can you, so how are you thinking right now um, about how to link this, uh, the language of definitions that you're showing us today with, um, how the information that will be presented, just like, for example, for this year's report, knowing that you're, you know, one step at a time, but um, maybe can you help us uh, connect some dots? Um, well, yeah. I, I can try to go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, from, from my point of view here, I, I think everything that Desiree just talked about are the I just think as we go through the examples the rest of this and you're thinking about what we can do and what we can't do, everything she just said applies to almost everything we're going to talk about in that you have to keep all, you know, we're going to say, okay, this is a prediction of this item or this ind index, but they have all those caveats and issues rolled into them that she's just talked about. So I think that's the key here takeaway. Um, and then I think we are leaning towards using the sort of this confidence scale that the IPCC has set up. So we don't want to invent our own language for how we think of the uncertainty and the confidence we have in things, but we want to build upon what's already kind of a, you know, an essentially an internationally agreed upon way to look at these forecast models. So we'd, we'd like to continue using these kind of terms as we go forward and eventually evaluate whichever indices we end up, you know, using and relying on and using this kind of language. We have not um, done that in most cases yet. 
Uh, so we, we are not going to be in the rest of this example. I don't think we're going to be providing those estimates, but we just wanted to introduce that language and know that's essentially, I think, you know, other people can correct me on this, but I think that's where we would eventually head to try to provide some idea of the sort of skill and confidence and uncertainty we have in the various indices. And they'll be different depending on the index and the assumptions that go into the index, the, you know, all sorts of things that go into what kind of, whether it's a prediction or a projection. Uh, will affect you know the uncertainty but we just want to make that clear i guess at this point that that's i think where we're heading we're not there yet but that's where we'd like to go um with this so i'm sorry i think that's where was trying to talk to thanks andy i think you covered it pretty well actually but um yeah i think it's important for folks that would be looking at these indices to have also a set of terminology you know sort of available Maybe we're thinking to put in a glossary or, or something to orient the readers, but as well, that we'll uh, have some of the information I presented. Yeah, I think that seems really helpful. And I'll just uh, speak for myself, and others can um, chime in if they agree or not. But I, I mean, I think both the point of building off of already of language that's already been sort of used and approved uh, by the IPCC makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, using that language in a consistent way throughout the, um, you know, whatever, whatever materials do end up in that climate change appendix um, will be really helpful on the interpretation side. Um, and I do also like um, Desiree's suggestion to have a, a glossary or something like that. Um, so I'm just thinking that, um, you know, the dif different from, um, you know, with the salmon stoplight forecasts, like yellow might need something different, depending on which stock or which indicator or whatever you were looking at. I think with this climate change appendix, it sounds like, you know, high confidence always means high confidence or whatever. So I think that that putting bounds around that where you can and, and being consistent where you can um, is is great. And I see Melissa saying plus one to that. Um, so I guess other um, subcommittee uh, members, um, any any thoughts or feedback on the sort of model evaluation um, uh, work that Desiree presented, or um, wanted to discuss anything there, or on uncertainty. Um, or really, I guess, anything else on this uh, topic before we move on to the next one. John Field, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a, a really minor point, but I think it's something I want to capture in the notes. So I want to make sure we talk about it so I can capture it in the notes. With respect to the sardine forecast and the sort of high confidence in the shift in relative abundance and distribution to the north, just to be clear, and it was on your slide, but just to be clear, we're talking about the nominally northern subpopulation of sardines with respect to that. And one would kind of anticipate that the southern subpopulation of sardines, which is typically found off Mexico, but occurs in the Southern California Bight during um, the summer and fall, uh, would probably shift north as well. Um, I could see that being a question that came up from council members, both to you and to us. Yeah, thanks for highlighting that, uh, John. Yes, so that would be for the northern subpopulation. Uh, yeah, and so we didn't look at all at the southern, you know, limited as we know by by data availability to do the evaluation of the model in the past. But um, yeah, and uh, in James' paper, he, he also stresses that in the discussion. And so I guess okay. that's important. Well, I don't know. I don't need to go into this, but I guess what the work showed is that uh, in my, I guess, we need to be better prepared in terms of management because now it's only really focused on the northern subpopulation. 
That would be a yeah. great takeaway, actually, to put into anything uh, that you do include in the report and write up for that. I think that's the kind of thing that will capture people's attention uh, as they note that nuance. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, John. Um, I see. Let's see. There's a hand up still. Oh, that's you, John Field. Do you have another point, or you just have just like hand up residually? No, oh, raise your hand. Sorry. No, nope, no problem. I, I saw Isaac Kaplan suddenly appear on video. Isaac, did you have an addition? No. Okay. <laughs> um. Okay. So I think uh, the. We're you know, supportive of this approach, um, appreciate the consistency with terminology and um, providing those definitions and continuing that moving forward uh, as this appendix uh, continues to develop. Um, okay, so I think we're ready to move to biological, the next section. And I think I misspoke earlier. This is where we're supposed to have a change in repertoire to Melissa. And so I Melissa, am ready. Are you ready to take over? I'm all set. Perfect. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Awesome. <laughs> and I guess if John Field, are you are you set for what for your write up for that first section? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. Go all ahead. Right, good Andy. to go. Okay. Yep. Great. Okay. So um, on a section two here, I'm going to talk about some things. These so. Just to be clear, I titled this indices, but these are not really indices. I'm going to spend a little time talking about some of these um, models that can provide what we call the predictions, not the projections, but the predictions. So hopefully I, that was clear. I think I think Desiree did an awesome job of describing the difference between the two. Um, but I just want to spend a little time talking about um, some systems that we have going. They're actually active right now that can provide these sort of short term predictions. Um, so they're not the indices themselves, but they pro provide, hopefully this is clear, they provide the information that we could use to recreate uh, short-term forecasts and predictions of various indices. So one of these is the um, WCOFS West Coast Ocean Forecast System uh, developed. There's a bunch of people online here and part of our team and also uh, Alex and, and Jingtao um, have worked on this. So this is a uh, ROMS model. It's a very uh, uh, detailed uh, four-dimensional model um, that they have they have worked on, and what this does it's at very high resolution too. It's up somewhere between four and uh, two kilometer res resolution. And what this model does, you can see the covered area. It's the whole west coast on this diagram on the right. Um, and what this can do is provide very detailed data on physical properties uh, at very high resolution. And it will forecast these several days ahead. So this is just an example. You can go to their website right now and get these um, these forecasts. Uh, so here we have an example showing an observed uh, data in the in the red versus their model, and then their forecast data. Okay, so you can envision that anywhere we've got an index that relied on say water temperature in some specific spot, um, you could drive that index with this. Very short term, but again, depending on the need, you may want this kind of really specific, very detailed data. And this is a prediction, not a projection. So it's very specific and it's dealing with what the initial state is now. So this is the kind of thing you could use to look at, okay, it's an El Nino today. How much is that impacting things over the next week? That kind of issue. Um, and this already is seeing some use. Uh, and these are some potential lists of uses here. This could be used for uh, looking at surface currents for navigation. Uh, again, this could be, you could use this to get all these different things like uh, where the fronts are, where the, how deep the mix layer is, currents. Um, you could use this for flow trajectories, like very important in some areas. Uh, again, you get the ocean circulation, which if you get that right and you couple it with a biogeochemical model, you can look at hypoxia over short term and you can look at um, whether there's possibly even algal blooms. Uh, you can also look at things like uh, beach and impacts, floods, uh, you know, rise of water level, that kind of thing in particular areas due to storms, whatever you have going on. Uh, and then this also provides um, boundary conditions for other 
uh, models that you might also be running. So th these are this is a great example of a system that's in place right now that provides these uh, short-term predictions. Uh, and here's just an example here showing a particular index that is using these uh, predictions. So this is the one on the left is uh, habitat suitability for whales. So this is for a study they use this habitat suitability to, to estimate whether there is risk of um, ship strikes uh, depending on the environmental conditions. And here the diagram on the left is the prediction from WCOFs and the diagram on the right is an uh, analysis done by a separate um, ROMs. So they are fairly comparable. And so this was a study done to just see how well this uh, WCOF system was working compared to an existing model. Okay, so here's another example of, this is even a slightly longer term, um, again, it's a prediction, not a, not a projection, but this is the JSCOPE um, project. And this model also uses the same uh, physical model called ROMs, uh, and it has connected to it, though, a, a fairly detailed, what's called an NPZD model, which is nitrogen, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and detritus, that's what that stands for. But basically, that's the biological model uh, that Neil uh, Bannis uh, developed. Um, and so what I'm showing here is just a clip from, again, this is straight from their, uh, the JSCOPE uh, webpage. So they have this up and running right now where you can get these uh, forecasts. So this particular one, I believe what they showed here was they have on the bottom, again, it's an index derived from their physical data. So the bottom panel going across the right is an upwelling index that they forecast. So they started their model in May and it ran all the way through till November. So many months of forecast. And then this green line is showing what the forecast data looked like uh, for oxygen, chlorophyll, sea surface temperature, and bottom pH in this case uh, on this date several months ahead of time. Um, so a really interesting system for providing these uh, short-term predictions which of uh, physical and some biological data, which you could then use to drive various indices, for instance, here the case is the upwelling index, an index we use for lots of other uh, linkages to, uh, gosh, just a ton of things in the ecosystem. Upwelling, as we all know, kind of drives most, a lot of things on the West Coast. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. And then we, of course, have access to these really long-term physical projections. So now this is separate from the idea of predictions where we get the exact value at some point in time only a few days or weeks or months ahead to these sort of what Desiree is talking about, that we wanna get the statistical properties right about these long-term uh, projections. So here we can go out, you know, 100 years into the future and say, okay, this is what we think the temperatures will be like. Um, and again, this is something that we can get specifically for any location. But again, it's, you gotta realize, like uh, Desiree was saying, it's the statistics that we're trying to capture here. Uh, and in this case, this is what, what's shown here is the idea that we have different different models. And so you have all these different lines are showing different models projecting into the future. And one nice thing to see is that they, in this case, all generally agree that the sea surface temperature is, of course, going up. Um, but that's what we mean a lot of times when we talk about ensembles of models. So you would use these different models as an ensemble to drive say a single index that might be derived from um, sea surface temperature and you'd use the all the ensemble runs to give you an idea of the uncertainty so again just keep in mind all the uncertainties that uh desiree spoke about are going to impact how you might use this forward projection to um, in turn uh, develop an index that would go forward in time okay so just to summarize this little bit here uh, I think some important things to point out is right now, a lot of these things are all based on ROMs. There's a couple other models out there, but most of the ones we've shown and are going to show are all based on ROMs. In fact, most of them are based on a UCSC uh, run ROMs. Um, and these models can provide these, these physical models can provide these projections, which again, or the predictions, sorry, predictions, which are very short time scale, but very specific and dependent on those initial conditions. They also can provide these projections, which are these long-term, uh, you know, up to a century away examples. And we're gonna have quite a few more examples of those in the following slides. Um, and in all cases, remember it's important that these things can provide these very specific time and location data for using uh, in the indices you might base around these phys this physical and some uh, low-level biological data. So, excuse me. 
So anyways, here we go onto um, these larger scale indices, uh, ground fish examples. Um, before I do that, it, I know that section was really short. Does anyone have any questions? Please promise we would stop in between sections. If anybody had any questions on what I just talked about, section two, uh, please chime in. Uh, okay, Corey Niles is asking, I understand there's a distinction between projection prediction and target between prediction and forecast. Um, Desiree, could you yeah. field that? <laughs> yeah, so so thanks for the that. question. Uh, so no, actually in climate science, uh, when, uh, people talking about in the, doing seasonal projections and weather predictions, they use prediction and forecast interchangeably. But I noticed that uh, ecologists than others actually use forecast more is as even a broader term so anything where you're kind of forecasting be it a projection or a, a prediction kind of outside the training data for, for your model so um, but i would say for me forecast is more a synonym with the prediction And so I think, as uh, you know, Christine mentioned, it'd be good to be consistent in the appendix in the use usage of our terms. I I feel like the one we want to draw the most attention to is really I, I, keep, I maybe I've harped on it already too much, but the the difference really between the prediction and the projection. I'm I'm really hoping people have a feel for that because it kind of that kind of permeates a lot of. Um, how we can think about what we get out of these various indices as we produce the forecasts, whether they be a prediction or a projection. So, do we do we have other questions for the for that? I know it was really short that section. Just a, a comment on that. Um, I think part of the confusion, or not confusion, but I think part of the difficulty with um, just this terminology is uh, I'm just thinking about stock assessment. Typically, with stock assessments, they call them projections. Right, the five to ten year projection or whatever it is. Melissa's going to help me if I mess this up, um, and and that's very that's not what you're talking about here because because in the assessments they're you know they're conditioned on what that what that final year um, that was estimated is, and so so that's kind of a dichotomy that um, I think we probably need to just um, be careful about and acknowledge that people that might be reading assessments and used to it, Interpreting stock fish stock assessments uh, might be thinking about it in a different way. I see a hand. Is someone going to help me out? Uh, I, I'm holding oh, hands. I, I was just going to say I, I see a lot of value in actually bringing into line the ocean modeling and stock assessment communities in terms of using the same kinds of terms. And I like what we're talking about here. So maybe we could uh, adapt to what's being used in the IPCC report on the stock assessment side as well. Yeah, and, and I guess at a minimum, maybe let's let's flag in our subcommittee report that this is an area that we should um, we should do our best to try to come together on. Because it, because it sounds to me, it's interesting because it sounds to me like if you're using that last data value to help run your forecast, that's more what we would call a prediction, not a projection right but it sounds like you go but you go longer than i think we would typically say is a prediction as well if you're going 10 years or something so it's uh, that is interesting yeah. dan awesome. i see you, you have your hand up here too yeah but i'm wondering is it's it's a little different it is a projection in the sense that you make a projection what's going to happen to the stock based on some assumptions about what the catch is going to be all right it's not a prediction in terms of an absolute what's going to absolutely happen um, cause you make some assumptions about what the cash is going to be, which are, you know, so your, your, your projection is, is only relative is, is only subject to that, to those assumptions about cash. Right. So that's, it is a that's projection in a sense. It's forced by the catch. Right. So, but as are the, um, the climate models are forced by the, so, you know, external. I'm lacking the word, but Andrew's nodding. I think he knows what I mean. Um, I'm. Uh, let's see. I see. I think John Field, you have your hand up. 
I, I was just going to add that I, I agree with Dan. I, I think we are actually being relatively consistent. And if, but it is a little nuanced. So if you look at our decision tables, for example, one axis is the catches and how those are projected. The other is the uncertainty in the model. So we're kind of a, a hybrid. I think I'd probably just agree with Melissa that we should think about whether there's improvements we can make in standardizing our terminology and, and leave how exactly we do that for another day. But it's a great discussion. Agree. Um, and a note that Yvonne made in the chat that maybe some scientists need to write a paper on this if, if uh, to clarify our terminology. Um, Desiree. Yeah, I was going to agree about the external forcing. So I almost feel like those fisheries projection are kind of those decadal prediction, which you kind of get the skill from both. But I do agree that if you run it kind of with different, let's say, fishing mortality for the future, those are kind of the different scenarios, which remind me of the different RCP scenarios. I can see both points. Yeah, it seems like we need a conceptual diagram. <laughs> um, okay, well, we should move on. Um, so, uh, any other questions on this last section before we move on to the larger scale indices? Okay. Thanks for that offer, Mike Jacock in the chat. That would be great. And we'll let you keep going, Andrew. Okay, great. All right. So, on to section three here. Um, so just a caveat, this is all uh, work that was given to me by uh, Eric Ward and, and Owen Liu. So I'm hoping I can do justice to uh, their slides here. Um, so these are now getting to a little more uh, concrete examples of uh, some indices uh, and projections. So again, we have in this case, a slight differentiation between um, the indicators that are historical. In this case, this is kind of equivalent to what um, Desiree was mentioning about real analyses, these kind of things. So it's a historical fit to data. Um, so with those kind of uh, indicators where they're asking these questions about our conditions, could we even tell if conditions in the California current are changing based on our indicator? Uh, and use those to point towards which species um, should we be concerned about or which ones we don't need to be as concerned about. And then the next step is to take, uh, take those uh, indices and do these long-term projections and look at how the, the distributions might change in the future. So here's an example of this, uh, and this is for um, this is an example for Petrali Sol. And what we're looking at here, COG is the center of gravity, uh, and the idea is that we're looking at how much things will change over uh, a pretty long period of time here. So um, first, the thing on the left is showing you what trend there might be. Uh, Again, I'm sorry. And this is the this is the past. So this is the historical analysis. So the figure on the left showing the trend. If you can see it, um, it's roughly showing that it's blue. So things are getting better uh, for these fish in the north and worse in the south. Uh, and then they divide it up into clusters where you can clearly see there's a difference where the northern population is changing uh, in one cluster, and there's sort of this southern group changing another cluster. Um, but what's interesting here is that even though you can see these just these differences across space, if you combine the whole thing into one, I guess this is the traditional method would be looking at center of gravity, you don't see a large change in the center of gravity. So the point here is that when we look at these indices, some of the traditional ones, if you use, say, a, a whole coastwide um, center of gravity would not be so indicative of change. So it's important to keep that in mind that you may need to break down uh, some of these traditional indices and, and, and use them differently than you have. Um, so again, here's a, here's another example of this. Uh, so they've applied uh, the same kind of center of gravity analysis now projecting for this is the, the future projection um, for 65 different species. So a lot of different species. And they're showing that there was good news that there wasn't there was a, several that have no trends across the whole coast. And not all of them are moving northward, but some of them are. Some are moving one way, some are moving the other way. Um, but again, the point here is that these regional trends don't always give the same pattern. So, for instance, um, you'll notice uh, with the long spine uh, thorny head here, this graph on the right, you'll notice that 
coastwide, it has one trend where it's kind of moving to the north. But if you broke it down into these different regions, you'd see that the, the center of gravity is actually changing. So you really have to keep in mind that you might have to split up uh, your indices into finer spatial um, resolution to really get the full story when you do these long-term projections, okay? Again, this is another another example showing how uh, if you're for if you're modeling these projections into the into the future, um, what could happen? So this is again looking at the historical data just to sh see what happened first before you go on to the projection. Again, we have two very different results now depending on your species. So the spiny dogfish in this case um, is is changing its distribution. Okay, basically from the more northings, okay, as you go over the years, versus striped tail rockfish is not really showing this change. It's short, sort of showing changes um, at every uh, latitude as you go go through here. Okay, so another thing you can do is you can use these species distribution models to derive um, these environmental niches. So again, this is looking at the, this is a historical analysis, not not forward projecting yet, but you can use this to sort of look at. Um, what the sort of temperature preferences are for these species. So an example here, we see the arrowtooth flounder. Uh, it has a relatively narrow band compared to Dover sole in terms of its uh, variability that it's found at when they uh, compare the temperatures to where the animals are caught. Okay, and we notice also we don't have as many changes over time, say something like Dover sole. But when we look at something like split nose rockfish, we notice, for instance, this really jumps out. This happens to be like the big heat wave Bob year. We had a big change in the temperature where they were uh, found uh, for 2014. So this is really the, the part where you're looking at these historical analyses to say, which species do we need to focus on and worry more about when we do our um, forward uh, projections? Okay, so just a, a reminder on this, when we now switch to doing this projection in the future, we need to be sure that these um, that we think about the uncertainty of the indi indicator, and it's again, it, it's still tied to all those issues that Desiree brought up about the models that we're using to drive these indicators. So we have several levels of of uncertainty. We have kind of the uncertainty, which is these bounds on these plots here, based on the observations. But we have also bringing into it all the uncertainty in those forward projecting models as well. Um, so the question here is, uh, can we project many of these same indicators into the future? Uh, and what they did is they used, again, this UCSC ROMs to project to the end of the century. And again, this is what we call a climate projection, not a prediction. So it's not going to get things exactly right on a particular year going forward, but we're trying to get the overall view of how the statistics of this will look over the long term. So here's an example here of, of this work. So using those historical analyses to then drive this um, forward project, projection into the far future, we're looking at uh, these, in this example, four different species, Dover sole, sablefish, the short spine, the long spine, thorny head. Um, and what we're showing here is the blue line is the... Oh, Sorry, the postman just came. <laughs> oh my God. Hold on. Sorry, sorry about that. My dog is there. I've got someone working on it. Um, sorry. So, anyways, the <laughs> what's happening is is we've got the um, we've got the the doors. <laughs> oh my god! I'm really sorry. Hold on, just. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. I got my dog dog tenders on the job there. Um, so what we're seeing here is is just an example of when we go these long term uh, projections into the future. There's some changes in the depth at which these fish will be found according to this model. So, 
and they're different depending on the species. So that's another important point to, to think about is we're going to have different results depending on species. Okay. So another step here is we can also look at um, what the expected uh, change in density by latitude will be. So this is again going to eventually fit into ideas of how fishing might change over space. So you'll notice here there's a change in um, the latitudes of where these fish are. So we've got, again, the four different species and each one has a different change in where they'll go. So you're gonna have uh, big differences in the uh, sort of more complex metrics that you would look at for changes uh, by port, for example. Um, here's another example where they looked at the board uh, forecast of what is called a novel climate. So in this case, it's trying to connect what the uh, current historical view of where spiny dogfish would be um, as a function of the environment and forecast as we go forward in time, where our area, how much of the area in the California current might be a new area where the spiny dogfish might go into. And again, in this case, it's this idea of we run, uh, they run these ensemble uh, forecasts. So these are different uh, emissions forcing the green line, the red line, the blue line. They all give the idea that you're going to have an increase in novel climate, but in this case, we have actually a, a fairly big difference between two of the models and this uh, third model in terms of how much of the California current would be novel uh, habitat for the dogfish in the future. Uh, and lastly, we can also then, I guess, connect these changes in where you think the fish will go in, the, in these far future uh, projections uh, compared to uh, your trawl fishing. So, I'm not going to go into details too much on this, but what it's basically trying to get across the point is that this is something that's possible to do with these kind of uh, background data and these long term projections. You just again need to keep in mind that uh, there's a lot of caveats that go into all of these that Desiree talked about, and then these individual uh, metrics would, would need to be uh, reviewed. And then this is again an idea of what are the sort of um, cutting edge, and I think this was, this was asked actually in the earlier um, section on salmon, and the idea is that eventually we, we'd like to go beyond uh, just these correlative kind of uh, measures of looking at habitat, but looking at uh, sort of uh, metabolic, more mechanistic linkages. So this is an example in this Essington paper um, where they're, they're using instead of a just a distribution map based on uh, temperature correlations, they're actually looking at what's the best uh, place for these fish based on their metabolic uh, needs. And so in this case, you could, you're having a much more uh, mechanistic linked map of their distribution in space and time. So hopefully that would be something that would hold together better uh, over time than just one that is based purely on the correlation of the historical data. So moving on, this is um, yet another example of something that's essentially kind of on tap right now. And this is some species distribution models. This is uh, relates a little bit to what uh, Desiree was talking about earlier. This is currently something that's being hosted on ERDAP. Uh, and these are these um, distribution models for, uh, for uh, coastal pelagic species. So in this case, the map on the left is um, sardine. And what it's showing is a map of the predicted habitat for the sardine. And on the right, this is the same data set, but they've just picked a point in, uh, in point in space from this spatial map and said, what are the predicted uh, species habitats for this uh, sardine over time at that point? So this is, again, historical data. But it's the same kind of underpinning um, data that you could use to do the forecast. So that's what this is. This is now taking that uh, historical data and using it to make this uh, long-term projection forecast. And again, this is this um, changes in the north sub north subpopulation of sardine, uh, looking at this long, really long-term uh, hundred year change. So the maps on the left are showing you uh, where they've either increased or decreased. So blue is basically an increase in abundance. The orangey color is the decrease. Uh, and the different columns here are the different uh, sort of forcing ensemble uh, models. So different climate forecasts for how our mission scenarios will be in the future. Um, what's nice here is that all three have a pretty similar agreement. Um, and then what they're looking at doing is using 
uh, using these models to then basically compare what landings might be like in the future on these long-term projections. Uh, in this case, they actually, in this paper, they actually added in a, 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 some control rules about landings uh, to match the ACLs. Um, so this is kind of connecting sort of almost the whole end-to-end -end of looking at uh, the historic data, forecasting a distribution, and then using that distribution to look at the effect of um, the landings on the population and changes over time. Um, and then, of course, you can do similar things with uh, other species. So this is the same kind of idea. Again, we have this time we've got albacore, uh, and this is projected changes for uh, albacore catch going forward. Um, in this case, it is just one center of gravity uh, by latitude, looking at the change over the next 100 years. Uh, the three different panels here are, again, these three different um, emissions forcing uh, scenarios. Okay, so you can see though the prediction here is that in all cases, uh, they're basically all moving north. Okay? And they then made the further connection of looking how uh, there might be changes in landings by port. Okay, and then this could also be done for a whole variety of uh, highland migratory species. And this was done in a, in a recent, recent paper that's now in prep. And again, you similar idea. You can look, I'm sorry that the axes are quite small here, but this is again looking over this X axis is looking over 100 years um, what the changes in habitat, in this case, habitat suitability would be uh, over time. So you can notice there's essentially winners and losers here. Some are habitat, habitat suitability going up, uh, but several, uh, the habitat suitability is going down. I believe that's this next plot here is showing you essentially the 100 year uh, winners and losers. So it's comparing um, a sort of 30 year period at the beginning of, of time, the 1985 to 2015 versus 2070 to 2100. So uh, those are the two time periods being, being compared to see who is doing better, who's doing worse in this really long term uh, projection of habitat for these, for all these different species. This can be done. Okay. And this is just another example, though, digging into one particular species, this blue shark, and looking at how its its specific distribution might change. Uh, and the point here is just that um, you sometimes need to look a little more into detail on a particular species to, to get the, some nuances. So in this case, uh, you have changes um, depending on which uh, emission scenario you have. Uh, they're they're not really big, but they're there. There's differences you can see between the ranges of the animals that are predicted uh, under the different forcing scenarios. So sometimes it is important to take a look at those uh, differences between the different um, within an animal and then between the different uh, forcing scenarios. Okay, and that is it for that section. So before we go on to karma, there's probably some questions, and I apologize again about the uh, dog. Uh, interference there <laughs> kind of threw me off a little bit. But... No problem at all. Um, questions for Andrew on that section on biological and ecological. Let's see, we were calling them indicators, but we're not calling them indicators. Uh, predictions and forecasts. So oh, projections and forecasts and projections. Um, yes, I see a hand. That is Dan. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm I'm just trying to get an understanding of of what I mean most of these things like you said are are sort of long-term projections. Um they're not sort of things that they're not indices that are changing from year to year or even you know we didn't we would hope that the projections aren't going to change from year to year. Um so I mean this isn't like not something that you're going to put into the you know the appendix each year. Um so, I mean, what is envisioned here is, is this is just a place to put sort of um, maybe every year it's going to have some different studies or different things that have come, you know, come out. Uh, the newest hot topics that relate to climate projections and things in the California current, or is this a place to put indices and things that um, are sort of monitoring what's going on, or I, I'm a little confused about what really the purpose of the of, of the appendix is. 
Well, I, I can try. I, I can try to answer that, Dan. I think it will, and I think we actually kind of talked about this before. So I'm glad you brought it up. I think the idea is we might have have both. We might have both specific things that we would be updating. Uh, we'll get to this at the end of the at the end of the talk, but we might have specific things that would be updating every year. But I think there also could be a place for these kind of studies um, that are that are these long term projections that you. You definitely, I don't think, unless there was some new information or something came up, you definitely would not um, keep updating them every year. Uh, and I believe if if uh, if they're online, they're, the people who are working on this could could comment more about what their plans might be for these kind of long term projections. But I recall when we were putting these together, um, one of their calls for guidance would be there, like, look, we have so many species that we could do these analyses on. At this point, the guidance would would potentially be um, which species should we focus on was the guidance they're looking for. So we wouldn't necessarily dump on you every year or, or all at once every single every single long term projection. But we, but they're looking for guidance on the new species. Can it be the people who worked on this stuff correct me on that? That's if I'm interpreting you correctly on that. Yeah, Desiree, go ahead. Yeah, we actually had that this similar conversation in the organizing meetings um, in trying to assess what would be useful and also realizing that the projections are not going to be to be updated every year, uh, but they could be in one place and maybe they'll need to be updated once, you know, there is a new IPCC report in terms of drivers or maybe uh, a new oceanographic models like mom six instead of roms or something uh yeah and that's why we started off with the forecast scales too just letting everybody know that um yeah we were not sure this being a climate change appendix if it should be just uh, about projections or also about other indicators that um, at, at other time scales like forecast or as you say historical monitoring to track change Sorry, I don't really have an answer, but. No, I think that's helpful. I mean, I mean, I think it seems to me, at least, it seems like the um, where to focus is partly again, going to depend on who's going to use the output and to what end. So which um, what advisory bodies could make use of this information and for what purpose? Um, I, uh, it strikes me that maybe some of the uh, SDM work, particularly the region specific SDMs for some of the species could be useful in the ongoing and future discussions around stock definitions, perhaps. Um, so that would be one potential connection point that I would suggest. Um, other people could, uh, could, could uh, chime in to agree or disagree with that. I also see Chris has his hand up, so I will I'll go to him next. Thanks. I'll I'll be brief. I, I the when we call, when we talk about a climate change appendix, uh, I think that's it's in some ways it's convenient shorthand for what we put into the report last year and what we um, it doesn't necessarily need to be a standalone appendix that's there year after year, uh, but it, you know that's that's where it that was where it was born. It might you know be raised elsewhere, and it it is going to be important for us to connect back with the folks who first uh, did propose it and to watch how this evolves within uh, the council because I can imagine there are a lot of people that just want to know right now. Hey, is the California current changing? And uh, they could say, if we say, well, yes, based on this indicator, this indicator and that indicator, it looks like it is, their next question might be, do you expect it's going to continue to change? Is it going to accelerate? Uh, and so on and so forth. And that's where some of these historic values that I might be, you know, telling us something about the recent past and present uh, could, you know, hopefully transition somewhat informatively into the future. There are going to be other people that want to know the big long-term picture related to end of century types of projections or projections related to the climate and communities initiative or things like that. And, uh, and maybe we don't need to update those year after year after year in uh, the supplements of the report. Um, but um, 
another thing that we'd said all along was like the thing this morning that this is a conversation starter um, and it's really important for us to be able to come to the council um, with things like common terminologies and also with our our skill sets our capabilities laid out so that as the council does i think zero in on what its immediate needs are we know if our capabilities match those needs that's kind of the way i look at it from uh from the back seat Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, um, Chris. And uh, I'm just I'm seeing in the chat that uh, Corey Niles has said a couple of things. Um, do you want to just do you want to expand on your point, Corey? Uh, yeah, thanks, Kristen. I don't know. I know Yvonne's bouncing back and forth between things. So I don't know if she's listening, but yeah, I think it, this is a lot sounding like what um, the council we haven't caught up as an EWG on what the next steps are. But Andy's question about you know what species would be useful. I think that's you know the rough and Elliot's on here too maybe but but the um the rough marching orders is kind of figure out how to take information from the ESR and this kind of thing and, and focus it on um the FMP processes more you know so bring it in into the management process and that's we're figuring out what to do and yeah so what species to take up next it seems like it could fold into that process eventually but yeah Elliot's here so maybe he had um more more thoughts there, but yeah, I think that's again we have to regroup and see, that would recommend how that works, how this initiative is going to take 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 hold. Yeah, I I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and and I guess I would also just sort of again draw the distinction between um, sort of current status reporting indicators from the existing ecosystem status report that are potentially useful for you know, short-term council decision-making um, versus this being more forward-looking forecasted projections that might be more useful for some of the more uh, longer-term strategic, um, well, at least the projections would be sort of more for the sort of longer-term strategic uh, questions that the council is interested in. So, and hopefully there's room for both of those in the, in this new initiative, sort of both of those perspectives. Um, okay, I see a couple more hands. Um, Dan and then Cameron. Yeah, I guess, you know, I see personally, I kind of see what's maybe uh, it, you know, seems like it might be the most useful is the, is the sort of the short term climate predictions, um, uh, or projections, but really more predictions where, you know, we, you, you know, for something like PDO, for example, I, my understanding is that you can actually um, predict what's, you know, what's going to happen with PDO two or three years out. And I don't know to what degree you can predict an El Nino, how far out, that kind of thing. But there are other things where we, we have some idea what, what the implications of those might be. We don't like, uh, you know, El Ninos or whatever, but, um don't like the PDO in one direction or another. And if we were able to predict those and talk a little bit about what the implications might be, those seems like the kind of things that are going to be the most relevant to council decision making. Um, I mean, there's the there the long term stuff is relevant in sort of strategic planning exercises and stuff, but um, you know maybe not so much year to year kind of council business. Is my two cents, Cameron. Um, it, it kind of Go seems, ahead, Cameron. Yeah, you know, thanks. Um, so, I mean, it kind of seems like what we're talking about is sort of a climate change appendix is really sort of qualitatively different than the rest of the ESR. I mean, would it be useful to think of it as just sort of a separate document or project that's also produced by the CCIA team? Like, you could have a climate change report that comes out every year or every two years that does the things that are being proposed here, kind of the, the projections and predictions, um, and then have kind of the ESR have its kind of traditional focus on more of the kind of ecosystem status indicators. Um, I mean, is that something that, that we've considered? Is it something worth considering? Or do people just kind of like the idea of having one giant um, CCIA document every year? Yeah, interesting question, Cameron. I think I'll just say that, um, you know, that obviously would be a, a 
something that we might have an opinion on, but I'm sure lots of other advisory bodies and the council would have something to say about too. So, uh, yeah, so I, but I would be curious if the CCIEA team has, has talked about that at all. Um, and if we, uh, we have, we, we have talked, we have talked about that. In fact, we were just talking this morning yesterday. Um, so that's a good point. I mean, from my point of view, the optimal condition would be we have our indices that are like in the ESR right now that we produce. And if it, if there was a way to to magically get everything I wanted, it we would we would be able to have that index, and then we would say, and here's your forecast of that index over X period of time, going forward. Um, now, how we get from what we have now to being able to do that and be confident that and you know determining what is the level of confidence in those kind of forecasts that's that's the question right is is what what kind of confidence would we have in those um and what level of confidence would would say the council accept um i don't know i think maybe isaac i think it looked like you're chomping at the bit to respond because <laughs> I, I feel like like you guys jscope stuff i like, the closest to that in terms of uh, operational system in a way would you comment? Uh, yes, I can. I can jump in. Um, yeah, we. So the JScope work is focused on seasonal forecasts, and um, actually, the the SSC reviewed that about four years ago. Um, and yeah, we have we have spent a lot of time identifying confidence and model skill, and I guess um, I guess one thing I've learned from the oceanographers on that is that. Um, they don't just talk about the confidence, sort of the model skill of the oceanographic projections writ large. They really focus on the phenomenon and the depths and the variables of interest to a particular species. Um, so I'll just say that the conversation in the chat about identifying the species and management issues um, key to the advisory bodies is really important because um, then folks like Sam Sudlecki and the oceanographic teams go back and and ask, you know, is their model accurate and skillful at, at this depth and in this season and in this location for hake or crab or um, whatever whatever the indicator is supposed to capture and whatever the management issue is. That's it. Okay, so Isaac, I, I, I see your point. So to, so to go from what what I, I was just positing, you know, someday we would have this, the perfect situation was we could, you know, perfectly predict on into the future a little bit. So we'd have the indices we have, we perfectly predict on the future. The, the missing step sounds like it would be, would be to go in and validate, or I don't know what the exact term is, but assess how well the model does at producing that bit of information you need to, for that specific index. Is that capture it? I, yeah, that does. Yeah, that's that's accurate. And I think um, um, hey, the Hake example is a really good one. The work that Mike Malik and folks on the call have participated in, really focusing on model performance and skill for the Hake variables. There's a couple papers on that. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Isaac. Um, I, I do want to uh, keep us moving and notice that we're about due for a break. Melissa has had her hand up for a little bit, um, so I want to let her comment and, and also just comment that I think we can circle back to this sort of larger discussion at the end, too, because it's kind of relevant to all of all of what, what we talked about this afternoon. So, Melissa, go ahead. Thanks, Kristen. I was just going to say I really like the idea of perhaps a separate document for the longer term projections that kind of are the more strategic product. That seems like something that's a little bit separate from the current uh, ESR and Andy's idea of putting the near term pre predictions into that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it seems like what we really need is a plan for soliciting uh, feedback from a, a body of people larger than perhaps those that are on the call today. Um, because it seems there hasn't been a lot of opportunity for that yet, which is understandable. Um, but I, I think we need to find out what people really care about um, outside this group too. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think there are several comments in the chat, you know, from our um, from advisory body members that are not on not SSC. Um, 
you know, that, that this conversation will likely be ongoing as part of the, the new FEP initiative. And so um, that will be a place, I think, to at least start to, to have some of these conversations with, with the advisory bodies on more um, species specific uh, recommendations. Um, okay, so I am going to move us towards break, um, and we will come back at 2.45 and um, hear from Karma. And then, so any, if we can have more wide ranging conversation on this. We've got plenty of time after um, Karma's presentation on human dimension indicators. So uh, please remember your points if you didn't get to fully flush them out just yet. And let's, uh, I, I like the ideas in the chat and let's also make sure that we talk about them so we can get them into the reports. Thanks. So see you at 2.45.
Okay, I see it's 2.45, so I will call us back together. Um, hope you got a chance to stretch your legs and get a cup of tea or something. Um, Melissa, I see your hand is up. Uh, two questions. One, do you have a question that we didn't get to? And two, did uh, are you okay for your uh, report for that last section? I have what I need for the report, and my hand was lingering and is now gone. Okay, great. Um, and some of that, yes, I guess we'll 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 figure out if there's anything in that section we just talked about um, that is more fits better in a general section. We can talk about that at the end. But uh, appreciate you keeping track of, of the notes from that last one. Um, and now we are going to shift to Dan repertoring. Uh, and Karma is going to present for us uh, the last section of this of the climate change appendix on um, human and I forget the title human and social indices. Yeah. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. Great. Yep. We can hear you. Uh, so this this might further complicate the discussion that preceded the break, uh, but I'm going to briefly present based on our interest in including human dimensions examples that you know might be germane to today's climate change appendix discussion. I'm going to briefly present on some work that recently emerged out of a national uh, IEA human dimensions effort to advance integrated analyses in support of the regional IEAs. And so it was organized by some of the human dimensions contributors to the various regional IEAs, including a group focused on the California current. Uh, and so with the California current contribution, uh, we were really interested in, in finding ways to more carefully define community and port resilience, and maybe in so doing, um, you know, develop a, a simple metric of resilience in response to exogenous shocks and maybe destabilizing events within the California current fisheries and, and associated ports. So in looking at the literature on resilience, we we particularly like this table of um, resilience definitions from a Martin et al. paper, which outlines different ways of approaching resilience. I apologize for the poor slide quality, but for our purposes, um, in terms of developing a simple metric for West Coast ports, you know, we wanted to take that first approach to resilience across the top, circled in red, and the focus here is on the capacity. Uh, to bounce back from 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 some shock, um, you know, with an emphasis on the on the speed and the extent of the recovery. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. So, so with that in mind, um, following from Martin's work, we developed what we call a relative stability index measure for each of the west uh, west coast IOPAC port groups, which are mapped out on the left side of the slide. And that measure centers on port level fisheries revenues relative to all other ports in the system and, and the response of each port's share of revenues to a set of defined shock periods. Um, essentially, sensitivity to some shock by a port is reflected in a negative relative stability index measure. In other words, a port was sensitive to a shock if that port's share of coastwide fisheries revenue shrank in response to the shock. A positive index measure for a port would indicate that the port's share of coastwide fisheries revenue grew after the shock period. So it's a relatively simple measure, and I do want to emphasize that it's it's a port level measure that is to some extent relative since the values for each port depend on the values for all the ports in the same time period. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. So uh, what did we mean by shocks in our analyses? Um, our identification of shocks uh, here potentially affecting West Coast ports over a you know, over the past 40 year period, roughly, is part of why this work may be of some interest in a discussion of the climate change appendix to the ESR. Uh, because we settled on eight shock periods, <clears throat> five of which are what we categorized as ecological shocks, mostly peri periods of El Nino, um, southern os oscillation ocean conditions, and three policy shock periods toward the bottom of the table on the left. Um, the figure on the right reflects our assignment of the duration of each of these shock periods um, mapped uh, mapped against annual changes in coastwide fisheries revenues. And the shock periods are color-coded to reflect whether that we've identified them as originating in a, you know, a shift in ecological conditions or in policy conditions. Um, so I know it's, I, again, I apologize for the poor quality, but the, the sort of the greenish um, colored uh, shocks are the ecological ones. 
Next slide, please, Andy. So, you know, when we applied this uh, relative stability index approach, we got results for all 18 IOPAC ports across a time series highlighting um, in, this, in this slide five, our five identified ecological shock periods. Um, presuming that the kind of climate variability associated with El Nino conditions might be of most interest to today's discussion, you know, this um, slide of results is focused just on the ecological shocks. Um, and so we present each port's index measure associated with the climate variability inherent to our identified ecological shocks. And we also include in this figure for reference, the coastwide results that are listed second from the top down the list of ports you see on the far left of the figure. And just to clarify something important about this figure, there are two, um, there are two related but kind of distinct things being shown on the plot. There's our, our, you know, our metric value, our relative stability index for each port, um, which can be positive or negative. So it's, you know, to the right or the left of the zero uh, vertical line. But we also present color coded revenue gain, revenue loss values that can be positive or negative. You know, they're either orange or green. Um, and so, you know, within, the, within our group working on this paper in terms of interpreting these results, we concluded that it's valuable to display our, our results this way. But, you know, I can recognize that this is a little bit confusing. It's just important to note that our metric can be positive even if there is a revenue loss for a port and vice versa. In other words, a port could exhibit you know, a loss in fisheries revenues in response to a shock period, but still not measure as sensitive to the shock because its share of fisheries revenue still grew in response relative to the other ports. And um, th you know, the first and the, and the last ecological shocks our analyses, I think, are worthy of highlighting. The first El Nino event in our time series that is on the left there, the 1986-98, 1988 period, it reflects a coastwide fisheries aggregate that was kind of in the midst of a transition in terms of target species and economically important species as compared to the prior decade. So there's a downturn in fisheries revenues for Los Angeles, you know, with its major hubs of commercial fishing, landing, and har harvest activity. Um, and it's reflected in the, in the measure for all ports for the 1986-88 El Nino shock, you know, with uh, Los Angeles seeing this diminished revenues in 1986 as compared to prior years, when they had made up as much as 40% of all landings revenues coastwide, that meant that all um, all the other ports um, appear to do better in response to this shock. Um, so um, for this particular shock period, the primary interpretation seems to lie in kind of the major downturn in the highly migratory species fisheries for Southern California, which happened to coincide with the arrival of this, this first El Nino shock period in our application of this relative stability index analysis. Um, in terms of the most Chronologically recent ecological shock that is on the far right, the marine heat wave period of 2015-2016, um, the results tend to reflect the importance of the Dungeness crab fishery as an important revenue earner for West Coast ports. Um, you know, that marine heat wave period coincided with, you know, the, as we all know, the significant harmful algal bloom and demonic acid event, which resulted in closures for the crab fishery, and these closures were unevenly distributed in space and time on the coast, and so the impacts were perhaps most acutely felt in California. So the results for this um, shock present, you know, most evidence of revenue loss combined with sensitivity to shock at California ports. Um, so it's, you know, while this, the results here are a little bit distinct from prior ecological shocks, the marine heat wave shock comports with what we know about increased reliance on indigenous crab revenues for most parts, most ports up to the recent period and how that demolic acid event led to crab fishery closures that were differentially um, implemented along the coast. So in this respect, the, you know, in contrast to the first chronological shock in our time series, um, with this last one, we can maybe more reasonably draw a line between climate-oriented conditions and the relative stability index results, as we see on the far right. And so again, it was you know, sort of a very brief overview of, of some new work, but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna end there and and leave it back to Andy to continue. Thanks, Andy. Sure. So, I, yeah, I realize our, our section are a little, little, little bit uneven, but we said we stopped. So, are there questions on that uh, information for for Karma? Question for Karma. Here. Yeah, let's take any um, clarifying questions now, and then we'll just let you finish out your slides and um, go to discussion, broader discussion. Um, Dan, go ahead. Um, yeah, I guess I. I interested in a little bit of feedback on why you focus on um, sort of relative change in, you know, in the share of revenues versus absolute. Um, I mean, I would think in some ways the people 
in the communities don't really maybe they don't care so much about what other people are getting as they care about what they're getting so uh, is there what is the sort of can you explain the rationale for that yeah dan i think this was you know as we sort of investigated how to think about resilience the idea was that um you could have you know it was like if you look with the coast Guard results for many of these shock periods there was a decline in fisheries revenue um overall coastwide um and so some ports may have experienced a, a loss but they th their share relative to all the other ports was grew so you know does that does that suggest that they have some set of conditions that allow them to be more resilient in response to the shock i think that's why we ended up focusing on the share because the Sort of to, like you're right that you know in the communities themselves they're going to notice a loss or a gain more than whether their share you know declined or not relative to other ports but I, but it was sort of a, a way of getting at does there, is there something that makes these ports more resilient um, than others given whatever shock we're considering okay yeah that, I mean that makes sense I just yeah wanted to get the explanation of the rationale. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands right now. So, okay, so let's, uh, let yeah, let's keep going and then we'll, um, we can have more discussion on this at the end after uh, Andrew's done presenting these slides. Okay, great. For John, we don't have too much um, more left. Um, so I think this, <laughs> this probably gets to what, what we already kind of brought up uh, before the break, which was our thoughts on what a, uh, climate appendix, appendix could be. Um, so already it's diverged from what we might have proposed, but I'll go through this anyways. Um, so this is just one possible vision we had would be that a, a yearly appendix that we would create might have this kind of structure where we'd have um, essentially three kinds of indices that we would present. So we'd have one part of the, of the appendix be um, the sort of operational uh, indices that we feel like we're fairly confident in have maybe already been through a, a vetting process of some kind and that we can produce somewhat automatically uh, year after year. Um, then perhaps we'd have a section of the appendix that would be these hot topics that, that might be um, new ideas or something that came up in a particular year. So a good example would be uh, if we had a year that we felt like uh, heat waves or something was highly impacting um, what was going on, uh, we would, you know, include some indices that related to that. So, uh, so it's just taking, taking advantage of what might be happening in a particular year, what it would be bringing, whatever indices we had to bear on that particular um, issue that happened that during a particular year. Uh, and then the last thing was we envisioned possibly the appendix would also be a place where we would introduce uh, potentially some new um, indices or future work to see if uh, if any of that took hold and was of interest uh, moving forward um, for our own work to, to focus uh, the science in the future. Um, and just to give an idea of, we already kind of have an idea of how some of the indices we currently have might fit into these uh, categories. So this is not a completely exhaustive list, but it's just to give you a flavor of what we already kind of have. So, um, we created these sort of a few short tables showing the kinds of things we already have. So, for instance, we feel like these particular indices, the habitat compression and some of the um, SDMs, and of course, the stuff that's already operational, WCOFs and JSCOPE, um, these things are already out there and providing various forecasts. Some of them are predictions, some of them are the longer term projections. Uh, and we're trying to also make note of what what goes into making these things happen or what they might need. Um, so we've compiled some of that as well. Uh, but again, this is not, not exhaustive. Uh, and I just would point out at this point that a lot of these things, this both in this table and following tables, um, in order to make the kind of links and advances and um, keep producing these things, are, it may or may not require uh, additional funding or changes in where funding goes to make these things happen. So it's important to keep in mind that there's a cost to producing some of these uh, items. Um, so then moving on to, you know, an idea of some of the things we have that are kind of more of these hot topic 
kinds of indices. Again, there's things like I just mentioned, a good example would be like a some like the heat wave kind of indices that's, you know, on a year when there's a lot of heat waves, it'll be important to have. On a year when there's not, we, we may not want to feature that. Um, then other things like the highly migratory species uh, projections, those might be more into this hot topic uh, issue. And uh, some of the things like uh, Karma was just talking about, um, looking at port responses, again, that might be in response to uh, a big El Nino we have one year. It might be a kind of index we want to bring in on those kind of years uh, when we have a big perturbation. Uh, and then lastly, we have these, uh, what we're kind of labeling the sort of cutting edge indices. So these are a lot of the examples that we actually gave earlier in this uh, presentation. Um, and I'm putting these here as cutting edge because some of these are papers that are actually either just published or in, in, in press or in prep or right now. Um, and they need, they have more requirements to make them sort of more functional uh, in terms of evaluation and, and uh, comparing them with, or with observations and just validating what we, the uncertainty and uh, getting confident in what we think these uh, models might be showing for the future. And it would also involve bringing the, um, bringing the council up to a level of understanding of what the caveats are in these particular models and uh, a, a sense of, of how certain we might be on these different uh, indices going forward. Uh, and then I thought it would be just helpful to also list, this is, um, I don't know, expect anyone to pour over it right now, but this is just the list I put together of what are the indices we currently are featuring in the, um, in the report itself in the main section. These are not in the appendix. These are just the indices that we have in the main section that we essentially produce and provide every single year. Uh, and I made a quick list of are these, <laughs> things that we are currently forecasting and the answer in almost every case is, is no. Um, but in some cases, many of these things could be, uh, could be forecast and they could be forecast in many cases on that sort of prediction time scale that Dan was just, I think, mentioning that might be the more helpful time scale for a, you know, every single year to be producing these things possibly somewhat automatically. And many of them would rely on, say, a model like a ROMS or uh, like a JScope kind of system um, to produce these um, these uh, shorter term predictions uh, year by year. But again, all of these would would uh, come with considerable effort to make these things happen, or at least effort at first to make these things uh, start working in a predictable and somewhat automatic uh, fashion. So that is most of our uh, presentation. Um, I think I just end with these few words here uh, to summarize. We feel like we've already got quite a few indices that could be used for, in some cases, limited prediction or projection capabilities. Probably more indices right now that we have confidence with their projection, rather. So that's the longer term um, items that might go into what has already been commented on. We perhaps produce every couple of years a, a sort of separate climate report. So we have, we seem to have more indices that fall into that uh, category of projection than we do prediction. Um, the second point here is that we, we definitely feel like we've probably got additional indices that could be amenable to prediction uh, and or projection, but of course this would require uh, more effort and funding. Um, another important note on this, probably already gotten it is that many if not all of these depend on these physical uh, models like ROMs. So if you think in terms of the overall funding of things in the whole universe of what we could do, um, making sure that there's still funding for those actual modeling efforts, uh, it's, it's basically the backbone. Um, it doesn't have to be ROMs, but some kind of physical modeling going forward is the backbone of everything we or most of the things we're a, a able to do in terms of for all these different forecasts. So it's absolutely essential that that keeps happening. Um, the fourth point here is that um, we didn't spend too much time on this, but we definitely have access to some of these just simple uh, physical data, like you know temperature at some particular point. Um, and that's available. We didn't spend too much time showing examples of all the different data we have that's out there, but that stuff's available from these ROMs and WCOS and JScope. Um, types of predictive models, and those with some effort could be used to drive other uh, additional indices. Um, and again, just to end with, 
in all cases, we need to always be clear about the caveats, uncertainties, and also um, issues of bias in the forcing scenarios um, and caveats in the models themselves, especially when we have a couple of biological models for physical models. Uh, to keep in mind, those are all the different levels that uh, Desiree talked about of uncertainty that um, drives these uh, predictions over time. So you have to just be clear about um, what and realistic about what we're actually saying we can predict or not predict. Uh, I'd just like to end here, I guess, with some general questions um, for you all to consider. Uh, now that we've shown you kind of, I guess we were trying to give you an idea of uh, if we were to open a restaurant tomorrow, what would be on the menu? What kind of things would be on the menu? And are we even opening the right kind of restaurant? Are we op are we coming up with the right kind of menu? And are we offering the right kind of entrees and desserts on our menu? So we really at this point are, again, like I said at the beginning, we are, we're hoping to get feedback so we don't go down the wrong rabbit hole and spend too much time there and spend, spend our time on the uh, items of most uh, interest uh, or potential interest to the council. Um, and so again, we anything from any specific indicators that are of interest to uh, asking questions about what which time scales are most interesting um, to different groups in the council, uh, what level of detail would be needed for these various examples. Um, and again, important issue for us and practically creating this appendix will be what is the time scale um, of updates? How many of these things would need to be yearly? Do any of them need to be more often? Uh, or again, the question of is the timing of when we produce it? So we right now produce the report in for the March uh, meeting, but uh, potentially if there's different stocks that have um, different you know, timings, uh, different points of the year, maybe some of these items or indices need to be updated at particular different times of the year, maybe once a year, but at different times, that's the point. Um, and lastly, these are some, just some questions, again, more, maybe uh, more specific to uh, indices that might have biomass uh, catch implications. So again, we're worried about what are the timescales of production we might need for these. Um, again, questions about what are the spatial resolution that's necessary for such uh, projections um, are the projections themselves useful if they're uh, assuming constant fishing, or do we need to really worry about that issue? Um, and also, how useful are these projections? Projections if they do or don't include shifts in uh, carrying capacity or productivity. And I think this last question is important too: is um, how could we divide up our effort into uh, which parts of council processes would be informed by the different Time scales of project projection, be they 5, 10, 30, 50, year, et cetera, or even the not list here, the shorter term, which parts of the council process would be informed by those sh very short term predictions. Um, and that's the end. So I'll just leave it on that slide there and end it, and we can open it up for discussion. I appreciate everyone's time on this. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew, for that great presentation and uh, Karma and Desiree as well for your uh, contributions to that section. Um, so there's a lot we can talk about here and we sort of ventured a little bit into more general discussion before the break. Uh, but before we do that, what I would propose we do is um, have a little bit of discussion on the work Karma presented. We had an opportunity for just quick question there, but um, have I think time for a little for some more discussion on that work, uh, and then um, uh, approach the sort of these broader discussion, this broader discussion, um, and the set of questions that that Andrew just raised here at the end. Um, so, um, Karma, I I do have a question for you. If um, I'm waiting to see if anyone else wants to raise their hand too, um, on what, the work that you just presented. So I thought that was really interesting um, and, a, and a cool way to think about how um, how these different port groups are responding to shocks and that you've seen it that, from the past. Um, so I guess two questions. So one is uh, maybe an easy one and I missed it. Are, is, this, are, is there a plan to put this into a more forward looking context for the for the for a climate change appendix, or 
how is how are you planning to incorporate this into the into the report? So that's one question. And then um, the second question is just whether there whether you have ideas or plans about thinking about some of the other um, uh, dimensions of resilience. So you you identified the one here that was sort of relating to ability to bounce back from a shock. But um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on some of those other uh, dimensions. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Um, you, in terms of your first question, um, we there will be a paper. We don't have plans to um, include this in the appendix unless you know the sort the the discussion around this suggests that we should. Um, it you know it's it's given the discussion that happened earlier. It's not we're not really predicting or projecting anything here. Um, and so, and it's not sort of an indicator in the, in the sense of, you know, the things that typically go into, go into the ESR. So that's why we, you know, we're a little bit reluctant to say whether this should be included or not. Um, but it was, as I said, an effort to, you know, make a, a step towards something that might be relevant when thinking about, you know, the climate change affected future. Um, so I don't know if that's a muddled answer to your question, but. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, and then uh, your, remind me of your second question, sorry. Oh, I, I was just wondering about, um, you know, some of these other um, types of resilience oh, right. uh, yeah. on this slide here and whether you had thoughts or plans about exploring any of those in a similar context. Right, so there are, framework. there are um, other sort of human dimensions, ongoing efforts that might be useful in terms of the, the broadly speaking climate change, you know, appendix discussion, I guess. Um, I, I guess we just were excited to present some new work and we're sort of time limited with everything that went into this um, presentation today. So we, you know, I kept it pretty brief, but longer term, um, you know, the CSVI measures that typically go into the ESR, the kind of community level social vulnerability measures, those, um, you know, they're not as clearly connected to shocks in the way that this work was, but that. I think longer term, we want to start to evaluate those empirically um, in partnership with the Southwest Center. And so that might be, have, that might have some value for thinking about other aspects of resilience that are inherent to the community, you know, a, as a whole versus just the sort of fishing revenue part of the what, what's happening in the community. Um, and then, then I don't know if that gets at these other definitions necessarily. Um, Definitely, we, we took an approach that's more typical in, in regional economics, um, and the the, def, the definitions further down the table are more um, apparent in some in other social sciences. So I think like the empirical val, you know evaluation of some of those CSPI measures might get at um, some of the latter definitions. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that that uh, expansion. Um, other. Questions, discussion for Karma, Dan? Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of um, see if I got the take home message um, kind of right about the, the, the particular example you gave. Um, if I was gathering, if I was understanding it, you basically, you, you saw the, that over these different shocks, different ports had sort of different outcomes in terms of your your um, resilience metric sometimes positive sometimes negative suggesting that that they were not um, it wasn't a very general measure of resilience um, in a sense of being uh, a measure of resilience that it that w would be the same kind of for different shocks at different times or different types of shocks uh, and that the um, the maybe the reason for that, was at least partially like if you look at the El Nino shocks over time, was um, because different ports um, changed their reliance on on fisheries um, that were that were affected, you know, heavily affected by those shocks over time. Is that am I on track there, or am I missing something? I think you're on track, Dan. Um, except that. You know, as I was describing at the end, we had to sort of dig a little deeper. In other words, our results are interesting, but they don't necessarily tell a complete story. And so those 
kind of more particular details about which fisheries they sh may have shifted to, that requires a little more, you know, look when we were doing the interpret interpreting of the results. But but yeah, in general, I think you were on track. Okay. Uh, oh, Cameron, go ahead. Um, yeah, just to follow up. Um, so, so I, I worked with Karma on this. Um, so, just to kind of maybe uh, answer Dan's question a little bit of, in a little different way. So, so yeah, the the index is measuring specific port outcomes subsequent to specific shocks. So, there's no like one, you know, resilience index measure per port. Rather, you measure the response of each port to each event that you want to test. Um, by looking at like a string of those, you can kind of come up, you might be able to sort of um, see which ports may or may not be more resilient or kind of stable in the way that we've we've um, put it. Um, so I think that what Karma said is correct. And what Dan was asking is kind of like, this is not kind of like a general index of um, resilience so much as a measure of, of individual port response to individual events. Yeah, and because of that, it is sort of a, you know, a, a one-off effort um, that, you know, may or may not be important to include in the appendix. It sort of depends on how we, how, you know, this group feels about whether that's worthwhile or not, or whether we want, you know, regularly updated um, indicators or, or something of that nature. You know, if I could ch chime in, I think a little bit in answer to your um, question, Kristen, would be um, the way I envision the stuff that, that Carmen just presented would be, um, you know, one of the things I would hope at the very least we could do in a climate appendix would be make some kind of, you know, qualitative uh, predictions like, okay, next year might be a big heat wave year or next year might be a big El Nino or a La Nina year. And so we wouldn't necessarily have an updating of, of Karma's indices, but we'd be able to use his work to look back and say, okay, we're thinking it's going to look like a, a huge heat wave is going to whack us next year. And these are the things we might expect to go along with it. Um, just like we have, you know, when we think of an El Nino coming, we have certain physical predictions we might make, um, whether they be, <laughs> you know, the idea that every El Nino is a different, different El Nino, but, you know, so we have to keep that in mind. But th that's how I kind of saw using, um, their information uh, going forward and how it might come into the into the into the report would be to provide sort of the context and flavor. It might ne not necessarily be perfectly quantitative, but it would it would give, just give us some general thoughts on on what we might expect um, based on past perturbances. So that, that at least that's my thought on it. Others might disagree, but great. That's helpful context. Dan, oh, Dan, are you going to say something? Uh, no, no, sorry. I, 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 All right. Um, okay. Uh, so let's just see any other discussion on the human dementia stuff before we go a little bit broader. Okay. Um, so then the, in terms of some of these questions that Andrew posed. Um, so one thing I want to circle back on uh, before the break, we had a little bit of discussion about some potential recommendations for um, the structure of this. I think, um, you know, different advisory bodies might have different ideas about this. Uh, so I guess I would just ask, I think Cameron suggested before seeing um, Andrew's proposal, uh, maybe a two, you know, two parts to this, that the climate change index would be separate. Uh, or sorry, a climate change appendix would be a sort of a separate report. Um, and that's kind of how Andrew talked about it. Um, so are there any, for the subcommittee, are there any sort of um, more on the science side, science-based reasons why we might suggest going one way or the other on this? Or is this kind of a more of a um, question for the end users of what's going to be most uh, you know, useful to them ultimately?
Okay, I see a hand. Who is that? Oh, okay. Melissa, go ahead. Please. I was going to suggest that this is more of a question for the end users than uh, than kind of an SSC purview. Yeah, I would um, tend to agree with that. Uh, maybe with one clarification that it seems useful to me to at least keep in separate sections or separate parts of the report the um, short term predictions from the sort of longer term projections. And that's, you know, sort of what we already what we already saw as being proposed, just because I think that can get confusing as a um, as a reader, if there's if you're jumping back and forth, and particularly thinking about the level and kinds of uncertainty that you're dealing with um, on, in those two types of products. And I see Melissa agrees. Okay. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, so I guess one question is, is if, if, we, if it is more of a sort of a separate climate report as opposed to, and maybe it comes out periodically or not every year or whatever, I, what is the SSC's role in reviewing the science that's in that report? Or do we have a role? That's a really good question. Um, and something we probably would need to have some council guidance on. Um, what, what do you, what do other, what do, what do you all think? Melissa? I think just like with any other science product that goes to the council, the SSC does have a role in reviewing those reports. And maybe it's worth, you know, not just having the report delivered, but kind of like we have been doing, having a dialogue uh, before the final product so that people can synthesize feedback and, you know, account for that in the, in the final product. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it seems to me at least um, we may need to consider what a process for reviewing something like this would look like um, and what that and uh, yeah, over what time scale and um, over yeah, over what time scale and at sort of what 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 level similar to what we do now with these um, subcommittee reviews or something different from that. So, yeah, it seems like more future conversation will be needed there to sort of think think through what's going to make the most sense but i definitely agree with melissa's point that that you know reviewing the science is a is the job of the ssc and so that should be something that we would be doing and interpret as john devores reminding us um okay so i think that's that's good i hopefully we can we'll i will work out in the final uh report how to parse the two bits of discussion from before and after the break on that particular question about the um structure um one other thing i wanted to circle back on was whether we had any whether we wanted to make any recommendations about um the species uh, for further discussion that that uh, Eric and Owen were asking for sort of um, recommendations on that, if there are sort of science-based recommendations that the SSC would like to provide there, or sort of, again, leave that to future discussions with other advisory bodies. Um, one thing that I was just thinking about, uh, I'll talk while I see if anyone else wants to say anything about that, um, was just the idea that... Um, what we we might suggest that where things are changing uh when there are tre trends in the center of gravity that you know that are either very different across regions uh or um steep um that th that those would probably be areas where we would want or you know, steep coast wide those might be areas that we want to um consider sort of looking at more closely or, or that more work would be 
would be helpful there. Um, I don't necessarily think just like things that are going negative uh, because we're, we are supposed to be kind of uh, risk, risk neutral in our advice at least. So it could be both um, increases and decreases. Um, but if others would like to weigh in on that, um, that would be good too. Oli. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Um, I guess I had a comment that was sort of in that vein, um, but not necessarily related to this particular species. Um, it just strikes me that for sort of near term, I guess my my biggest separation is sort of the near term predictions and the sort of longer term projections part of it for the SSC to consider. Right, so manage most of the stuff that's been talked about is sort of oceanography, and then you sort of filter up to a distribution model of some variety for your favorite species. Um, and any of that management that's going on with species for ground fish or CPS is going to have to interface with the all the other data that goes into assessing those stocks, right? And so, like for sablefish, the projection for the SDM doesn't incorporate age structure or all the other junk that goes into the stock assessment. Um, and so it seems like this ESR or climate appendix thing um, on the sort of stock assessments timescale, which is, you know, a few years to maybe a decade, um, is very different than something for the longer term, right? So it seems like those longer term projections are things like, hey, a good way for the ecosystem group to flag, hey, you know, sablefish are expected to move a lot deeper over the decadal scale, um, just, you know, to make something up. Um, that's something that we should worry about and try and bring into the council process to think about for the, uh, um, uh, for longer term stock assessments and ground fish management. Um, so I see sort of more value in that longer term view than in the near term projections personally, um, simply because just like the salmon stuff this morning, you run into conflicting information that's getting put before the council, right? So sardine, you have a distribution model, you know, and that has the potential to butt heads with the sardine stock assessment, for example, um, or whatever. Um, and so those things need to be integrated, not parallel. And so the integration seems hard. Uh, and so that seems like a thing we should do carefully and thoughtfully. Um, so my personal feeling is the longer term stuff is sort of a flag for things to work on is a better use of a lot of this stuff than the near term predictions. But I'm happy to be uh, shouted down by that if somebody disagrees with me. I totally agree with you. Um, I think and maybe if my if what I said did not imply implied something different than I may have misspoke. But um, I, I guess I was thinking that using those longer term projections um, of changes in distribution might just help uh, flag places where the assessment models could go wrong. Um, and, and so and not in a particular year, but like over a longer period of time um, where where things might be um, drifting in a way that um, maybe that you know other data sources might not pick up or other sort of methods of of looking at the um, at the, the stock assessment itself. So um, that that's kind of what I was thinking. Uh, and oh yeah, and Melissa's uh, making the point also just the survey data collections. Um, so yeah, so I it seems very much along the lines of. Um, sort of a, a risk and uh, yeah, a, a assessing the risk of, of shifts that need to then be flagged for further work or further looks. Um, okay, let's see. We've got, I think we've got multiple threads going on right now. So I, let's see, there's a hand up. Oh, that's Oli's hand, okay. Um, I think there's a desire for a little more discussion on this question, or at least some maybe caveats to this question about this st structure and 
what this what the report will look like. Um, is there anything anybody else want to chime in on the um, on this topic that Oli and I are just just speaking to now before we shift back? Jamil, go ahead. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, I, I was thinking that this question always posed is is perfect because what would be really helpful for the IEA team is to get some advice from the SSC on the scaffolding of the you know of the content of a climate change report and in particular whether it will focus on longer term projections you know whether it's an appendix to the ESR or its own thing that's that's different and it's going to depend on prioritizations at the centers like Elliot wrote in the chat and all that. Um, but if we had that scaffolding of what the content should look like, we could then build it as slowly or as quickly as resources allow. And, and um, if it were focused on longer term projections, it would probably need to be updated less frequently. Um, and so that would give us more time to build it into um, what what could be most useful. So yeah, just I, I would just wanted to encourage more feedback on like what what is the scaffolding of this kind of report or appendix and and um, what what content is most useful. Thanks, Jamil. I think that's really um, that's helpful. Uh, I think the thinking about it in terms of scaffolding and the projections that that perhaps alleviate some concerns that we're seeing raised in the chat, at least about um, workload and sort of how this all works, um, or at least maybe provides a way to talk about it. Um, and so, and I think someone raised this already that potentially something, a, a, a document more, more focused on projections would be, you know, you wouldn't need to update it as often. Um, so, but I'm curious now if we if we go back to that discussion, what other um, subcommittee members think about the sort of uh, focusing on longer term versus shorter term? Um, and of course, it's probably not an either or, but um, recognizing the workload constraints of everyone and funding constraints of everyone. Um, what what feels highest priority? Um, so Oli just spoke to long term projections it, you know, in in a specific context, but maybe that uh, to broaden that um, to sort of multiple uh, potential you know multiple, multiple potential um, lines of work with the longer term projections. Um, what, is that a do you all think that's a higher priority? Um, focus for this climate change appendix in the in the terms of its development in the next few years or what do you think I'll Melissa go ahead thanks I was just going to jump in um I actually think that this is a question that needs to go to other groups within the council process because while we might really like long-term projections, you may hear from the industry folks that what they wanna know is what's gonna happen in the next few months or the next few years. And, and I wouldn't be surprised to hear that. So I really think that, um, I don't know that the SSC alone can provide the answer to this. And I actually don't think we should provide the answer to this alone either. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. Um, I mean, I would agree that we can't provide an answer alone. Um, I do, I guess maybe what part of our job, part of what we can uh, help connect dots to are the ways in which the longer term projection type work can be used to help inform decision making. Um, like maybe that maybe that's something that that we have some uh, ability to speak to. So along the lines of what Oli and I were just discussing, and what you brought up about the surveys. So um, climate change work that identifies where 
our current surveys and assessment methods are potentially going to uh, lead us astray. That seems like a good, a high pri like a, something that the that would be high priority that the council could sort of weigh in on and um, and and understand. Um, but I'm sure there are many others and. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, that would be kind of, that's kind of my, my response. Oh, I think everyone's getting tired. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess other thoughts on the uh, on this sort of Jamil scaffolding question, Oli. Yeah, I don't. I, just to be clear, I'm not. And in response partially to Andy's comment, like I think it's a great research topic, right? Work on like near term forecast stuff. I think it's wonderful. I think it's super good science. Um, the question is, how does it fit into the broader world of the? Um, Council world, right? And so, I take Melissa's point is like that maybe the industry groups really want near term forecasts, but like, what do they do with those, right? And that takes talking to the other, um, the CPS group or the groundfish group or whoever. Um, and so that's why I, I'm trying to sort of come up with something that doesn't involve like roping in the rest of the council for the IEA um, team and like. The, the long term forecast seem like firmly in the IEA's wheelhouse and beholden to no one else. And so I like, I sort of like that combination of things. Um, but, you know, I do think there's a lot of interesting things that are going on with the, the near term stuff. So that was my only main point. Um, so, and also I got, you know, just given Kristen a chance not to talk for a few minutes. So there you go. Well, I would I would sec I would second that in in somewhat in a way too is that you got to think about um, you know you look at our lists we 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 kind of racked our brains a bit to come up with the list of stuff of indices we kind of had in hand, um, and it seems like the majority of them are more on these long term projections. So, in terms of practicality, you know what have we what have we already got around? We've got more of these kind of long term projections. So if we could actually I hate to be the, I built a hammer now, I want to find a nail for it, but, or maybe a little bit in that category. I mean, I don't think they're as useless as hammering a square peg in a round hole, but we, we, we do have access to these, you know, a lot of papers that people in this group right here are coming out with that either they've come out or they're coming out with showing these long-term projections. So it would be nice to find a way to incorporate them in our thinking rather than, you know, or, or if we went the other route, I think we're at you know at a stage where we want to do it, but it's going to take a lot more work to make the connections for these short-term um, predictions. Um, it'll take more work, but it may also be equally rewarding. But it would be nice to use the things we have. I guess is what I'm arguing for. So, you know, if we're going to build our scaffolding and we've already got bricks around, we might as well build the scaffolding out of bricks, right? Then have to invent a new material <laughs> to build it out of. <laughs> Sorry, Freddie. Alan analogies are starting to get weak, but I think you get my point. I, I would tend to agree with that. Um, I guess I would say one uh, one counter example to uh, the utility of the short shorter term forecasts. I think um, the JSCO project that that Isaac brought up, um, and particularly the the Hake distribution forecasts that are being now shown to the Hake managers every year. Um, I think is, those are just temperature-based forecasts uh, from January about what summer conditions are going to be looking like um, for Hake, as you know. And and so that has become really useful for the um, Hake fishermen and and I think the managers too to uh, have some advanced information about what fishing conditions are likely to be like off of Vancouver Island in Canada. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's, it's, it's a kind of a slow and steady, um, iterative approach that to making those things increasingly useful, I think. And, um, 
um, and building the sort of relationships and trust around that product uh, because it's sort of because it's new. Um, but I but I think it has been pretty useful and um, and especially because it's been shown to be correct in the last couple of years. Uh, and so I so that that's just kind of a counter example to keep in mind that certainly there there are is there are is utility to some of these shorter shorter term forecast products um and uh i think that oli is totally right that it requires um uh, building them out will require partnership with uh the, the relevant advisory bodies okay other thoughts on this oh i see a hand um jamil Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, just a quick response to that. You know, the more I hear this discussion and the contrast between the near term and the longer term, the more I feel like it it is that we have some a, a toolbox that can be useful for bo both near term prediction or forecasting and for longer term projection. But where we slot that work into the council process could be quite different, and I can't help but think when I hear you talk through the uh, Hake example of, well, I wonder if that's the kind of thing that would emerge as really useful as we start to have conversations towards implementing FEP Initiative 2.1, whereas the longer term stuff is unlikely to emerge from that initiative because it's not the focus. So I just wanted to offer that as, as one way to think about using this, the hammer or any of the other tools um, to use Andy's metaphor, but, but putting them towards different purposes. Yeah, thanks. I think that's a great point. Um, and maybe along those lines, the I don't, I'm not sure what the remaining tasks are from the Climate and Communities Initiative. I don't have those um, grilled into my brain, but um, maybe the, some of this projection, some of the projection work that that we're talking about, might help with um, some of the longer term planning around climate change. Um, that might be part of that the lingering tasks from that initiative. Chris, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Kristen. Um, this is as much me wanting to say it aloud, so I hear myself say it, and uh, maybe none of you need to hear me say it. I just want to make sure. Um, we, I, I hope there's not an impression that we just volunteered to write a climate change report. <laughs> and um, and what I want to hear myself say aloud, so that other people heard me say it aloud, is um, I would you know I hope that we're thinking about all these things in perspective terms, simply because I think we all can respect that everyone on this call is overworked, um, and everyone on this call. Uh, has zero funds to do that thing that they want to do, um, and uh, doing something like this is certainly, you know, like what, whatever whatever concrete shape this takes over the next several years uh, would be valuable, but it would also take away from other things that we're doing. So um, just as we are reporting out on this and thinking about what our next steps are, I, I hope we're still talking somewhat in the conversation starting in hypothetical sense rather than uh, the IEA team volunteered to do something. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that we can count on Dan, uh, his repertory on this part okay, of the uh, report to, to not say that you're going to have a climate change report by March. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just make sure, Dan, that's you, you won't put that in your notes, right? Well, wait a minute here. I wasn't sure I was reporturing on this I, there, um, on this uh, part here. I thought I was reporturing on the human dimensions part. I'm Am I reporturing on the general conclusions? I've actually been adding notes to my section because it's uh, kind of overlapping. So I, I got you covered. Thank you, Melissa. That's I'm very grateful for that. 
So Melissa will not put you on the hook to have a uh, presentation or a, a new climate change report by March. I, I have been listening and I'm happy to contribute to that, but I wasn't really writing notes because I wasn't sure that was, I didn't realize that was what I was expected to do. No, uh, apologies for the uh, uh, not being clear about that. Um, and I guess to just then be clear, uh, Melissa, would you mind continuing on from this point to the end of our meeting? No problem. Thank you. Um, okay. So, yes, I yeah. think absolutely yeah. all the workload yeah. um, considerations are very real for everyone and, and you know, for the council as well. Um, okay. I want to see, I just want to, let's see, check in with Andy, Andrew, and and Chris both, and just see if you are getting the, if we're hitting what you would like on this um, section and make sure that you're getting the type of feedback that you'd like from the ecosystem subcommittee. If there's other topics you'd like to raise that we haven't hit on, please let us know. Um. I, I guess from my point of view, I guess I, it's just where do we, we had some questions about where we should get our next bit of advice from. And the question is, how do we, how do we go about arranging that and getting those next pieces of advice? <laughs> so, that would be my biggest question at this point. So I think, I think Melissa had some good comments about, you know, that this group isn't necessarily the one to give us the answers to some of the things we're asking for. So how do we, how do we go about arranging those meetings and getting those other answers is my, that's my question at this point. Um, I, th yeah, so John DeVore just put in the chat I, that I, what, that whatever is in the March report will go out to all the uh, advisory bodies. And um, so, so any new information in a climate change appendix will be you know, everyone will look at it. And also this report from this meeting will go out as part of the um, background materials for that March meeting. And so all of the advisory bodies can come in on that as well. Um, so that, I think that's probably the next like procedural step. Um, and I'm just looking at to see if I'm missing anything in the chat here. Um, Uh, Corey, go ahead. Thanks, Chris. And I was driving there a little, and so in my rather than be incoherent in the chat, I think yeah, just what and you and Andy were saying, Andy, about the bricks and all these studies. Yeah, when we were the council was trying to figure out how to do the climate and communities initiative, however many years ago, you know, people knew that um, studies like the the future seas and other other things were coming out, but it was going to be a be a while. So. Um, you know, rather than just sit and wait, we decided to try the scenario planning, which, you know, talked about a whole different level than a projection. But anyway, point being that, yeah, there was still a lot of interest in, in, in taking the findings of these of the studies in, and using them. So I think, Chris, and you were on the right track. And, yeah, we still, we're starting 2.1, this initiative. But the, the counter to that, I mean, the companion to that was to figure out how to continue to incorporate management flexibility and understanding uh, fisheries resilience, community resilience better. So long way of saying, yes, there's, there's definitely interest. Um, and if, yeah, I think John DeVore is right. You'll in March will be maybe the first when we really get into this, but yeah, plenty of interest in figuring out how to take the findings and the tools as Jamila was saying, and then apply them. Great. Thank you for that. Corey. Um, Chris, go ahead. Yes, yeah, thanks, Kristen. The, it, that does make me think about um, when, you know, when we do get questions in March, it will be because people are responding to what we've put in the appendix um, for the forthcoming report. And we would not copy paste last year's appendix into the 23 um, briefing book. Um, so I guess we should be thoughtful about what kinds of things maybe that were presented today 
might find a good home in the report in a way that does advance the conversation. Um, and maybe we could provide a few flavors of things that are uh, hindcast, nowcast e that demonstrate capability and skill, a couple things that uh, demonstrate short-term forecasting and predicting skill uh, and capability, and then a couple things that are spanned more at the scale of, let's say, Climate Communities Initiative or um, very long-term planning along the lines of what the Marine Planning Committee might be thinking about or what uh, people with, uh, you know, very long, um, you know, scope are, are thinking about. Um, some of that would be material that we've talked about today. Some of it might not be this material that we got into in specifics, but um, would the SSC be thinking, you know, why didn't you talk to us about this for technical review before it went into your climate change appendix? Or does that feel like it's consistent with the way that we've titrated in new information in the past? Did you hear the question in there or did I, did I over talk it? No, I think you're, I think you're asking, uh, well, I heard the, the, I understood that you're asking whether the SSC would be, um, you know, would we look poorly upon you adding new material that we didn't hear about today? Is that what you're asking? Well, for, in um, the climate change appendix, or? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I could imagine like, for example, um, we did hear a lot about in the climate and communities initiative, we heard a lot about how there's great interest in species distribution models of uh, council priority stocks. Um, and I know the SSCES has reviewed some uh, analyses that we've thought about, especially I think in regard to ground fish in the past, um, but, uh, but we haven't gone just, I think, you know, at least with us, maybe you have in, in um, with working with different uh, uh, assessment biologists or whatnot, maybe you have talked about SDMs in, in, in those, I'm sure you have, but um, so just as an example, if we were to give some very simple examples of capability um, that we see emerging um, that might not necessarily have made it into our other elements of our report before, uh, or have been up for specific technical review, just as a, just again, as conversation continuers at this point or appetizers, does that seem like that's fair game so that we do have something to put in the report? It's not simply a copy paste. I mean, I, yeah, I, I'll just speak for myself and let others chime in. That seems reasonable to me, um, particularly because the, you know, that SDM, the SDM TMB tool was just went through methodology review for use in the assessment. So this would be a different use of that tool, but uh, at least I think uh, people are familiar with, with it. Um, and so to me, that seems to seems within scope, but if anyone else disagrees with me, please raise your hand. Oh, Melissa agrees. That's helpful. Thanks, Melissa. Only two. So yeah, that seems good. John agree. Thanks, John. Okay. Um, I guess, I guess and maybe I think, just um, the context for that is I'm thinking, I'm sorry, Kristen, that was there's rude of me to not raise my hand first. Um, if we did, we, we will have a chance to meet with, say, the EWG and the EAS and other other uh, bodies in um, in March. Uh, and I think that a way to continue the conversation would be to present something that is a subtle advance on what we presented last year. And last year included like those uh, kind of uh, mock-ups of potential um, uh, vignettes of, of, you know, climate change indicators that we could show in future reports. Uh, and moving away from the, you know, appetizer -y vignettes into something that feels a little bit more like starting to meet um, some of the different advisor bodies where they live and for them to be able to say, we like that, we don't like that, feels like it's getting us um, closer to um, 
having something more concrete to respond to. Yeah, I think that I think that's right because I think um, you know I think we all have experienced this that you know people can't tell you tell you see an example you don't know if you're gonna like it or not right <laughs> so until you see the menu or you see yeah sometimes it's not till after you order that you realize like oh that's not what I want so I think if, if to the extent that you're willing to experiment um, to and to get to start conversations with advisory bodies I think that's useful. Um, I saw another hand a minute ago and now it's gone. All right. Um, well, it feels to me like we are sort of winding down here. We, we're not totally out of time. So if there's anything else that folks want to raise before we go to public comment, um, I would welcome that opportunity now. Dan, go ahead. Um, yeah, I wanted to kind of raise a more general point that was, you know, not about the climate, the climate appendix so much, um, but about the, the, um, the uh, larger report that's done every year. Um, and, and that is, if it sounded like there was, you know, some, um, maybe some slimming down of that, like some taking some things out and perhaps that's leaving, um, some room for other things. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, or maybe suggesting, um, consideration of leaving a few pages of that report open for things that are more one-off, um, kind of narrative things, hot topics going on, um, that in the ecosystem, which may or may not relate to climate. Um, and, you know, because there are things that are things that, you know, analyses that come out um, because of something like COVID or or um, or a heat, mean heat wave or something else um, that are a one off thing. And they're not a they're not they're not, an in, you know, an index that we put in every year. Um, but there's, you know, clearly important analysis that's come out that's going to be important to the council. And then there are other things that that um, we don't have an index coming out every year, but maybe we have it periodically. And I can think of um, like this fishery participation survey that we've now done a couple of times we do and hope to do every three years. So I don't have an in annual index, but you know, there's something like, you know, um, we might start seeing some 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 regional changes in the share of, in, of household income coming from fisheries that might be of interest to the council and might fit into this IEA report, but it's not an annual thing. So that I just wanted to kind of raise that as a as a something to think about. I think that's a really good point, Dan. Um, and uh, I and I guess maybe sort of even broaden it further. The um, like uh, thinking about how we might bring in research and products that aren't necessarily uh, NIMS products, um, because right, at least right now, we, the way that things typically work is they go through the ecosystem status report and then, and then once they're there, then the ecosystem subcommittee might review pieces of them. That's kind of the process that we have set up. Um, and so I wonder if for things that like the things that you're speaking about, Dan, maybe what you're intending is something that would be in the IEA report, but I'm, I guess I'm wondering for maybe things that wouldn't necessarily be NIMS products that could still be useful to the council discussion. How do we, how do we incorporate those um, into our process? And maybe that's a separate conversation. I mean, I think it's a good question. I, I I definitely was referring more to you know actually what would be in in, in the eco, ecosystem status report and and sort of a section section of that. But I agree that what you're bringing up is also of interest. I guess maybe, uh, Chris, do you have a response to Dan's original question that was particularly with respect to the CCIE report and not in the hot topics or how, how these sort of not directly 
eco, uh, indicator projects might be incorporated? Well, I think we have precedents for doing exactly what Dan's suggesting. For example, you know, reserving a paragraph to talk about thiamine deficiency in um, one of the last few reports we did. Um, so, so it's it's not out of the the question. You know, we we would just have to be mindful of the word limit concern that we're always kind of fighting against. But um, if uh, if the suggestion here is maybe like a uh, a hot topics appendix um, that uh, analogous to the climate change appendix, where we feel like we might have a little bit more leeway to push the word count up a little bit, add a few extra figures. Um, uh, there certainly is precedent for it, and the council's been, I think, uniformly gracious in letting us get away with that, um, and um, and not, you know, slap us on the wrist for for making the report a little bit longer. Um, it, it really would just be a matter of, uh, you know, frankly, the last few weeks leading up to submission of the report for the briefing book deadline, you know, feels like a, you know a, a, a real whirlwind. So. Um, It'd be you know important to be well connected with the subject matter experts on whatever those hot topics are to make sure that whatever it is gets represented in a in a reasonably you know fair way, and that uh, that uh, we know how to uh, pass that along during discussion in March with council and advisory bodies uh, if it's in there. But I think there's precedent for it. Yeah, marine heat waves, another classic example, actually, of that, where uh, we certainly didn't have a marine heat wave time series uh, before 2014. So, uh, yeah, there's there's certainly a well-established precedent for this. Great. Thank you. Um, Dan, I just wanted to flag. Uh, oh, your hand went up again. Great. Yeah, just, just um, I just wanted to also. Oh, sorry. I just wanted a very quick follow-up just to say that, um, you know, uh, that, that, Reserving a little bit of space for it is like if you're going to drop some things rather than filling up that space that from the dropped index that you think about, you know, conserving a couple of pages for hot topics, I guess, as opposed to putting them into an appendix. Yeah, there's precedent for that too, <laughs> for for relegating some things to the appendix in 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 favor of a hot topic. So I, yeah, I think we can we can make that uh, we can juggle that. I think um, on a case by case basis. Um, I, so I guess I just wanted to ask you, Dan, was that the question that you asked earlier in the day that we said we would circle back to, or was that a different question? Do you, did you still have a lingering one that we were going to circle back no, on? No, that was it. That was it. Great. Thank you for doing, for remembering to come back to it. Um, okay. Well, I think then, I think we are ready. I'm saying this slowly. I think we're ready to go to public comment, unless I see another hand that so wants more discussion first. No. Okay. So let's, let's go to public comment. Um, so if you are a member of the public and you have something to say, please uh, raise your hand and we will call on you. going once and if you can't raise your hand if you can just unmute going twice okay i think we have no public comment um so i think we can move towards uh Closing our meeting, um, I just want to uh, first off say thank you all for being here today. Um, thanks in particular uh, to our presenters from the CCIEA team. Um, this is a great afternoon discussion. I hope that we gave you all some useful discussion to, to move and feedback to move to your next step 1.A be <laughs> not the end of the conversation, but just the beginning. Um, and I also uh, very much appreciate the rapporteurs uh, and, and uh, help with leading this morning from Will, um, and of course, John DeVore for uh, his ongoing uh, support of our group. Uh, so thank you. Um, and 
Uh, to circle back uh, one more time on the report, so rapporteurs, please um, have your sections to me by one week from today, if at all possible. Uh, if you need more time, please let me know, and um, and then I will get the uh, report sent out or put together and then sent out to everybody. Um, the CCIEA team is welcome to comment on that and, for in particular, correct anything that we might get wrong. Um, and uh, and then we'll we'll finalize it within the subcommittee, but it won't be adopted until the March meeting when the SSC takes it up for discussion. Um, and so with that, I will thank you again and say um, enjoy your Friday evening and um, see you soon. Thanks, Kristen. Um, I'll have the meeting recordings posted um, probably tomorrow. Great, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks Chris, Kristen, Andrew, all the presenters.